Good morning, Sandra or Chris. This is Kelly. Just checking to see if you can hear me okay. Good morning, Kelly. Loud and clear. Great. Thank you. Just another quick question. I am on my phone. Is it okay if I am only muted on my phone and not through the webinar platform? I would still use the raised hand feature before I unmute myself. Absolutely. I would actually recommend doing it that way because it's a little clunkier to mute and unmute via the phone connection using the platform. Great. Thanks so much. You bet. Have a good morning. You too. Hey, Chris, this is Jesse. I just want to make sure you guys can hear me for the presentation. Yep. Loud and clear, Jesse. Good morning. Good morning.
We'll get started in a moment here. I think we have almost everyone connected. I think there's one person missing. Okay, I think I think we're pretty much all here. And before we get started with our agenda for the day, I'll turn to Executive Director Chuck Tracy for any remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, we we have uh, one agenda item for sure today. That's the sable fish gear switching trawl catcher fishery, uh, fairly lengthy item. Uh, we're expecting it to take the bulk of the day. I did mention yesterday that there was a possibility that if we ended that agenda item in time that we might move something up. Uh, we've discussed that a little bit. Uh, the, uh, the reports are in, the people are, uh, are prepared. Um, <clears throat> so de uh, depending on how, how we do and uh, what time is left uh, at the end of the day, we might consider moving either um, G5, the assessment methodology review, uh, or the uh, Sablefish G4, the Sablefish MSE update up um, to, uh, at this point, I'm guessing uh, it would be late afternoon. Um, and depending on how much time we've got, if we don't have much, it'll probably be the assessment methodology. If we've got a little bit more, could be the Sablefish MSC. Uh, so I guess I would expect um, an update at this at our, at our lunch break. I uh, would also note that there there's been a request for some uh, another extended break prior to council action. Um, depending on uh, on how far we get, that could just be tacked onto the lunch break, or it could come uh, later in the afternoon if, if uh, things uh, take a little longer. So, uh, so uh, be aware of of that. And and uh, again, thank you to the uh, folks on uh, G4 and G5 for uh, being uh, a little flexible and uh, and allowing us to. Um, <laughs> play with your schedule a little bit, um, but uh, apologies in advance if it causes any, uh, any difficulties. Um, let's see, uh, one other uh, thing to note, um, the council did uh, on its agenda, uh, decided to include the comments on the CSNA court ordered rulemaking for tomorrow. That's uh, CPS agenda item H3. Um, so while the rule uh, didn't come out in time for um, review by our uh, advisory bodies, um, the SSC in particular, uh, the, the council did want to at least get an update from National Marine Fisheries Service on what's in the rule, what has changed uh, from the previous uh, rule. Uh, so, or, um, I'm sorry, what's changed in the um, proposed rule uh, relative to the, uh, the existing rule. Um, so we did. Uh, we're in it, we were able to download the public review draft of the proposed rule this morning, uh, so that is uh, making its way towards the briefing book. If it isn't there already, I believe National Marine Fisheries Service uh, is also preparing a report um, on that issue. And so, um, just keep an eye out on that if you're if that's of interest to you, and um, be prepared to uh, to engage in discussion. Uh, tomorrow afternoon on that. Um, let's see, uh, I did want to also mention we've got uh, a fairly strong storm system moving through the uh, through the northwest here. There's been some high winds, there's been some power outages, um, and uh, while we hope that uh, things are abating a bit, um, I did just want to put out there that, uh, uh, particularly for uh, council members panel and panelists, um, that if you do uh, experience a power loss, um, there are instructions on the email that you received for your panelist invitation. Uh, so this is the the uh, log on you use every morning to log into the council meeting webinar here. Uh, so there are on the email that that arrived with there are instructions on uh, how to dial in, uh, and and that would allow you to uh, to dial in with your phone number. Uh, become a panelist and be able to to speak um, uh, if if you lose power. So um, if uh, if you're concerned about that, please uh, take a look at that email invitation 
and uh, be prepared to uh, to use alternate methods to uh, to dial in. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, and as I see right now, that we do, we might have uh, somebody in that situation right now. Our NOAA GC uh, person for Sablefish is uh, experiencing internet issues, so we're working on that. So. Um, anyway, just just be aware of that, um, and uh, again, be prepared if you can to uh, to dial in as a, as a plan B. Uh, I think that's all I've got this morning, Mr. Chair. All right, thanks very much, Chuck. And I, I think, in particular, the uh, instructions to dial in if you can't get in or the internet is are, are important. I know that it appears that Maggie Smith is having internet issues and she can, can certainly dial in uh, based on the information in her panelist uh, invite. Yeah, let, let me just check with, uh, and, and see, do we have another NOAA GC uh, person on the call right now? I'm not seeing one. Um, I think it would be good to have NOAA GC at the table. Um, perhaps, uh, uh, Kelly, I don't know, do you want to you want to speak to the uh, issue? Or are we going to be able to round somebody up, do you think? Or um, I don't know, do you, have, do you have any thoughts on that, Kelly? We're working on it. Maybe just give me a couple minutes here. OK, and Phil? I see you got your hand up. Yeah, we're in the midst of the storm here and where I live. And I just, if I lose my power, I lose my phone too. So um, that is, is, it won't be an option for me. But I'm hoping that maybe the, it's still blowing pretty hard, but I'm hoping the worst is past this year. Okay, we will uh, we'll keep an eye out for you. Okay, well, why don't we uh, uh, why don't we give um, nymphs a little bit of time for uh, for them to get a GC person in in the seat? Yeah, why don't we uh, why don't we take a five minute break? It's so early in the day, but um, and give. Uh, Maggie a chance to dial in rather than uh, use her internet. I assume even if the internet is down, the cell service um, should work. I know here that when my power goes out, uh, my cell phone still works. I guess as so long as the cell towers have power, they typically have battery backup. Okay. So it's 8.08, let's come back at 8.12. Um, that should be enough time to find the number and dial in. Okay. Thank you.
Yeah, everyone just hold on another moment. We've got uh, Rose Stanley from the general counsel's office uh, dialing in now. I would also mention if, if you're concerned about uh, being able to access the uh, briefing book materials uh, when the power goes out, you are able to download the um, PDF versions of the files uh, from Dropbox, for example, uh, to your hard drive. Uh, so if that's something that you want to uh, take some precautionary uh, steps towards your encouraged to do that if you have to, those concerns. And Chuck, I'll add to that, that if you have Dropbox on your uh, computer, um, you can have them automatically stored there as well. It looks like we've got uh, Sheila Lynch on. Uh, Kelly, is, uh, are we still waiting for, uh, for Rose or uh, is Sheila going to sit in the seat? Uh, hey, Chuck, this is Chris. I'm working via chat with Kelly right now to try to get a panelist invite set up for Rose. Okay. Let's take it's, just another moment. Looks like Sheila's got her hand up. So, Sheila, do you have a comment then? Hi, Chuck. Yes, um, I can sit in for Maggie until she's available. So go ahead. All right, so I guess that means we can go ahead um, with agenda item G1 um, while Rose is getting connected since Sheila is with us. Thank you, Sheila. So with that, I'll pass the gavel over to Vice Chair Brad Pettinger to get us going on G1. Okay, well, thank you, Chair Gorolnik, and good morning, everyone. Hopefully, the weather will cooperate and we won't lose anybody as we move through the agenda. Um, with that, uh, Jim, um, why don't you get us started on uh, G1 this morning? Good morning, Mr. Vice Chairman. Good morning, Council Members. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, there we go. And let's start the slideshow. Okay, uh, you should be seeing my slide. I uh, just want to make sure you're seeing that and not my uh, notes. Yep. yep. Okay, great. Okay, uh, so uh, this morning, um, there are uh, three parts uh, to the presentation. I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, just going over an agenda item overview. Uh, then we're going to go into the alternatives and uh, 
take a bit of a deeper uh, dive on them uh, than we have in the past. Uh, after we go through each alternative, I'll, I'll stop and uh, ask questions. So we're really uh, planning on this session as being an opportunity for you to uh, dive in and maybe get a little bit more familiar with the alternatives than you have uh, had a chance to do in the past. Uh, including questions, we expect that that'll maybe run about an hour. Uh, assuming it does, then uh, we've recommended that uh, you maybe take a break at that point uh, before then going into the section on the uh, analysis that uh, Jesse Dorbinghouse will be presenting for us. So with respect to the agenda item overview, um, you started looking at gear switching uh, during the catch share review, and as you were finishing it up, adopted a September 15th, uh, 2017 control date. Uh, then you decided to move into the process and appointed the SAMTAC that met over a couple of years and provided you the final report last summer. In September, you adopted a purpose and need statement and voted to move forward with the possibly adopting a range of alternatives at this meeting. And at that time, you also expressed an interest in seeing whether constituents might be able to uh, get together and uh, bring you a compromise proposal. Uh, so the action today is to adopt a range of alternatives. Um, at the same time, uh, you also expressed some interest in an industry compromise proposal that you hope might come during the fall or, or over the winter. Uh, and as a reminder uh, of your discussion in September, there was some concern that while NIMS had reviewed the existing proposals, they would not be able to review and provide input on anything new until sometime later. Uh, so these are some factors you might take into account as you decide how to move forward today uh, into the adoption of a range of alternatives. Um, if you do adopt a full range, then uh, we would uh, move forward with a full analysis over the winter. Uh, if there are other pending considerations for the range, uh, we might uh, cut that analysis back uh, as needed to take into account uh, further modifications that might be made next spring if, if other input uh, came in at that point. So for today, you've got the uh, attachment one with the SAMTAC alternatives. I'm sure you've seen your attachment, the number two that has the uh, current decision points in it, and then the preliminary analysis and alternative three. Uh, supplemental, you have the GMT and GAP reports. Uh, you also now have a WDFW report, and uh, there is a supplemental um, uh, public comment uh, PowerPoint uh, you'll find in your, in your briefing materials. So, Mr. Uh, Vice Chairman, that uh, completes the, the kind of the brief overview here. If there's not any questions, then I'll move into the presentation on the alternatives. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, questions for Jim? Okay, seeing none, uh, please proceed. Jim. Okay, then we're off. So, uh, just a quick overview, highest level, I've got no action and three action alternatives, all of which would restrict uh, gear switching uh, for northern sablefish, uh, but not for other species. Uh, as a reminder, the uh, no action alternative, I just want to take a moment to review sort of the key provisions of the cat share program that relate to the gear switching issue and design of the alternatives. Uh, first, uh, trawl permits are required to participate in the trawl IFQ program, uh, but a trawl permitted vessel can use any gear, uh, which is then what generates your gear switching alternative. Uh, looking at the uh, center cell here in this table, uh, the regulations were recently amended to allow a fixed gear and trawl permit to be registered on the vessel at the same time. Um, it used to be that you could only have one or the other. Uh, on the vessel and starting in 2017 this dual or dual or joint registration made it easier then for fish gear vessels to fish in both the IFQ and the tier fishery uh, without having to take permits on and off the vessel. And then moving across the table here recall that any person can open a quota share account and acquire a quota share but a quota share account uh, itself cannot be transferred to a different owner and you'll see how that provision plays into some of the alternatives we get into. Then in the last column, uh, the quota pound is issued to the quota share accounts and it must be transferred to a vessel in order to be used. And then finally, there's a 4.5% uh, limit for a northern uh, sablefish, a vessel, uh, annual vessel quota pound limit for northern sablefish. 
and uh, moving into the action alternatives. Um, as we go through the alternatives, I'll be kind of talking about them as uh, and options that are in there uh, to select from uh, and talking about how some options are contingent on the selection of other options. However, as I do this, I want to acknowledge the council can eliminate, you can modify, you can add new options, uh, create or eliminate the uh, contingencies between the options or create options where they currently exist. So when I'm talking about the options and what's contingent and what can be done and can't be done, this is all just in terms of how the SAMTAC uh, recommended the, the options be moved through, but obviously you have all kinds of, all kinds of latitude. So a uh, high level overview uh, here, um, the three action alternatives each use a different mechanism uh, to limit gear switching. And that mechanism is reflected in the short title for the alternatives. As I talk about these alternatives, uh, anytime I reference quota share, quota pounds, I'm gonna be talking about Northern Sablefish quota share and quota pounds. So under each alternative, uh, there would be some gear switching opportunity uh, provided to all participants. And then an addition, some additional opportunities or a grandfather privilege that might be provided for those that have some gear switching history. And then the last row of the table here deals with the, the allocation of the grandfather privilege is going to be based either on, would be based either on permit history or vessel history. So looking at the alternatives one at a time then, uh, under alternative one, uh, when uh, issued, all quota pounds would be deposited into a quota share account as either trawl only or unrestricted gear in, co in a constant proportion, uh, except that those with a history of using their permit to gear switch might be provided an opportunity to designate a quota share account that would be opted out, in which case 100% of the quota pounds issued to that account would be unrestricted with respect to gear and so it could be used for gear switching. And all the other accounts would either uh, receive 10% or 30% as unrestricted, depending on uh, options that you, uh, that you select. Um, so the opt-out provision, as we go through these, is the only grandfather provision that the SAMTAC specified as an option for the council to adopt. So it's not necessarily integral uh, to the alternatives. Uh, for all other alternatives, the grandfather uh, privilege is more integral to the, the structure of the alternative. Looking next then at alternative two, uh, under this alternative, every trawl permit would be able to uh, gear switch the equivalent of about half a percentage of the quota pounds at a minimum. And then those permits with a history uh, of using their permit to gear switch um, that have a that meet a certain qualification standard uh, would be allowed to gear switch a larger amount. Then under alternative three, uh, you'd have this active trawler provision where any vessel with uh, six trawl landings in a year would qualify as an active trawler and be able to gear switch about one percent of the quota pounds that year and the following year. Uh, so this alternative vessel would need to maintain that active trawler status on an ongoing basis, but any vessel able to use trawl gear could qualify at any time in the future. Then, then uh, with respect to the grandfather provision, vessels with a history of gear switching would be able to get an exemption from this requirement at the start of the program and then be allowed to do a limited amount of gear switching uh, during the year. Okay, so that's the overview. Um, so <clears throat> one thing I want to mention is for, e for each alternatives, there are provisions that can be altered that would vary the total amount of gear switching expected over time. So the main provisions determine the amount of possible gear switch. The main provisions that determine the amount of possible gear switching are the, the qualifying requirements, uh, the amounts of unrestricted quota pound issued or the gear switching limits, and provisions for expiring or, or allowing grandfather uh, privileges to continue. So by modifying these uh, the provisions like this, there can be a lot of overlap among the alternatives in terms of the total amount of gear switching expected. 
At the same time, the, the distribution of the impacts could be very different because of the different mechanisms used within each alternative. So again, you have uh, each alternative, you can probably achieve any gear switching limit target, but the, these mechanisms have a very different uh, distribution. So the main thing uh, that, yeah. Okay, so now we're gonna get into uh, alternative one. Uh, there are four choice points uh, identified for the council here. Uh, the first is the uh, gear specific quota pounds options. These are the amounts of quota pounds that would be deposited in uh, each account as trawl only or unrestricted. Uh, second is an option the council might select that would uh, convert all of the uh, trawl only quota pounds to unrestricted quota pounds sometime in the later part of the year or after the end of the year. Uh, third is a choice on whether or not to include the opt out provision that I mentioned a few moments ago. And then fourth, uh, if the opt out provision is included, then the fourth decision point is just what the qualification requirements would, would be. So looking at the gear specific quota pound uh, options, there's two here. Uh, one is uh, everybody gets 70% trawl only and 30% unrestricted or any gear. And the other is a 90-10 split in that regard. Then uh, we have this conversion date option. Uh, if this is, uh, <clears throat> so included and the alternatives, all trawl only quota pounds would become unrestricted on either August 1st or September 1st or after the end of the year. Uh, and if it was after the end of the year, that would be uh, starting with either a post season trading or if there is a carryover, uh, then uh, with the carryover. Uh, given that the ACLs and ABCs are, for stable fish are expected, northern stable fish are expected to be <clears throat> equal to one another for a while, carryover would not be expected in the near term, but uh, something that might happen over the, the longer term or if the conditions change. So again, these are the options for partway through the year. <clears throat> All the quota pounds that is trawl only would become uh, unrestricted and eligible for use in gear switching. Okay, then we mentioned the opt-out option, which is a, a option for the uh, council uh, to select. Um, and the opt-out opportunity would be allocated uh, based on permit history. <clears throat> Any permit owner that qualified would be allowed to designate a quota share account that they would then be opted out. And, and that quota share account could be any account, not just the one that the person owns or they could, they could uh, open a new uh, quota share account to, to designate. And then all quota pound issued to that account would be unrestricted with respect to gear. And then quote, <clears throat> one important piece of this is that after that opt-out account is designated, then quota share can be added to the opt-out account at any time after implementation, and the unrestricted quota pounds would be issued for that additional Northern Sablefish quota share. Then uh, the duration of the opt-out status would be limited. Uh, recall that uh, I mentioned earlier that quota shower accounts are not transferable, uh, so the opt-out provision would expire uh, when the quota share account expires. <clears throat> Plus the alternative specifies that the opt-out status on the, of an account would expire with the addition of a new owner to the existing ownership. And that's to avoid the possible circumvention of the intended expiration through some kind of additional addition and subtraction of owners. And you'll see this basic uh, uh, rule uh, for expiring a grandfather privilege under each of the other alternatives. Uh, you'll see something similar to this idea of um, if there's an owner added, uh, then the privilege uh, expires. Or, or if there's a wholesale transfer, obviously. So I now want to go over a little interaction uh, between the uh, options. 
So the uh, SAM tax specified a linkage uh, between the decision on whether to include an opt-out and the amount of gear-specific quota pounds to be issued to each account. If the opt-out provision is chosen, they said then issuing either 30% or 10% is unrestricted be fine. Uh, but if it's not chosen, then they felt there would not be enough gear switching op opportunity under the 10% approach. So um, if you don't choose the option, the opt-out option, then the recommendation is that you only look at the 30% uh, uh, being issued as unrestricted and eligible for gear switching. So now I want to uh, puzzle out sort of the effects of these different options on the amount of quota pounds that might be available uh, at sort of a more uh, conceptual level and visualize this. So uh, this graphic here that you see now on the uh, vertical axis is the percentage of quota pound that's unrestricted. And then we've got through the year, the months of the year uh, on the horizontal axis. Uh, so what this shows here is the, the bottom bar would be if you issued, uh, uh, selected the option that would issue 10% of the quota pounds as unrestricted in every, into everybody's account. Uh, and then the bar on top of that, when you add those two bars together, it comes to 30%, uh, which is the 30% the to all the accounts. Then if we bring in the opt-out provision, there's a lot of uncertainty about that because we don't know what quota share accounts would be opted out. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, over time, more quota share could be added to an account. In that quota share, we get unrestricted quota pounds. So we just kind of put this fuzzy uh, area up there to represent the opt-out option. And then there is the conversion date issue, which is the period when all the all of the trawl only quota pounds would become unrestricted. And so that's represented by this gray bar here. It represents it uh, happening in the August September time frame. As I mentioned, there's also an option where that wouldn't happen until after the end of the year. And then this little table here, I'm not gonna go over it, but just kind of uh, gives you the same information I just gave you verbally. So then uh, if the opt-out option is selected, uh, the qualifying history would be based on uh, the permit. The qualification would be based on permit history. Uh, you'll see a slide like it, this for the uh, qualification requirements for the, each of the alternatives. Um, here you see the qualification sub-options lifted down the, uh, listed down the side and then the period of time over which the qualification has to be met are these colored bars in the center. Uh, and then the qualification amount is on the right-hand side. So you see here for sub-option A, uh, the, <clears throat> the you see uh, on the far right-hand side one landing, and that landing has to be made sometime between January 1st is the start of the period, and December 31st of 2018 is the ending, ending of the period. Uh, then looking down as an example on sub-option D, you see the qualifying amount is 30,000 pounds, and there's two ways to get in the door under option D, either make that 30 pounds, those 30 pounds of landings between January 1st of 2011, the start of the program, and the control date of September 15th, 2017, or make the landings between the start of 2014 and the end of 2018. And Jesse will be going over uh, a lot of information on the, uh, or some information on these qualification requirements again later, and about numbers of qualifiers and so forth. So uh, moving toward completing the alternative one picture, uh, a few other provisions I want to mention. Uh, gear specific quota pounds amounts, uh, the recommendation is to set them in the FMP with the idea of providing more certainty going into the future as to the uh, levels that would be available. Um, and then uh, <clears throat> the other piece here is that vessels using trawl gear that have both types of quota pounds in their account, both the trawl only and the unrestricted, would choose which type of quota pound, pounds they want to use. Um, I just mentioned needing to make that choice will add a little bit of administrative cost because information on that choice will have to be passed from the vessel through the buyer and into the data system, along with potential, potential for errors that then have to go, be, be go back and correct it and so forth. And uh, the GMT report will talk, be talking about another approach would just be have a default rule, which would uh, 
simplify the program and, and uh, reduce, uh, reduce some administrative costs or program costs. Let me stop here and see if there's any questions about alternative one before we move into alternative two. Okay, questions for uh, Jim from anyone? Okay, seeing none, Jim, uh, proceed. Okay. So alternative two is on the uh, gear switching endorsements. And uh, here you have uh, four choices, uh, choice points identified. The first three have, three have to do with the, the endorsement itself. You have the qualifying, uh, the qualification options for the endorsement, then the limits, the, the gear switching limits that would apply, uh, and then whether or not the endorsements expire. Uh, and then there's a, uh, an issue having to do with if you have a gear switching limit uh, overage, how you handle that. And there's an option for you to, to consider there. So under alternative two, um, every vessel would get at least a 0.5% 0, 0 uh, gear switching limit uh, for northern sablefish. Then there would be higher limits for vessels uh, with the gear switching endorsement. Uh, and there's options for you to consider there. It would either be the average percentage for the permit uh, for the years fished or 4.5%, uh, which is you recall from earlier is the vessel uh, quota pound limit. Then um, the, the uh, endorsement qualification options, uh, you, again, uh, qualifying based on here based on uh, permit history. And here's a similar graph to that we just looked at. Uh, some of the, one of the main difference here notice is that um, the qualifying amount of 10,000 pounds for option one here has to be in at least three years. So you have to have uh, 10,000 pounds in three years between January, uh, between 2011 and then the control date 2017. And then on the far right hand side, you'll see there's a sub option having to do with recent participation. And that would just be that you'd have to have at least one landing in that period of 2016 and 2000 to 2018. And that's uh, under option one and two, that's specified as a, as a council choice as to whether to include that recent participation or not. You see under option two, you go to 30,000 pounds. Then option three, again, has the two ways through the door. Um, and for the first way through the door, uh, based on the 2011 to 2017 period, under that one, the SAM tax recommended that recent participation be required uh, through the second option, uh, the 2014 to 18, uh, you'd have to have the recent participation in order to meet that uh, requirement anyway, so it's, it's not applicable. So those are your, your uh, qualification options there. Uh, I already mentioned earlier when I went over the uh, the uh, endorsements themselves, I mentioned what the two limits were, the limit options, uh, historic average gear switching for years fished, and the 4.5% uh, uh, option. And then there's the endorsement expiration options, uh, which would be um, either that they would expire with the addition of or to transfer to a new owner or they would go on indefinitely. So they, you could uh, transfer those to future generations. So then we come to the issue of uh, how to handle a gear switching overage where there's a sub option to consider here. The, the basic provision is that any gear switching overage would reduce a permits uh, following year gear switching limit. Uh, and so we just kind of accept that as part of the program. After they, they reach the limit or go over, they couldn't do any more gear switching and they would have to cover that overage with quota pounds. Um, and then, and then again, the uh, the following year's limit would be uh, reduced. But under the sub option, uh, the following year's limit would not be reduced. Uh, so they would have to stop fishing, cover it with quota pounds, 
uh, but it would have no effect on the subsequent year's limit, uh, which, you know, so then just part of it would be that a vessel could fish up to, you know, close to the limit and then uh, go out and uh, catch a full limit or a full boatload and bring that in and, and be over the limit. That But that would just be kind of part of how the how the program works. So in a sense, it wouldn't be over the limit because it would be allowed within the provisions of the program. That's just kind of in one sense of it. Okay, so uh, completing the picture here, a uh, few refiner points I just want to introduce without going into a lot of detail. Uh, for permit transfers, the annual gear switching limit applies to the permit, and a partially limit used limit travels with the permit when it's transferred, so a second vessel could could use it or use it. Uh, then there's an issue related to the sequentially uh, <clears throat> registering a series of permits to a vessel in order to increase its gear switching amount. Uh, and so that would not be allowed with respect to the uh, the, the base, the 0.5% limit. Uh, but the question is left open as to whether it might be allowed with respect to uh, the limits associated with gear switch endorsement per endorsed permits. And then finally, there's an issue regarding what happens to the gear switching endorsement if permits are combined to create a single permit with a larger size uh, endorsement this is one of the provisions of the program. If that were to happen, uh, the gear, if there's a gear switching endorsement or one of the permits that would survive the combination and be on the resulting permit, if there are endorsements on both the permits being combined, only one of the endorsements would be on the resulting permit. And uh, the larger, the one with the larger size would be the one that would survive the uh, combination. So let me stop there and see if there's any uh, any questions. Okay, uh, questions for Jim? Okay, seeing none, Jim, proceed. Okay. So alternative three, uh, the active trawlers, um, choice points, uh, the exempted vessel qualification options, and then uh, the expiration uh, options for the exempt the exemption, uh, and then some uh, options with respect to uh, gear switching uh, limit overages. So first, uh, look at the active trawler provision. Um, a vessel qualifies as an, as an active trawler by making at least six landings of a required size. And once it achieves active trawler status, that status is, value, is valid for the remainder of the year and all of the following calendar year. A vessel qualifies as an active trawler uh, would, have its, uh, would have a gear switching limit uh, that would be uh, 1%. However, the active trawlers as a whole would also have a backstop of 10% gear switching uh, so what that means is that if the group as a whole went over that 10% in one year, in the following year, the 1% vessel limit would be adjusted downward to keep the group within the 10% uh, limit. So the group as a whole could never go over the 10%. The vessels would start out by the, with this 1% limit adjustable. Uh, we'd move it down to make sure the group doesn't go over that 10%. And then we have the uh, provisions for the exemption from the active trawl uh, requirement. Uh, the vessel would qualify uh, for, uh, excuse me. So it was just the vessel that would qualify for the exemption. Um, and then the owner of the qualified vessel would uh, designate uh, the permit that would be exempted. So even though the vessel qualified, it's still the permit that ends up carrying the uh, the privilege, that's the grandfather privilege. Uh, an exempted vessel then would have a gear switching limit of 0.6% or the amount of quota share that the vessel owner owns. And similar to the backstop percentage for the active trawlers, there's a backstop percentage here for that that would apply to that 0.6% limit. And again, it's 10%. So if at the start of the program, we looked at who qualified, the amount of quota share owned, and so forth, 
and it looked like this group was going to go over uh, 10% gear switching, that 0.6% limit would be adjusted downward uh, to keep this group within the ten uh, percent backstop, so under this alternative, the the uh, the idea is that the maximum that could ever be gear switched would be twenty percent, and then um, after these exemptions expire, because they are designed to expire, uh, you'd be left just with the ten percent backstop for the uh, active trawlers, which would be the maximum that could be could be landed. <laughs> So uh, for vessels that are, are neither active trawlers uh, nor exempted, uh, and there are some that are out there uh, gear switching and not, tar not targeting on sablefish, but uh, there's just a little bit of, of uh, gear switching going on, not, not for sablefish. So those vessels would, uh, under this alternative, would have to discard any uh, northern sablefish uh, that's taken as bycatch. So uh, the exemption uh, would expire uh, with the transfer or addition of a new uh, owner to the permit. Uh, just again, this is the same same rule that we've uh, been looking at under the other alternatives. Uh, but there is this other uh, provision here as well, which would uh, bring the curtain down on these exemptions after 12 years uh, after the regulations are, are implemented. That's an option that uh, is there for you to, to consider. Qualifying for the uh, exemption uh, based again on, based on vessel history in contrast to alternatives one and two. Uh, but as I mentioned a few moments ago, even though it's based on vessel history, the privilege still would end up going to the permit that the vessel owner designates. Here are your uh, qualification periods again, uh, the amounts that would have to be landed. Uh, these are uh, somewhat similar to those for alternative two, except for there's no recent participation. Um, uh, part of the of the ones for alternative three. And then uh, the overage sub option, uh, this is the same as what, the one that we talked about for alternative two, either um, uh, either deducting from the following year or uh, just uh, uh, allowing the vessel to have the overage is just part of the function of the program and, and not making an adjustment to the following year. But uh, once it uh, reaches that uh, limit, it has to stop fishing. It obviously always has to cover any catch with uh, quota pounds. Uh, so in this slide, I, I want to bring it, uh, uh, bring together several different elements uh, that we've covered. Uh, first, we have the basic situation uh, in which a vessel qualifies for an exemption. The vessel owner designates the permit to which the exemption would be attached. And the permit then carries the exemption and the associated 0.6% uh, limit. So that's, your, that's sort of a, I'm going to just call that sort of the basic situation. Uh, we recall then there's also this potential for a vessel to have a limit that's based on the amount of quota share owned by the vessel owner. And these first steps within would be the same. Uh, but then if the vessel owner also owns a quota share account and there is a 50% linkage between the vessel and the vessel owner's quota share account, then the vessel limit would be based on the amount of quota share in that quota share account. And for this limit to apply, the exempted permit does have to stay uh, with the vessel. But recall the permits can be leased but not sold. Um, so they can be leased without causing that exemption to expire. But if they're sold, as we've talked about, they, it would expire. So if the vessel owner leases the permit out, the vessel that uses the permit, they would then have the 0.6% limit, but the, uh, the vessel-based quota share limit would not apply until that permit or another exempted permit is back on the, the original vessel. 
So all, all these wrinkles are probably not integral, integral to the purpose of the alternative, and they may not have even been intended on the part of the original proponents, but they are sort of implications for how the provisions were specified and, and how all the parts ended up fitting together when we took a look at them. So there may be some opportunity for some simplification here that would not, uh, again, hamper the, um, the effectiveness of the alternative. So uh, completing the, uh, the picture here a little bit, uh, for alternative three, there are a number of different elements. I'm going to just note them, not go into a lot of detail. Uh, there is the divestment of quota share. Uh, we just saw that when the uh, <coughs> owner of a vessel that qualifies for an exemption also owns a quota share account, the amount of northern quota share in that account determines its limit. However, in that case, the quota share used to determine the limit has to have been in the quota share account as of and since the control date. So if the vessel owner divests of some quota share, the limit then goes down to that new lower limit at lower level. And once it goes down, it can't go back up. Next is uh, quota share account replacement. Um, so while divestment would, would reduce the quota share owner's limit, there is this provision that allows the, the wholesale transfer of quota share to a new quota share account under the same ownership. This is prior to the implementation of the program, and that could occur without losing the opportunity to have a limit based on the amount of quota share owned. Then there is a, a vessel replacement provision. Uh, in the previous slide, we saw how there had to be the common ownership between the quota share account and the vessel, uh, but there is a provision that allows the replacement of a qualifying vessel after implementation and, and uh, still maintaining that common ownership. Uh, let's see, and then for uh, vessel, uh, for exempted permit transfers, uh, require, recall the limit is not, this is where the limit is not determined on quota share ownership, but it's that just that straight 0.6% uh, limit. Uh, when, that, when you have that uh, situation and the permit is transferred, the, the permit, the limit goes with the permit, and uh, it could be partially used by one vessel and then transferred to another vessel and partially used on that other vessel. So you might have you know, a quarter of it used on one vessel that gets transferred to another and then the remaining three quarters of the limit uh, be used. Um, and this would only come up with where the permits being leased because recall again, permit transfers uh, cause the expiration of the um, exemption. Uh, then there's a sequential registration issue similar to what we talked about under alternative one. I'm not going to go into it here. Um, there's the issue of what happens if a vessel is both an exempted vessel and an active trawler. And the rule there is just the larger uh, limit applies. And then there's the backstop percentages. And I already talked about those under the uh, earlier slides. Let me stop there and see if there's any questions on alternative three or any of the uh, previous alternatives. The next thing we'll be going to here is the uh, analytical presentation by Jesse. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Um, Maggie Summer. Uh, Maggie? Thanks very much, Vice Chair. Jim, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I do have a, a couple questions. Um, several of the, the provisions in these alternatives, for example, um, the provision on uh, under alternative three for the adjustable 1% limit. This was on slide 37. Mm -hmm. um, just as one example that it, could you remind me and sorry if you said this and I didn't catch it, is that the intent there that that would be adjusted on an annual basis? Uh, yes. Uh, so you would, uh, um, yeah, exactly. So you you would get the you would get the results from the previous season. There's probably going to be some time lag here by the time you get the results, but then you would make it make an adjustment from year to year as needed. Okay. Thanks very much. That's all. Okay. Thank you, Maggie. Um, any uh, further questions? Okay, Jim. 
I guess we can move forward to the uh, to Jesse. Okay. Um, you want, if you want to take a moment, I, we can uh, switch to uh, Jesse as the presenter here, or with that. Uh... Please. Okay. Sandra, can you switch this to Jesse? Or Jesse, I think you, if you're already a co-host, just go ahead and project your screen. There you go. Okay, can y'all hear me? Um, we can, uh, Jesse, and uh, good, good morning. Morning. <laughs> um, let me just get to the right. Are you guys seeing the presenter view or the slide? A uh, presenter view. Uh, view. There we go. Okay, I always have the wrong one up. Uh, let's see here. I, I think we're getting seasick. <laughs> I know Jim got very fancy this time around <laughs> with his presentation. Okay, well, if y'all are ready, then I will uh, kick off the uh, assessment of the action alternatives. I, I think we're ready, so please proceed. Okay. Perfect. So uh, just kind of setting a baseline here, let's just took, uh, we're gonna take a quick reminder at the trends of Sable Fish North Harvest under no action. So it's highly attained with uh, ACL attainment averaging 94% from 2011 through 2019 and IQ attainment of total available pounds, which is the allocation plus the surplus carryover averaging 93% in that same time period. Of the IFQ uh, total available pounds, an average of 30% has been gear switched from 2011 through 2019, and that's uh, been by 40 vessels and 40 permits. This graph here on the slide is something you guys saw in September, and just a quick reminder. So on the top panel shows the percent utilization by fixed gear, um, from 2011 through 2019, and the bottom panel shows the number of vessels that gear switched. It only shows the number of vessels because the permit trend was very similar, and so this was just a simpler way to look at it. So in recent years, we've seen it average 33% of total available pounds have been gear switched from 2016 to 2019, and the number of permits and vessels that are gear switching in those years has um, been leveled at about 15 to 16 units. Okay, so now that we've kind of had a quick refresher on no action, now we're going to move forward into some general considerations for the action alternatives, and specifically whether or not to allocate to the permit or the vessel. So gear switching vessels tend to lease about half of their permits, while trawl, permit, trawl vessels tend to own their own permits and actually had the highest leasing percentage in 2019 at an estimated 13%. So of uh, the 40 vessels and permits that have been used for gear switching from 2011 through 2019, there have been eight vessels that have used more than one permit to gear switch. 10 permits have been used on more than two vessels, and yet there has been no vessel permit combination used in all nine years. So, um, in that situation. So there's been four vessels that have gear switched in all nine years, but no permit has been used for all nine years. So those four vessels at some point over these years have either leased a permit, bought a new permit, something like that. And depending on when we'll walk through alternatives, you know, the choice of your allocation on permits or vessel history could impact who receives that privilege. Okay. First up is uh, alternative one, the gear specific quota pound alternative. Jim showed this slide earlier. So there are four key provisions that will determine the amount of gear switching allowed under alternative one. So you have the gear specific quota pound option, the conversion dates, the opt out provision option, and then the qualification options that would allow permits to opt out a quota share account. We're gonna first start out with the kind of base um, part of this alternative, which is the gear specific quota pound option. As a reminder, there are two options recommended by the SAMTAC, uh, 
Option one is 70% trial only, 30% unrestricted. Option two is 90% trial only, 10% unrestricted. So just taking that at the base level, how would this um, impact quota share accounts and how much uh, quota would they receive as unrestricted? So on your screen, you should be seeing figure two from attachment three, and uh, we'll just walk through this graph. So on the bottom, you have quota share accounts ordered from the least amount of stable fish quota owned in February 2020 to the most amount of stable fish quota owned. On the y-axis, you have the unrestricted quota pounds that would be issued to those quota share accounts um, if these two options were um, issued at the time. And then the solid line is showing the distribution of option one. So 30% of the quota, quota share would be issued as unrestricted. And option two is in the dashed line. So that's 10% um, would be issued as unrestricted quota pounds. There are 38 quota share accounts without any stable fish north in them in 2020. And the max quota pounds amounts that would be issued in these circumstances would be about 52,000 pounds under option one and 17,000 pounds under option two. And you can see this on the far right side of the graph where the lines both peak. I'll note that these are pretty close to the maximum amount that could be issued under the current stable fish quota share limit of 3%. Further, 2021 values um, here would be about 25% higher given the increase in the ACL um, that you guys adopted back in June for the next biennium. The average gear switching vessel in 2018 to 2019 landed approximately 114,000 pounds. So, Absent an opt-out or a mid-year conversion, vessels with quota share accounts would still have to acquire more quota pounds um, to be able to gear switch up to that level. Given that, uh, we wanted to take a look at how difficult would it be to access quota pounds on the market under no opt-out or a conversion date. Here is table eight in attachment three, and it shows the minimum number of quota share accounts required under each gear specific quota pound option that would be needed to accumulate a designated percentage of the allocation. For example, to get 2.5% of the allocation as unrestricted quota pounds, you would need to either get the quota from the top four quota share accounts under option one and the top 12 under option two. Looking at the um, referring back to the average vessel gear switching level in 2018 to 2019, um, on the previous slide of 114,000 pounds, it would take an unrestricted quota pounds from a minimum of three quota share accounts under option one and nine quota share accounts under option two to be able to accumulate enough quota pounds to um, cover that average take. However, it is likely that vessels interested in gear switching would need more trades than the minimum, as those top three or nine accounts respectively may not be willing to trade, and there are multiple gear switching vessels that would likely want as much, at least as much unrestricted quota pounds as the average annual amount for all gear switchers. So what are the key take homes here? Vessels would need to work with quota share account owners to access quota pounds. There are going to be costs associated with these transactions. And option two is likely to require more trades and acquisitions to gather quota pounds. And we'll note this is one of the reasons that the SAMTEC recommended that the opt-out be um, included if the 90-10 uh, option was chosen as the gear-specific quota pound option for alternative one. So our next choice is looking at the conversion date. Here we have a summarized table from tables nine and 10 in attachment three. So there are two mid-year conversion dates, August 1 and September 1, at which time any trawl only quota pounds would be converted to unrestricted quota pounds. The uh, second and third columns here show the average gear switch catch prior to the conversion date as a percentage of the total gear switch catch 
um, which we typically see about a fourth to a little over a third um, taken on average prior to the two conversion dates um, between 2011 and um, 2019. And then on the far right-hand column is the average gear switch catch prior to the conversion date um, as a percentage of the total available pounds. So we've seen an average of 8% being taken before August 1st on average and 11% on average taken before September 1st. I do note that um, in 2019, we did see an above average take of the amount of uh, total available quota pounds by fixed gear. Uh, totaling about 14.1% in 2019. Given these trends, it is likely that under either option, gear switching is unlikely to be substantially constrained on the fleet level, although potentially not for individuals if they do fish earlier. However, it is likely that participants would be able to make up fishing at the end of the year where the majority of activity occurs. Under the 90-10 gear specific quota pound option, or option two, there might just be more of a delay in activity until after the conversion date compared to option one. In addition to the two mid-year conversion dates, there is also uh, option three, which would convert any trawl only quota pounds to unrestricted at the end of the year. Um, there are two uh, dates to consider. One is the conversion prior to postseason trading, and the other is the conversion at the time of surplus carryover. Note that based on the new stock assessment and the default harvest control rule um, selected for the 2021-2022 um, cycle, there's no carryover to be issued in the coming years. But in case you do want to select this option, just for some perspective, on average, there was about 200,000 pounds of carryover issued between 2012 and 2019. Okay, so now we're going to move into our opt-out qualifiers, which Jim mentioned before, and y'all saw this table in September. Here we're looking at the um, permits that would qualify to opt out a quota share account uh, that would receive all their quota pounds as unrestricted. So there are four sub options with the various qualification criteria that you can see um, here in the second column. Between 26 and 38 permits would qualify to opt out under these uh, sub-options, with 22 qualifying under all options. The next column shows the percent of permits with gear switching history between 2011 and 2018. Um, so 68 to 100% of permits um, under these options would qualify. I do want to note that there were two additional permits that gears entered the gear switching fishery in 2019 that would not be included in this column and would not qualify for any options. Um, and then finally, the far right column shows the qualifiers percentage of the 2020 allocation based on their average gear switch catch. Um, and this is just for perspective, it is not to be seen as a projection. One thing to consider is that permits affected across alternatives vary. So while the total number, um, the total difference between options B and C is seven, there are actually 13 permits that are affected by this decision in total. And you can see more details on this in table 13 on attachment three. Okay, so for those permits that would be able to opt out, um, we would then need to look at how many and um, how much unrestricted quota pounds would be available under that opt out. So remember that qualifiers could select their own quota share account, an account under another ownership, or even open up a new account um, that would receive the opt out designation. You can add quota share to any of these accounts after implementation that would still receive the unrestricted um, quota pound designation and it um, up to the 3% control limit. However, it's really difficult to determine which accounts a permit might choose. Depending on the range of alternatives if selected at this meeting, there are a couple methodologies proposed to look at on what the potential opt-out accounts might be and how much quota they're associated with. And just to provide some stats around ownership for illustration and specifically looking at, you know, 
sub option A is the max amount of permits um, that would qualify, and that's 38 because it just requires one landing with fixed gear from 2011 through 2018. At looking at 2020 ownership, you know, you could think, well, maybe they opt out the top 38 accounts. If that happens, it would equate to 53.6% of the quota pounds um, as of February 2020. But that's probably not going to happen because it's a low likelihood that all of the top 38 quota share accounts are owned by gear switching entities or that they would be selected. Um, another range, you know, is the middle 38 account, which would own around 24.5% of the quota pounds. Again, these were just kind of examples to provide some context. Whatever number does come out may change as quota share can be added or quota share accounts can, um, the opt-out can expire and then that quota share account would receive uh, the designated percentages. And I'm going to pause there and see if there are any questions before we move on to alternative two. Okay. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, questions for Jesse? Okay. Seeing none, uh, continue. Okay. So now we're looking at alternative two, which is our gear switching endorsement alternative. Here we have our choices slide that Jim presented earlier um, that these are the key elements that would determine the amount of gear switching. I'm going to focus here on the first two as they're the really the primary determining factors of potential gear switching, uh, noting that the expiration options would affect the long-term amount of gear switching. Okay, so first up is our gear switching endorsement qualifiers. So these would be permits that would qualify um, based on their history and will receive a higher gear switching limit compared to every other trawl permit. So you have your three options. Um, options one and two do include that recent participation sub option that's available. Between 10 and 15 permits would qualify for an endorsement. 10 would qualify under all options. Um, and we're looking at about 26 to 39% of permits qualifying that had some history of gear switching between 2011 and 2018. Okay, so for those 10 to 15 permits, if we're looking at the current options in front of us, um, there are two endorsement limit options uh, proposed by the SAMTAC for consideration. Option one is the average percentage of the allocation taken in active gear switching years um, between 2011 and the control date. And option two is the 4.5%, which is the same as the annual vessel limit for Sablefish North. Um, it would just apply to permit. For option one, uh, looking at across all of the five options, so the three main options with the two sub um, options for recent participation. Between three and six permits would receive a limit less than 1.5%. All qualification options would have three permits with a limit of over 3%. So since endorsement limit option one is individualized to each permit based on an average, vessels might not be able to maintain their previous gear switching levels since their average would be lowered by the elimination of opportunity to harvest at levels comparable to their historic above average years. Option two, um, again, is the 4.5%. So there have been seven permits that have caught more than 4% of the allocation between 2011 through 2018 with fixed gear. Um, it's likely that each permit that would qualify would catch less than 4.5% um, given the trends. However, if permits are transferable, it may increase the odds. So since endorsement limit option two is the maximum amount of quota pounds a vessel is able to land, any vessel fishing under endorsed permit should be able to gear switch in amounts equal to or above its gear switching history, unless the vessel chooses to share the permit with another vessel if such sharing is allowed under the final alternative. And one thing to note, um, I missed updating this amongst everything in this recent document. So um, here we're looking at 2011 through 2018 trends. 
Um, in 2019, we actually had five permits that took over 4% of the allocation, um, which considering there were only 14 instances before 2019 of over 4% by those seven permits, there may be increased odds of permits catching up to the limit if this trend continues. So next we're gonna look at non-endorsed permits, which would um, any trawl endorsed permit that did not receive an endorsement would be allowed to gear switch up to 0.5% of the allocation. In 2020, that would result in about 29,000 uh, pounds. In 2021, we would look more at 35,000 pounds. Under all options of those permits with gear switching history that would not qualify for an endorsement, between four to seven permits, active average catch, so gear switching in the years that they gear switched, would be under the limit of 0.5%. Um, between 19 and 21 permits, active average catch would actually be over that limit. Since the gear switching limits apply to the endorsed permits rather than the vessel, and if the permits can be transferred between vessels, some vessels that want to do more gear switching then can be accommodated by the limit for non-endorsed vessels of 0.5%. They might be able to lease an endorsed permit from a vessel that is not fully utilizing it. And this kind of brings it back to the point um, I mentioned on the previous slide where we might see uh, increased usage of that option to limit of 4.5%. Um, just because maybe I have a permit and I typically take about 3%, but then I could lease my permit out to somebody else who could take the remaining 1.5% as opposed to being stuck with a 0.5% limit. And I'll pause there to see if there are any questions on alternative two. Okay, uh, questions for Jesse? Okay. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. If you don't mind, I actually have a question on Jesse's uh, presentation of Alternative 1. I was too slow to remember that I had a question when you asked for them last time. It was on slide 54. Jesse, when you were presenting this slide, um, I'm sorry, you were you were also talking about figures 3% and 9%, and I, I did not follow what that was. So if you wouldn't mind repeating that, I'd find it helpful. Thank you. Absolutely, Mr. Vice Chair. So it wasn't a percent. I believe you're maybe thinking about, I was, I was referring to um, in order to accumulate enough quota pounds to um, gear switch the average gear switching amount from 2018 to 2019, which was that 114,000 pound approximation, you would need to gather up enough quota pounds um, from the top three quota share accounts of option one and the top nine quota share accounts under option two to acquire enough unrestricted quota pounds um, to cover that average amount. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, any more questions? Okay, Jesse. Okay, so moving on to alternative three. Here we have um, the choices slide that Jim presented earlier there, and I'm really going to focus on the exempted vessel qualification options um, and the potential gear switching limits for those vessels. The, um, here again, the exempted expiration option would definitely impact the um, level of gear switching over the long term, but uh, we're just kind of taking the first step in the, in the first short term gear switching percentage here. Okay, so there are two pathways to gear switch under alternative three. You can be an active trawler or you can receive an exemption. Um, Real quick refresher um, on Jim's slide on the active trawler. So you're required to make six IFQ landings of a certain size north of 36. Um, there are differential poundage criteria for those six landings north of 4010 compared to between 36 and 4010. The designation is good for that year and the following year. And you're allowed to gear switch up to 1% of the Sable Fish North allocation, which was about 58,000 pounds in 2022. 
looking back retrospectively, um, an average of 86% of IFQ vessels would have qualified in each year. And you can see this by um, the black bars on this graph show the number of vessels that would have qualified for an active trawler designation at some point in that year. And the gray bars are the number of vessels that would not qualify. Note that while the council is focused on the gear switching privileges and the potential options there, you know, this is another part where you can consider modifications to the either requirements or allowances with the active trawler as they would impact the overall gear switching levels. Okay, moving forward to the active trawler exemption. Um, this is uh, based on vessel history, and this was a slide you guys saw in September. So um, this is summarized from Table 19 and Attachment 3. You have your two options uh, to receive the exemption and the description of the qualification. Between 11 and 12 vessels would qualify for an exemption, um, with 11 qualifying under all options. So... This would equate to about a little less than a third of the vessels that have gear switching history between 2011 and 2018, which was 38 vessels. Um, similar to what I described under alternatives one and two, um, there were actually two vessels that entered the gear switching fishery in 2019 that would also not qualify and are not included in this statistic. And then you have um, the far right col column again is showing the percent of the 2020 allocation based on these vessels average catch um, and is not a projection just for perspective. So for those vessels that receive an exemption, they could either fish 0.6% of the quota or the amount of quota share owned as of and since the control date. Based on 2019 vessel account information under both options, five vessel owners own quota share and could fish that amount of quota share um, as opposed to being restricted to the 0.6%. I'll note this is an update from attachment three. Over the weekend, um, doing some work, we identified that one of the exempted vessels um, did actually have common ownership with a quota share account as of and since the control date. And so, um, we have this updated information and it would be included in any um, follow-up analysis related to this alternative. So let's just say some of the five um, quota share equal to the 0.6% proposed limit uh, for vessels that don't own quota share. Um, and the total amount of quota share owned by these five vessels is 5.44%. Uh, So given that only 11 to 12 of the 40 historical gear switching vessels would be able to, enter, to gear switch under the exemptions, um, there are really those two pathways for gear switching. You can either lease an exempted permit or you could qualify as an active trawler. So um, to assess how likely vessels are to take advantage of the active trawler provision, we took a look back at historical trends. There have only been 10 vessels between 2011 and 2019 that have used both trawl and fixed gear in the same year. Eight of those 10 would have qualified as an active trawler in at least one year between 2011 and 2019. Five of those eight that would have qualified as an active trawler qualified in a year previous to them gear switching. And um, of those, there are three that actually landed more than the 1% allowance for fixed gear if it would have been in place in the year that they gear switched. Um, and I'm gonna hold questions here because I do have one last slide. Um, so we just wanted to kind of point out that there is in attachment three on page 41, there is a section on proposed methodologies for assessing gear switching. Um, you know, we briefed the GMT on this and are looking forward to getting input from them as well as the SSC um, and anyone else who happens to have thoughts. Um, but we're, we're working towards trying to find a best, some of the, uh, the best approach for assessing the amount of gear switching amongst all these alternatives um, or whatever you choose to move forward. And now I'll take any final questions. Okay. Um, 
Thank you, Jesse. Any questions for Jesse? Okay, um, we'll start with Maggie Summer first, followed by Bob Dooley. Maggie? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Jesse, just a question on your very last comment uh, that you were hoping to get input from the GMT, maybe SSC or others. Um, you're certainly not expecting that at this meeting, I, I believe. Do you have um, thoughts on when you would expect to get that? Ms. Summer, Mr. Vice Chair, yes. Um, you know, we briefed the GMT uh, and just try to, you know, kind of walk them through our thoughts. I think, you know, this could be something, um, depending on your action here, we move forward. They are slated, I think, to have their January meeting. That might be one area. Um, again, a lot's going to depend on what comes out of this meeting and um, when we might bring it back to the SSC at a meeting in maybe March or April. Um, so this will be in the coming months. It was kind of our initial game plan. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Bob? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Jesse, thanks for the presentation. It's, it was really informative. I noted on slide 56, no, slide 68, that you noted in, in alternative three that it's per year, quota pounds per year in at least three years. But I also no, noticed that that, and this is probably something you didn't look at, but I'm sure you looked at it. Uh, slide 29 on alternative two and slide 38 on alternative, or slide 42 on alternative three, um, noted that it was didn't say per year, although it, it did have that hash mark or the, slash mark that that indicated it could be that so i'm i'm not if one it says in at least three years like you show here but it also says qualified amount thirty thousand pounds and i assume that slash means per year um could you clarify that mr julie mr vice chair yes so um for this it's thirty thousand pounds per year in at least three years um, for option one or the kind of either or part of option two here. Okay. Thank you. That, that That's useful. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Um, any more questions? All right, Jesse. Um, oh. Okay. I see your, your presentation went away. Are we, uh, are we done? Oh, oh, yes, we're done. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I saw some additional slides on your thing down below that. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, okay, with that, let's see. Okay, um, with that, um, I think we'll move to the uh, WDFW report and uh, Corey Niles. Or uh, let's see here. Actually, it's nine thirty. Um, let's um, let's take a break for ten minutes. How's that sound? We've been going out here for a little while, and get back here at uh, uh, nine nine forty forty three. Nine, yeah, nine forty five. I'll be generous.
Okay, uh, is there a 30 second uh, warning here? We just started, 30 seconds. Okay, we're back and um, looking to um, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife Report 1. Uh, Corey Niles, Corey, are you there? I am, Mr. Vice Chair. Can you hear me okay? I, I can. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you um, for the opportunity to uh, speak to this report here. Probably just, uh, I'll, I'll summarize it here and just take a few minutes. Um, I won't read it. I will uh, will apologize for um, uh, for uh, just getting this this out yesterday um, in 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 brief. Where uh, this this is putting an idea out there for some additions to alternative um, one, um, as we just saw from from Jim and Jesse, um, the SAMTAC itself and and Jim and Jesse and others put a lot of thought and time into the existing alternatives and. I very much appreciate all that and been a lot of good work done um, looking at looking at that and, and again this is focused on SAMTAC recommended alternative one uh, we, we saw a few additions um, for to be exact uh, four options within that that we see as a what I would add some benefits to the council's uh, deliberations here in terms of both the analysis we'd expect to get back, and and some some flexibility and uh, and choices on how how to uh, how to uh, um, limit gear switching if if the council deems that to be necessary and appropriate. Uh, so quickly, I'll just go through the four pieces um, and kind of explain what they add to what's there now. Um, the first would just would be a, um, a new option where all quota would be converted to trawl only unless unless um, it's opted out. And the difference there is, as we saw from Jim and Jesse, the two options in there now have a, a baseline or a, a minimum amount of either 10 or 30 percent that all quota holders would get. So including this one would, part would just. Um, allow us to consider directing the unrestricted quota pounds um, to folks who have a connection to gear switching. So again, just to kind of expanding the range here to, to where we could have the choice of giving everybody some unrestricted quota pounds or using uh, a method to, to direct the quota, the unrestricted quota to folks who have um, been using it between 2011 and the control dates. Um, part B is uh, uh, kind of a big, a big focus here. Um, as we saw and as, as has come up in discussions and we'll, we'll hear from the GMT and some others um, later on about a, a lot of these alternatives, you're not quite sure uh, how much uh, unrestricted quota pounds there would be in the end. Um, you see Jesse made some estimates there, um, but it, it is a little bit uncertain if the, the alternatives and the options in alternative one kind of work up from the question of what's, what's fair and equitable, and then, and then the amount of quarter pounds that results, uh, it comes out of that. This, this adding option B here 
would would work the other way down start with a um a target percentage of of quota to leave as unrestricted and then and then figure out um how to fairly and equitably uh allocate it from there and we throw out um 12 percent to 33 percent as as a range to, that we could start analyzing um the 12 percent being the estimate of of um how much quota share is owned by gear switching businesses now and 33% being um, somewhat the, the average, the recent average in terms of um, quota pounds landed by fixed gear vessels in the IFQ program. Um, what we call in part C here is then it would be the way with which we would look at allocating um, that, that percentage of unrestricted quota to, to uh, participants in the IFQ program and um, proposing a, a, a two-tier system here, one that uses qualification criteria to find those folks that, that do own the quota share and own you know, a vessel, a fishing operation, and they would be of, you know, of, of showing the highest connection and uh, dependence on gear switching and would be given the opportunity to uh, to opt out all of their quota and leave it unrestricted. Um, and so if, if under that 12, if, if 12% 12 were the target amount, for example, those would be the only folks who got to opt out their quota. Um, a tier two, we're calling it here, would be then, would kick in if, if, if there's more unrestricted quota to be allocated than that. And um, we describe in the report in concept how it would work. It would be a, a point system or call our scoring system where we can quantify um, how connected a quota share account has been to a uh, gear switching. And um, it takes ownership information into account among other things. And it would, it would provide a scale at least to begin with to, where we can, we can see how folks compare on, on how much value they've, they've, they've earned um, in the fishery from transferring and, and fishing quota pounds with fixed gear. Uh, this, that tier two part is, is one that um, I had hoped we would got further with in time for this meeting. It does fall, it does involve uh, some analysis that we weren't able to get um, complete um, to actually inform more specific proposals there. Yet it, it, is, it is approaching completeness and do anticipate it could be ready in the next couple months and, and um, with more specifics to show, you know, by the time March and April roll around. Um, I'll, one more thing to say about that, I'll, and then I'll just, I'll skip to um, the last new option to add for some contrast would be uh, just using um, the existing options have a little bit of a different twist on how the quarter share rules work, um, have some expiration dates, et cetera, on them. This would just put an option in there where the quota share would behave like it does now with no strings attached. We, the option would be to just create two new units of, or split the existing Sablefish North quota share unit into two, one trawl only, one unrestricted, and that would be it. The quota, quota behaves as all our other quota does in the program. And again, there, that's just to more directly uh, compare and contrast the, uh, the, the, the differences that are in the current options and in giving more flexibility on, on where we'd arrive in the end. Um, last, I'll end up, by, I've neglected and but meant to, um, on what I call the tier two scoring system here, we did get some feedback on a key part of that, which is a, a way of, of, of tracing quarter pound transfers among vessel accounts. Um, we did get some feedback from, from NIMS last October at the SAMTAC meeting. Um, yeah, thanks to, uh, to all those NIMS, to Kelly, her staff, Melissa Hooper, her staff, even Asia's staff were, were involved in, in NOAA GC to a little, to some extent. And Aaron Steiner and Melissa Kriegbaum from the Science Center has reviewed the, the logic of the method and said it, that the logic looked good. NIMS does have some concerns. It is a, a novel way of looking at looking at this uh, fair and equitable considerations that they'll, they'd have to spend more time thinking about. And we recognize, understand that, and uh, would, would look forward to that dialogue there. I guess I would 
Um, say, I think we do have an IFQ program. Quota pound transfers are a key, key part of how that works in terms of how, how folks have earned um, value in this fishery by, you know, lease revenues is one part, but exchanging for a species of um, other species quota, you know, flexibility in business plans, Tra trading is a big part of how the program works. And I would be concerned if, if we didn't include that as part of how we evaluate what's fair and equitable to folks if we're to change the program. So that's the key thought there. The, the other thing I'll mention is the other focus that does the existing options focus as Jesse and Jim are showing us on the permit level and the permits, um, the, co the qualification criteria for opting out would be on the permit and this, this, these options would add uh, another way of looking at that of from the quota share account on down. Um, and again, it's, it's just, it adds a, a slightly different angle and it, it would look at the value of quota share directly, which is, seems to be where a lot of the value in the fishery is, is going to from the data we have available. You know, if you wanted to buy a percentage point of Sablefish North quota pounds, you're, you're talking $1.3 million probably. So there is a lot of value in the quota share that, and a lot of investment. And this, this option set of options would allow us to consider um, fair and equitable considerations from that angle. So I hope that summary was better than you reading this whole thing. Maybe not, but I will uh, stop there. Happy to answer questions now in council discussion. And apologies to everyone for, for getting that out late and understand if, if folks have not in the public and on the council have had not have not had time to uh, absorb it. But really, it's like, here's an idea we can bring flesh out and bring forward um, at the next step here in the process. OK, thank you, Corey. Uh, questions for Corey? Oh, um, Maggie Summer. Maggie? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you very much, Corey, for the report and um, the, the additional thinking. I have a question on um, the, uh, I guess, the, the qualification criteria you are, are suggesting might be considered for the opt-out. And I, I see in your report um, that it says the, qualify, the criteria would be brought forward at the next step and would be based on quota pound transfers between quota share accounts and vessel accounts. And uh, if you um, are ready at this point to describe uh, in, in briefly, but I think a little more information might be helpful for those who have not been deeply involved in the SAMTAC process and, and heard about uh, this, this type of um, approach through that, it might be, useful to hear, um, again, if you're prepared to share anything further about how that would work now or what some of the challenges are in linking quota share to how it was used um, fix, with fix gear or trawl gear in the past. Thanks. Court? Yeah, thanks for the question, Maggie. And yeah, um, I can give more detail with the danger of rambling on too long here. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chair, stop me. Okay. If I got to put a, so um, well, and I should have meant that the NIMS comments um, from October two thousand nine nineteen are in are, are in a written report to Sam TAC. Likewise, we had a WDFW had a write up back then that we could also provide, um, and so it, it is documented in some form and could be documented. Um, you know, in, in, in better detail here going forward. But actually the, the, the challenge, um, I think the SAMTAC, a lot of people, uh, so I guess the issue is it's, the issue is that, you know, you do not have to have, you, you do not have to um, fish your own quota is one piece of it. So a quota share owner can give its quota pounds to a completely different ownership group and they'll fish it. So the, the connection that we, we typically have between a, a permit or the vessel and the owner is, um, is more separate than it in the IFQ program. Um, yet we can trace quarter pound movements between quarter share accounts and vessel accounts. And it's pretty straightforward to figure out where a quarter share accounts, quarter pounds ended up in a vessel account. And it's, so if I, if I transferred 
half of my quota to Brad and, and half to Maggie, then it's basically I can um, it's a simple average of of where my quota pounds went. Um, so that part is very simple. The, 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 the part where um, it gets a bit complex is that quota pounds don't don't always use by the vessel that they end up in first. They move around and there's very good reasons for it for it moving around. Um, and it, you know, it might move between three owners before it's being used. So it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit hard of, for people to get their heads wrapped around, but it's, it's how a market works. And, and the math actually, uh, is surprisingly works out pretty cleanly. Um, but you do end up getting some effect from, uh, your partner's partner, someone you might, might not know, um, you you ultimately derive value from your quota from them. I don't. This is probably not making sense, but it, it is that um, transfers among vessel accounts that is has been hard to, for folks to get their head around. But actually, the the bigger hold up on the analysis so far has been understanding the ownership uh, between quota share accounts and vessel accounts, and between vessel accounts, um, council staff Jim has done a lot of work on on uh, the highest level ownership, um, which is a pretty amazing amount of work. But NIMS also collects um, data from, from the industry on who owns what and in terms of percentage. And there's some pretty complex ownership uh, relationships out there where you have to actually end up com you know, comparing you know, umpteen combinations before you can figure out who actually owns what between two accounts. So that's been the actual main challenge since since the quarter pound transfers. Uh, it, it is it is different. It is difficult for people to understand, but that that method is pretty ironed out. Um, it has been it, figuring out the 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 common ownership has been a, another challenge, and that is a, an important piece to be part of the criteria. But in the end, I think we'll see the result of the of the of the math is you can see how much, what proportion of someone's quota pounds was ultimately, you know, derived its value from gear switching versus trawl. And so that's where the quantification comes in. We can figure out, for example, if a particular quota share account might've had 75% of its value derived from gear switching. And you can use that in conjunction with other information to get a quantitative metric. That's at least a little bit helpful and understanding how how folks separate out on on the connection and dependence to gear switching. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, I saw Kelly Abe's hand come up right uh, right when Kelly or uh, when Corey started to give his explanation. Uh, Kelly, do you have something to add? Thank you, Vice Chair. I'm good. Okay. All righty. Further questions for Corey? Seeing none, uh, we'll go to the uh, GMT report. I believe Abigail Harley is going to uh, be given that. Abigail, are you there? Yeah. Can you guys hear me? We, we can. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Or, um, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, I, my name is Abigail Harley, and I'm with the National Marine Fisheries Service reading Agenda item G1A, Supplemental GMT Report 1, uh, the ground fish management team's report on gear switching for sable fish in the trawl catch share fishery. The ground fish management team received a presentation from Dr. Jim Seeger and Ms. Jesse Dorpinghouse of um, the council staff. We reviewed documents and public comments in the briefing book, and uh, the GMT offers the following feedback for consideration. For selecting a range of alternatives, the intricate alternatives developed to date require decisions amongst a profusion of sub options as laid out in attachment two. Projecting the costs and benefits of these alternatives with sub options will be complex and difficult to summarize for decision makers and stakeholders. Given that the alternatives contain multiple elements that could be swapped, combined, or eliminated. The existing alternatives may not offer a sufficient range of the total amount of gear switching possible for the council's consideration relative to the purpose and need developed in September 2020. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel GAP identified this issue in their September 2020 
report, along with a table laying out some of the uncertainty about potential gear switching levels under some of the existing alternatives currently under consideration. The September 2020 analysis discussed a wide range of potential explanations for low attainment, including gear switching. Many of these issues fall outside the Council's direct sphere of control or influence. With multiple factors limiting attainment, the GMT suggests simplifying the alternatives and analysis to consider potential changes in non-whiting groundfish utilization at various levels of gear switching. So the GMT recommends the council select an initial range of alternatives for the overall level of gear switching in the fishery at this meeting. The council would then select a target level of gear switching to inform adoption of the range of proposed alternatives at a subsequent meeting. The discussion of the overall level of gear switching permitted would help assess potential to improve utilization of the trawl sector allocation by restricting restricting gear switching. So for example, alternatives could be 0%, which would be no gear switching, 10% limited gear switching, 33%, uh, which is the 2016 to 2019 average, 50%, which would be an increase over status quo or no action, which means no restrictions on gear switching. The council and stakeholders should consider the potential impacts of different levels of gear switching on overall utilization of the non-widening trial allocation and on coastwide and community level revenues, while keeping in mind the qualitative objectives identified in the purpose and need. These impacts are currently difficult to understand due to the complexity and uncertainty of the alternatives analysis to date. The council may wish to have the economic subcommittee of the SSC review projections of gear switching under the no action and action alternatives. The alternatives in agenda item G1 attachment one offer overlapping levels of gear switching, but vary in the distribution of costs and benefits from the reallocation of unrestricted gear privileges in the short and long term. After the council determines the level of gear switching that seems likely to improve non widening trawl utilization, they can consider the impacts of redistribution of allocations and select the best tools to achieve the desired amount of gear switching. So for comments on uh, some of the SAMTAC proposed alternatives, so the GMT discussed the SAMTAC proposed alternatives uh, that were in agenda item G1 attachment one and offers the following comments, primarily focused on management implications under each alternative and opportunities to streamline the workload of tracking the fishery. For the no action alternative, the GMT suggests analysts further develop a no action baseline alternative that describes how the fishery would be impacted if gear switching is not limited in the IFQ fishery. Future trial utilization will be impacted by many factors, including but not limited to global prices, biomass and resulting harvest levels in Alaska, British Columbia and the West Coast and residual impacts from the pandemic on both supply and demand. The GMT suggests analysts provide either quantitative or qualitative information to support a range of possible scenarios under no action, with assumptions and likelihood of each end of the range supported with historic data when feasible. Such considerations include continued low sable fish prices as observed in 2019 through the present versus a return to high prices of 2016 increased or the 2016 to 2019 average or decreased levels of unrestricted gear switching, increased the 2016 to 2019 average or decreased processor purchases of Dover Sole and other co-occurring stocks, increased 2016 to 2019 average or decreased stable fish annual catch limits, uh, and the observed range of catch ratios for target stocks. The considerable uncertainty around these factors make it difficult to assess likely outcomes of gear switching alternatives. Incorporating assumptions about the future under a no action baseline in the analysis will help decision makers determine whether the causes and potential solutions fall under the council's purview. If so, alternative impacts can be compared to the baseline to identify those most likely to, council, to accomplish the council's objective. The GMT recommends the council direct analyst to provide a description of the no action baseline and identify key assumptions that will serve as the benchmark for comparing action alternatives. For alternative one, trawl quota pound debiting, uh, either 30 or 10% of qualifying quota share account quota pounds will be given unrestricted gear designation. So GMT understands to be any legal ground fish gear. 
attachment one states, northern sablefish caught with trawl gear could be covered with trawl only or unrestricted QP. A vessel using trawl gear that had both trawl only and unrestricted quota pounds in its account would designate which type of quota pound would be used to cover the landing. In other words, the vessel that has both trawl only and unrestricted gear would need to manually indicate from which gear specific quota pound the landing should be deducted. The self-selection form from a specific gear designated quota pound introduces potential user and administrative error, which could lead to misaccounting of quota and necessitate a mechanism to make in-season corrections. Similar to the automatic debiting of stocks by management area and carryover quota pounds within the IFQ fishery, the GMT recommends the council replace self-designation of gear-specific quota pounds under Alternative 1, the provision in which the trawl landings are automatically debited from their trawl-only quota pounds before debiting from unrestricted quota pounds. Automatic debiting would reduce administrative complexity and potential for misreporting and related program costs while limiting the proportions of sablefish quota pound allowed to be harvested with non trawl gear. Given the choice, the groundfish management team assumes most vessels fishing with trawl gear would choose to debit trawl quota pounds first because unrestricted quota pounds could potentially be leased at a higher price per pound later in the year. The uh, team recommends this part of the alternative be changed to northern sablefish caught with trawl gear could be covered with trawl only or unrestricted quota pounds. A vessel using trawl gear that had both trawl only and unrestricted quota pounds in its account would automatically debit trawl only quota pounds first for landings made with trawl gear. The conversion dates, uh, because each element of the alternatives requires analytical time and effort, along with explanation summary for decision makers at the council meeting, the GMT proposes simplifying alternatives to the extent practicable. Conversion data analysis available to date does not indicate there would be appreciable impacts on the availability of trial gear quota or gear switching quota compared to the 2016 to 2019 average level of gear switching. Thus, the GMT recommends eliminating the conversion date sub option if alternative one is included in the ROA. Data shows that uh, gear switching landings are higher later in the year per the um, attachment one in May 2019. If this were to hold true, there may be less utility in converting trawl only quota pounds into unrestricted quota pounds during the year. We don't have any comments on alternative two at this time. For alternative three, the exemptions from the active trawler requirements under alternative three are complicated because they create and rely on a nexus between the vessel, quota share account, and limited entry permits. There may be some ways to simplify the program administratively while still achieving the primary objectives of the proposals. The National Marine Fishery Service provided initial feedback on these alternatives and indicated this alternative would be a high relative implementation and administrative burden and cost relative to alternatives one and two in an April 2020 report. The GMT recommends proposal designers work with council staff and NEMS to find ways in which to simplify alternative three without compromising its intended purpose uh, to attribute and cap gears switching levels for individual vessels based on their historic participation using either trawl um, or a fixed gear to harvest sable fish. For the public comment alternative, the GMT notes that the 10% gear switching limit public comment um, and has incorporated 10% limitation gear switching in our recommendation on consideration of a range of limits at this meeting, which I covered in the first section of this report. Some specifics of this proposal are similar to those in Alternative 3, uh, and if the council elects to include this in a final RA, the GMT will provide more detailed feedback at a later date. And I have a summary of our recommendations there, and I'm very happy to take any questions. Okay. Thank you, Abby. Uh, questions for Abby? Feet ask for feet. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, Ab Abigail, for uh, reading that um, GMT report. I guess my question is on the recommendations, maybe, and how the GMT discussed this. Uh, recommendation one and two, um, I, I look at them as, as pretty independent there, and the rationale for especially the approach recommendation put in recommendation one is clearly stated, but when we get down to three or four, um, where recommendation one does not talk about a range of alternatives, the alternatives 
or reducing uh, gear switching that are in our, all of our analysis. But when you get to three and four, it talks about including those in there. And maybe the, the simplest way, did the, did the GMT discuss um, a, a recommendation of not moving forward with the alternatives at this time and just, I don't know, how do you say it, stepping back and look at the overall level of gear switching first and really not include um, alternatives in there um, rather than leaving it up to the council, as you say, in three and four, um, if they're included, do it this way. But is the preference to just leave those alternatives out at this point and really focus on your recommendation one and two? Sorry if that's confusing, but there was a question there. Abby? Thank you, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hasmer. Uh, I think I follow where you're going. And I actually have to thank um, Lynn Mattis from ODF and W for giving me what I think is a great analogy for the way that the GMT kind of sees moving forward on this, which is analogous to our harvest specifications process where we need to figure out what the a say, say um, an ACL is going to be. And then we can, after we have an agreement on that, we can figure out what management measures we need to use to achieve that level. And so similarly here, I think the GMT is envisioning the council considering uh, a range of potential restrictions on gear switching and the um, subsequent impacts of that range. And then once they kind of agree on a target, we can figure out the management measures that we want to use, which um, would likely include a lot of the um, maybe all of or combinations of some of those SAMTAC uh, alternatives and some, potentially some new public comment um, alternatives that seem that have been coming in or maybe continue to be developed. Our understanding talking to the analysts at this meeting was that um, as if the council elects to proceed with selecting a, a range of limits at this meeting, the analysts could um, still work with uh, proposers for some of those management measure type alternatives um, to continue developing, thinking around those streamlining, simplifying potentially, uh, and consideration of developing some of the impacts around the provisions of those uh, management measures. But um, at the next meeting, the council would need to indicate what level of gear switching it wanted before we could really start delving into the the measures to to implement that that level. Hopefully that answered your question. Thanks very much. That was helpful. Thank you, Pete. Uh, Phil Anderson. Uh, Phil? Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thanks, Abigail. Um, so my question is around uh, um, recommendation number two. Um, and uh, I think I'm understanding uh, recommendation uh, number one, where uh, uh, recommending that the council select a range of of, um, of gear switching al allowances. If you know you, you had some examples in there about three potential different percentages in addition to status quo. And then you move to number two and, and recommending that the analysts provide that description of a no action baseline, um, along with identity, there's going to have to be a number of assumptions made uh, that will serve as that benchmark. And so um, from that, then, is, there, is there a recommendation that they uh, also um, take a look at the existing information? The, there's quite a bit of analysis that's already been done. Maybe it could be uh, rearranged a little bit uh, to focus on um, the possible results of limiting uh, gear switching to that suite of different percentages and to have both of those things in front of us when we then take the next step at a subsequent meeting to select uh, and an overall level of gear switching that we would find uh, acceptable. 
So the question is around, is there additional analysis and or um, uh, uh, display of the existing analysis that would enable us to take a look at how the different ranges compare with uh, the no action baseline? Abby? Thank you for the question, Mr. Anderson. Yes, uh, the GMT's understanding from uh, Dr. Seeger and Ms. Dorbinghouse is that a lot of the analyses um, are either either exist already or could be tweaked and modified slightly, repackaged uh, or supplemented. Uh, the expectation was set that while there is some quantitative information that they may be able to provide to uh, inform uh, analysis along the range that likely a lot uh, in, and largely uh, because of the sweet the, the um, uncertainty in that no action alternative description that we lay out here the consideration of the impacts of those different levels may be largely qualitative but um, the GMT's understanding, and I would look to uh, Dr. Seeger to uh, confirm or, or clarify on this, is that uh, the analyst would be able to provide this type of information um, and that it would require some overwinter work, but because there has been so much developed to date, it wouldn't be a huge lift. Okay. Thank you, Abby. Uh, further questions for the GMT? Okay, thank you, Abby. Um, we'll now move to the uh, GAP report um, and Shims John. Shims? Thanks, Vice Chair Pettinger. Can you hear me? I can. Great. Um, good morning, uh, Vice Chair Pettinger, me members of the Council. For the record, my name is Shems Judd. I'll be reading from agenda item G1A. Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report on Gear Switching for Sablefish in the Trawl Catch Share Fishery. The GAP received an overview of the preliminary analysis of the gear switching alternatives and the key decision points within those alternatives from Dr. Jim Seeger and Ms. Ms. Jessie Dorpinghouse. The GAP offers the following comments. Statement framework. As we noted in our September 2020 statement on this issue, Gear switching and the extent to which it may or may not be affecting trawl attainment has been a challenging one for the GAP. As such, the GAP will again be offering a statement that includes opposing viewpoints in the interest of making, uh, making sure the Council is aware of the full range of perspectives. This agreement to offer divergent viewpoints instead of majority and minority statements was reached by consensus in the GAP. Statement, of, uh, statement in support of no action. Members of the GAP who use fixed gear in the trawl IFQ program do not consider there to be a need for restrictive actions concerning the use of fixed gear in the trawl IFQ fishery at this time. We still believe that no action is the correct action to take, and we believe it is premature to select a range of alternatives. Consider this information from the Council's own analysts. Levels of gear switching over the last several years, uh, 2015 to 2019, have stabilized at around 33% of the available quota pounds, and the number of gear switching vessels and permits has been relatively stable at between 14 and 16 over that same time period. In 2019, X vessel and quota pound prices dipped well below the 2011 to 2018 average, uh, 2018 range. Compared to 2018, the 2019 stable fish allocation increased to its highest level during the catch share program. Uh, Sablefish X vessel price declined to its lowest level, and northern Sablefish quota pound lease price declined to its lowest level. Also of significance is the fact that for 2021, the trawl allocation for Sablefish will increase by about 1.3 million pounds compared to 2020. As of the beginning of November, according to the NIMS IFQ shore based landings information page, only a little more than 50% of the trawl Sablefish quota has been caught. Although there's been a slight uptake in the, uh, uptick in the price for sablefish and more quota may be delivered before the end of the year, there's little reason to believe that trawl permitted vessels using fixed gear are causing a problem for trawl net fishermen to access the huge amount of sablefish remaining on the table. 
Of course, the entire fishing industry, including sablefish landings, have been significantly impacted by the pandemic in 2020. Turning to the range of alternatives, the primary difficulty is that for each of the alternatives, some people, vessels, and or permits who have participated will not qualify to participate in the future or in the alternative, have their participation curtailed, and some in a significant way. Those who have only leased a permit and quota may be entirely excluded. Those who have spent savings and, and or borrowed money to purchase quota may find their investment seriously diminished or even disappear entirely. Those who wish to transfer their privilege to gear switch quota to the next generation of fishermen, even within, within their own family, may be prohibited from doing so. Before identifying a range of alternatives for further analysis, it would be helpful for the council to make certain decisions. Our answers are outlined in caps and bold. Should we keep, uh, one, should we keep the control date? Yes. Two, should significant participation using fixed gear from 2011 to the control date be required? Yes. Should there be a recent participation requirement using, using fixed gear and should those landings also be significant? Yes. Should the ability to gear switch be attached to the vessel or permit? Probably the permit. Should vessels and permits using fixed gear be able to lease stable fish? Yes. Should the council continue to allow a vessel or permit that gear switches to catch up to, owners, uh, to, catch up to ownership limit of 3%? Yes. Should the council continue to allow a vessel or permit using fixed gear to also catch up to the limit of 4.5%? Yes. Should we have a termination date or sunset clause regarding the use of fixed gear? No. Should we allow a vessel or permit uh, owner to transfer the ability to gear switch? Yes. Should there be a cap on the total percentage of fixed gear participation? No. Or if we limit participation, should we wait to see the level of participation? Yes. While we would prefer to see no further action taken at this time, if the council does decide to identify a range of alternatives, we suggest that the council analyze only the following SAMTAC alternatives, status quo, alternative one, and alternative two. To fully identify decision points in the alternatives that we would recommend, we refer you to agenda item G1, attachment one, beginning at page three. Alternative one, we would recommend the following only if an opt-out provision is included. Unless there is an opt-out provision, we do not support alternative one moving forward for further analysis. Please note, we are suge suggesting some changes to alternative one. Gear specific quota pounds, option one, 70% trawl, 30% fixed gear. Conversion option, uh, sorry, conversion option one, July one or August one. Opt out provision, the ability to opt out is allowed to be transferred with ownership change to permit or quota share account. To qualify to opt out, we suggest the council select opt out qualification D, requiring a minimum of 30,000 pounds of fixed gear north landings between January 1, 2011 and September 15, 2017, or between January 1, 2014 and December 31st, 2018. Alternative two, gear switching endorsement and qualification. We recommend the council select the following. To qualify, option two, 30,000 pounds per year in at least three years from January 1, 2011 to September 15, 2017 and landed sable fish with fixed gear in at least one year from 2016 to 2018. Annual endorsement limit. Option two, the standard northern sable fish vessel quota pound limit of 4.5%. Limit for non-endorsed permits. The proposal is for half a percent. This is not supported by members of the GAP who gear switch. This year alone, half a percent equates to a little over 29,000 pounds. If the intent of the council is to limit gear switching, it should be some small amount, such as 2,500 pounds, to account for bycatch that may be taken in other fisheries. Otherwise, the half percent will become a target. For example, latent or active non-endorsed trawl permits could be leased and fishermen could target 29,000 pounds. Gear switching limit overages. Any quota pound a vessel uses for gear switching in excess of its limit will have its following year gear switching limit for its permit reduced by the amount of excess quota pound used. Endorsement expiration and transferability. Option two, gear switching endorsements on permits do not expire and may be transferred to a new owner. Alternatives three and four, 
our opposition to alternatives three and four is strong. Both of these alternatives restrict the use of fixed gear and the trawl I IQ fishery to only 10% of the overall trawl, trawl quota. As mentioned above, the percentage of fixed gear usage has been about 33% in the most recent five-year period. These alternatives would generate a race for fish as of January 1, as a quota share owner would be fearful of waiting and losing any opportunity to catch their quota share later in the year. This would have disastrous safety and fairness implications. Furthermore, both of these alternatives prohibit leasing, which has been a significant part of the fixed gear participation. Fixed gear fishermen trade, buy, and sell quota with bottom trawlers, midwater boats, and processors. Prohibiting leasing will not only affect the fixed gear fishermen, but to date, there hasn't been any economic analysis of the value that leasing brings to the fishery as a whole, and in particular, the quota share owners who lease but may not fish sablefish, or who choose to lease their fish, even if they are bottom trawlers. Alternative three and four either prohibit transferability of the ability to use fixed gear and trawl IQ, or arbitrarily terminate the ability of fishermen to fish their quota with fixed gear. Alternative three is particularly egregious in that while it seeks to limit vessels that have significant history and levels of fixed gear participation of 10% and individual vessels with history of using fixed gear to 0.6% uh, or less, it also invites new participants into gear switching. Active trawlers who have never before used fixed gear are allowed to, to use fixed gear if they have made six trawl landings totally eight, totaling 18,000 pounds in the current or prior year. Those new vessels would each be allowed up to 1% of the quota to land with fixed gear, and the cumulative limit that active trawlers are allowed to land would be 10%. We have new, numerous other objectives, objections to alternatives three and four, not the least of which is the lack of economic analysis done to date on the effects that such severe restrictions would have on the vessels that have fished fixed gear throughout the trawl program. As set forth at pages 35 through 37 of attachment three, agenda item G1, based on the 2020 allocation, the proposed limits under alternative three would result in a severe reduction in the qualifying fixed gear vessels landings and income between 18,000 pounds and almost 200,000 pounds annually. Using an average price of Sablefish North for 2011 through 2018, the decline in associated X vessel revenue would be between 51,000 uh, $51,000 and $553,000 annually. We have no information on the economic impact of alternative four. We would also note that for both alternative three and four, we have little or no information on the community impacts beyond that of a severe decline in ex vessel revenue. We would also bring to your attention the fact that alternative four, aka Pacific's alternative, supported by some other processors, is one that was brought before the SAMTAC in a long list of alternatives to be considered at the meetings in the fall of 2019. The members of the SAMTAC did not recommend moving forward with that alternative. To allow a new alternative, previously rejected by the SAMTAC and never presented to the gap in full, seems to be an end run around the council process. We appreciate the opportunity to comment. We hope you understand that it is difficult to recommend specific aspects of different alternatives that may affect the livelihood of our fellow fishermen. We don't think there's a problem with the use of fixed gear in the trawl IQ program and we suggest that the council still has decisions to make before proceeding with selecting a range of alternatives. And now the statement in support of moving forward with a range of alternatives. In contrast to the statement opposed to moving forward with selection of a range of alternatives, many trawlers and processors believe it is imperative to move forward to select a full and complete range of alternatives or analysis at this time. The statement in support of moving forward from the September gap statement is applicable to the action of this meeting as it highlights the importance of moving forward with a comprehensive range of alternatives, including the proposed alternative number four, also known as the processor proposal uh, or trawl stakeholder number two. Uh, below is the same table we presented in the September gap statement. And it just shows the various alternatives there and the maximum allowed percentage of fixed gear attainment of northern sablefish quota. Uh, moving forward with the range of alternatives that includes proposed alternative four is necessary for the following reasons. One, uh, the current range of alternatives uh, is incomplete and unbalanced. There are three alternatives, including no action as an alternative that allow for an increase of fixed gear attainment, and only one that includes even a limited reduction to 
there is a need for another alternative with a lower attainment level to correct this imbalance and provide for a robust analysis. Without an alternative that meaningfully restricts gear switching, the range of alternatives is inadequate. Number two, importance of fishery improvement led by processor investments. The future of our trawl communities and direction of our fishery will be determined by the business decisions of the major processors of bottom trawl fish to either invest in communities or to continue with the consolidation and decline. That makes processors the primary stakeholder on which the fishery depends for its success. All major processors and the West Coast Seafood Processors Association testified during the September council meeting about the necessity of taking swift action on gear switching and in support of an alternative that would cap gear switching at the 10% level. Testimony from processors during the September meeting and throughout the process gives further context to the importance of certainty of sable fish supply to the trawl fishery in order to facilitate long-term investments and market development. Processors testified in September that large investments are dependent upon uh, secure sable fish landings in the trawl sector, so that, uh, so that in itself necessitates inclusion of the proposed alternative number four to analyze impacts with and without future major investments. Number three, alternative four covers pre-control date vessel uh, owned quota share for vessels that had a minimum level of fixed gear participation. Quota owned before the control date by vessel owners uh, for which those same vessels had minimal pre-control date fixed gear participation represents less than 10% of all sablefish North trawl quota. A 10% cap is more than sufficient to cover that amount. Number four, fishery degradation is more serious than may be understood. After catch shares were implemented, utilization in most communities has imploded in all three coastal states, even as ACLs have exploded. 2008 to 2010 pre-catch share uh, average annual catch of underutilized species was over 40 million pounds. Uh, and then was less than 25 million in 2018. There are communities in all three states that have seen plant decline and or ceasing of bottom trawl processing. Number five, the risk of continued community de degradation may be more serious than understood. The tra trajectory of the bottom trawl fishery under status quo fixed gear attainment is consolidation of major processing into one port, Warrington and Astoria, uh, on the entire West Coast. This trajectory started with major losses in 2011 and has continued through 2020, and processors have warned it could continue further if, if the status quo continues. Three alternatives allow both a continuation and increase in status quo fixed gear attainment, and only one assures a reduction. Number six, potential benefits of meaningful fixed gear reductions may be far more than understood. The benefits of fostering investments in all three states to increase utilization and jobs and communities could be very significant, particularly when contrasted with what negative impacts may happen if investments aren't made and degradation continues. Benefits of investment in bottom trawl extend into other fisheries as it anchors infrastructure and communities, provides for stability and year-round employment, and is a glue of sorts that supports other fisheries. Number seven, urgency in stopping decline and reversing degradation of trawl communities. Our fishery and communities cannot wait for more than a quarter century of the catch share program to see fixed gear attainment reduced in order to have a chance at reversing the last decade of degradation. The 30% fixed gear attainment of sablefish north trawl quota that is uh, the pre-control date status quo, uh, sorry, the 30% fixed gear attainment of sablefish north trawl quota that is the pre-control date status quo requires reduction as soon as possible, which is probably not until the 13th or 14th year of the program, even if the council and NIMS act as quickly as possible. The five-year review is a tool mandated by the Magnuson-Stevens Act to address any unintended consequences of a limited access privilege program in order, in order for the program to meet its goals and objectives. Gear switching is the number one issue needing to be addressed in a meaningful way. Number eight sector integrity. The use of sectors is probably the number one tool used by councils around the country to manage their fisheries. Sectors exist to provide clarity, stability, and consistency in business conditions for fishery participants. Alternative four provides the highest degree of sector integrity. It is logical to include in a range of alternatives, an alternative that uses to a greater degree the number one tool of fishery managers. A few notes on alternative three. 
Uh, one, many of the points above in favor of including alternative four also support alternative three being included in the range of alternatives. Number two, in addition to those points, alternative three is the only alternative that combines a meaningful reduction of fixed gear attainment with a limited provision to allow active trawlers to use fixed gear. And that is important to include in the range of alternatives for analysis. Number three, alternative three is simple in its basic construct. Active trawlers have a 10% fixed gear collective limit and qualifying vessels with pre-control date uh, quota share ownership and a certain participation level have a 10% fixed gear maximum collective limit. Number four, uh, below is a suggested addition in italics, alternative three, to provide increased sector integrity and prevent further unintended consequences. Uh, a vessel must have a current active trawler designation to use fixed gear to land northern sablefish, and this is the, the new portion, or other IFQ species north of the 36th line, unless it has an exemption. Uh, in, in summary, we support moving forward quickly with analysis of a full and complete range of alternatives that has the potential to address the impact of gear switching on the success of the trawl IFQ program. Alternatives three and four should be included in that range to ensure completeness and a sound analysis, as well as an opportunity to fully understand potential impacts and trade-offs. And that concludes our statement. Thank you, Shims. Um, questions for Shims? Phil Anderson. Phil? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, um, Shams, and, and to the GAP for bringing forward your um, your report on this matter, and appreciate the, the way it was done, understanding that there's um, views, opposing views held uh, within the GAP, and, and the manner in which you represented those different views in the report is I think appreciated by, I know by myself and I suspect the rest of the council. I have uh, uh, one question and it has to do with the statement from the um, folks that uh, support uh, maintaining status quo. And uh, I was looking at the list of questions uh, that, that they uh, asked themselves along with the answers. Uh, that is on page two, and I was um, looking at, uh, in particular, the uh, first two questions, should we keep the control date and should significant participation to the control date be required? And then in number three, should there be a recent participation requirement? Answers, obviously, were yes to all three of those questions. And then I go down to alternative one and a recommendation there and uh, for alternative one. Um, and down at the, um, at the end of those recommendations, there's uh, two, um, uh, I don't know if those are, those are not really bullets, but anyway, one is, um, uh, and this has, um, has to do with the opt-out qualification under D. Uh, and it says between uh, January 2011 and September 15th, uh, 2017, or between January 1, 2014 and December 31st, 2018. And I'm trying to reconcile uh, that recommendation with the answer to the questions that were, uh, number one, should the control be control date be retained? The answer to that question was yes. And should there be a recency requirement that question the number three and the answer to that was yes. Uh, this appears to have a, a, a choice uh, between uh, January 1, 11 through September 15, 2017 and then or uh, the 2014 through 2018, and and they that seems to be inconsistent with the questions and the answers to those questions um, uh, that I just referenced. Chips. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, 
Mr. Anderson, it's a good question and, and probably best addressed um, by the proponents of this statement. I, I think what is going on here is that, um, you know, in, in short, um, the fixed gear participants really don't want to see action on this issue at this time. They don't think there is a substantial problem. Um, and if uh, the council decides to move forward, then they have some recommendations about how that should happen. And so I think this first portion of the statement, these questions are really, um, you know, questions that they would like to see the council answer uh, before deciding to move forward. And then the alternative section um, gets into uh, if the council does in fact decide to move forward, how they would like to see that occur. Um, I, I agree there may be some inconsistency there. I don't know if Bob Albers, Alverson or uh, Michelle Longo Eder are on to, to help me here, but that's the best I can do. Um, Mr. Vice Chair. Please go. Um, thanks very much, uh, Shams, for that. I, I do uh, uh, see on the chat line an, an answer to my question uh, from. Uh, from Michelle Etter, and um, um, and if others want to comment on it during the public comment period, that's fine. But uh, but I understand uh, how that discrepancy occurred. So appreciate the the response from Michelle. Okay, um, Marcy, you're go, Marcy. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, thank you, Shims. Um, question on page six of your report under item seven, the urgency in stopping decline and reversing degradation of all communities. Um, statement at the very end of this paragraph indicates that gear switching is the number one issue needing to be addressed in a meaningful way. And I'm hoping you can give me a little more background um, as to that discussion and what what are the other items that need resolution or addressing um, in a meaningful way to reverse the degradation of trawl communities. And the reason I ask that is I'm thinking to um, some other uh, topics that we've had on our agenda over the last year or two. Um, and I'm, I'm just wanting to, to hear um, again that this is the number one issue um, because I'm thinking about discussions surrounding cost recovery uh, and surrounding um, electronic monitoring and video review costs. And I'm, I think I'm struggling to understand what really is the number one priority. So if you can help me um, with a little more background from uh, the conversation that the GAP had on this, uh, that would be great. Shams? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Yuremko. Um, it's it's a good question, and you know, I I do want to say at the outset that you know, obviously there are a number of issues that the council is working diligently on, and, and the GAP has made recommendations on over the years to improve the performance um, of of the IFQ program. You know, I, I think the council has made uh, significant progress through the five year review and through other actions um, on. You know, things like uh, access back to the RCAs, uh, year-round uh, midwater fisheries for, for yellowtail and widow, those kind of things. And so I think, um, you know, many important issues have been addressed. You have identified, I think, a number of the remaining outstanding important ones. I think the proponents of this, this statement um, really feel like gear switching uh, has the most uh, direct and immediate impact on the success of the IFQ uh, program. I don't think that's, you know, obviously we have dueling statements here. I don't think that's a universally held opinion in the gap, but proponents of this statement um, certainly think that to be the case. Uh, and especially I think because it, it, in their view is limiting access to uh, catch of other species which could lead to significantly increased landings, um, thereby by generating increased import, uh, production in, in a variety of ports, maintaining processing capacity, um, that kind of thing, which has direct impacts for the trawl fishery itself, um, but also for other fisheries. 
Um, so we didn't have significant discussion on exactly this point at this meeting. We have discussed it um, at a number of past meetings. Um, I'm not sure if, if Jeff Lackey is on here and wants to add anything additional, but I think it really comes down to um, proponents of this statement feeling like um, the high levels of gear switching are an immediate and direct impact. And if it's not addressed, then some of those other issues uh, like cost cost recovery, um, you know, the, the workable EM system and so on um, will be less meaningful because the fishery itself will just not be functioning as well as it otherwise might. Okay. Further questions for Shims on the gap statement? All right. Seeing none, oh, thank you, Shims. Thank you. Okay. That leads us into uh, public uh, testimony. Um, we've got, I believe, uh, 18, 20 uh, comments. The comment cards are in. Um, there was discussion about maybe limiting uh, time, but uh, we have still fairly early in the day, I guess. Um, I would ask folks to be concise, um, to be not... Uh, don't be du duplicitous uh, in, your, in your, uh, your comments if someone else has uh, basically made the same argument. Maybe just uh, say you'd agree with them and, uh, and just uh, respect the, the council's time here and uh, get the, everybody through here in a timely manner. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to start up here and um, with uh, Tyler, Tyler uh, Loren. Tyler? Tyler, are you there? I see Tyler said he's uh, trying to unmute, um, unmute himself here, so we can get him going. Hi, can you hear me? Um, yes. Yes, I can. Oh, perfect. Okay. Hello. Hello, Chairman and members of the Council. Apologies for the delay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Tyler Lochran, and I am a current graduate student at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, originally hailing from Seattle, Washington. I am here today to recommend that the Council include the proposed Option 1 under Alternative 1, including the opt-out provision within the adopted range of alternatives. I believe that option one under alternative one provides a necessary flexibility to fishers in choosing what gear they use to meet their staple fish quota pounds, while also improving the attainment of other trawl species. Through my work in fisheries research performed in collaboration with local commercial fishermen, I've seen how important investing in the most effective and efficient gear is when operating under quotas. As we've heard and read from previously submitted comments, fishers have invested in fixed gear and are pursuing opportunities to open small businesses and sell their cash directly to the public. Other fishers are choosing to lease their quotas at competitive prices to those who gear switch. While there is a need to ensure optimum yields of trawl species under National Standard 1 of the Magnuson-Stevens Act, placing new restrictions on gear switching will negatively impact those who are seeking to lease their quota and also those seeking to provide high quality fish to their local communities. In defense of continuing gear switching practices, I look to the fifth national standard put forth by the Magnuson-Stevens Act. Conservation and management measures shall, where practicable, consider efficiency in the utilization of fishery resources, except that no, measure, no such measure shall have economic allocation as its sole purpose. Allowing for the economic interests of processing facilities to overshadow the current management practices that allow for fishers to choose the best gear type to fit their needs is not compliant with the, fish not, with the fifth national standard. In closing, I recommend that the council adopt option one under alternative one with the opt-out provision. This alternative will not only allow for fishers to continue using the gear they have invested in, but also requires trawling effort that will help to satisfy the needs of processing facilities. While economic allocation is important and certainly has a role in management decisions, it should not come at the cost of fishers who have invested in gear switching practices and rely on this flexibility to operate. I'd like to thank the Council for their continued dedication to this issue and for the opportunity to comment. I look forward to learning of the Council's decision. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. Questions for Tyler? Okay, seeing none. Um, next up is Allegra Lafer. I believe I hopefully I pronounced that properly, uh, followed by uh, uh, Bob Alverson. Allegra? 
Yes, I'm here. Can you hear yes. me? All right. Thank you so much. Hello, Mr. Chairman and Council Members. My name is Allegra LaFerre, and I come today to share my thoughts on the sable fish gear switching issue. I have varied experiences in the fisheries space, including being a current master's student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, but also have experience as a ground fish observer on the East Coast, and my father owned a seafood restaurant in Los Angeles for 43 years. So I truly see the complexity of this issue from all sides. Specifically, I endorse Alternative 1 with an opt-out provision for a number of reasons. Firstly, as a former fisheries observer, I recognize how difficult and costly it can be for fishermen to invest in a new fishery to convert their, or a new uh, fishing gear and, and convert their vessels. Switching gear is a considerable effort, and I don't want to slight those fishermen that have decided to make the switch. Under alternative one, fishermen with a history of gear switching can opt out and receive quota pounds as unrestricted, and this protects fishermen who have already made a sizable investment. Secondly, as someone who previously worked in the seafood business, I recognize that my times fish coming from fixed gear is higher quality and therefore commands a higher price. Many consumers nowadays, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, have a renewed interest in investing locally in seafood and knowing their producers. In my research for this public comment, I found instances where fishermen had decided to do just that, sell a high quality fish directly from their boat to the consumer and bypass the processor. I believe that there's a market for this type of fishermen and want to ensure that fishermen who've decided to take this route may continue. However, I do understand the limitations on trawlers. I've seen it myself. Fishermen don't have control over what comes up in their nets. And I can understand how fishermen may think that sable fish is the choke species of sort and doesn't allow them to fully fish to the extent that they want if their efforts are being constrained by a sable fish quota. This inevitably extends to the processors as well that require a near constant stream of fish to keep their plants operational. However, I believe alternative one allows trawlers sufficient leeway to continue to fish at a reasonable level while also maintaining a space for those fishermen that wish to gear switch. For these reasons, I believe that alternative one with an opt-out provision should remain an alternative. Thank you for your time and consideration. Yeah, uh, thank you, Allegra. Questions for Allegra? Okay, seeing none. Um, Bob Alverson, but I don't see Bob um, on the attendee list. Um, if he's not there, we'll go to uh, Mark Cooper, uh, followed by Kevin Dunn. So, uh, so Mark? Can you hear me now, Brad? I, I can, please. So, you got me by surprise here. Anyway, <laughs> Vice Chairman, Council Members, my name is Mark Cooper. My family owns and operates street trawlers that have quota share accounts. I'm going to start to out by saying that allowing fixed gear fishermen to participate in a trawl program has been a big mistake. The council has been studying the program for many years and I believe that we do not have an alternative that fixes the problem. The problem in my mind is that fixed gear has no associated catch with uh, northern sable fish. Since the IFQ program started, fixed gear has caught about 30% of the northern sablefish, and in 2018 and 19, it has risen to 33%. None of the alternatives that the council is looking at now lower that percentage below 20%. And several of the proposals allow growth. One of the things that has bothered me since the discussion has started is that the decline in filet lines. As a trawler, it is scary to look at how little infrastructure there is on the West Coast to process and sell non-whiting trawl fish. That stated, northern sablefish has been harvested on an average at 93% since the beginning of the IFQ program. The one exception is the year 2020 that has been severely impacted by the COVID virus. I believe it would be a mistake to use any information from 2020 to make long-term decisions. The processors are asking to add another option to the list that the SAMTAC committee has provided. I would support that option. 
I believe that the option is limited fixed gear to a level that helps non whiting trawlers. I'm going to restrain myself from trying to answer every mistruth that the fixed gear proponents have put up for arguments. Thank you. I'd answer any questions. Thank you, Mark. Uh, questions for Mark? Okay, seeing none. Thanks, Mark. Uh, next up is uh, Kevin Dunn, uh, followed uh, by Michelle Longo Etter. Kevin? Good morning. Can you hear me? Um, yep. My name is Kevin Dunn. I operate the fishing vessel Iron Lady out of Warrington, Oregon. I sit on the gap and I've been involved in the CAB and SAMTAC. I am really just trying to add that I don't want more rules. I'm one of a few 12 month a year trawlers. When we started the program in 2011, our processors told us we need you year round or we'll lose our infrastructure. We have managed, a select few of us have managed to stay trawling 12 months a year, and we're now in year nine. Not always easy, and unfortunately, our opportunity comes when a lot of the other fleet is crabbing or shrimping or pursuing other endeavors. I just don't want more rules. If I want to switch, if I want to trade my gear or excuse me, trade my quota to a gear switcher to acquire something else, I would like to be able to do that. There are approximately eight year-round trawlers that fish out of Astoria, six of them privately, two of them owned by Pacific. I've heard more times than I care to remember that we'd get more Dover out of the water if we had more sable fish. It's not the case for me. I won't say it's not the case for somebody else. Further south, different fishing plan. But for me, it's not the case. What's prohibiting me from getting more Dover out of the water is price. I want the most money for my fish that I can get. <clears throat> One other thing, recently, I delivered approximately 21,000 pounds of sable fish on a trawl trip because I need to use it or I'm going to lose it. It was valued at roughly $8,000. Five years ago, I delivered 21,000 pounds of sable fish. It was worth $63,000. I know things ebb and flow. The fisher we are in today is not the fisher we were in in 2000. 1990. This fishery evolves, maybe not yearly, but relatively quickly. Five years ago, we started down the road that gear switching was the number one problem. Five years later, I'm not sure that that's the deal. I have nothing else to add. I would be happy to answer any questions. And these views are my views only. They're not based on the fleet, they're based on me the boat and our fishing plan. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Questions for Kevin? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Kevin. Um, next up is Michelle Longo Enter, followed by uh, Tim Hobbs. Michelle? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the council. Uh, my name is Michelle Longo Etter, and with my husband Bob on the fishing vessel Timmy Boy out of Newport. Bob has fished for sable fish with pots for 40 plus years. Um, we own trawl quota and use it with fixed gear and also participate in the tier fishery. I would um, start my comments um, by saying that I agree with the first um, section of the GAP report that recommends either um, no action um, and other comments um, relating to the fixed gear perspective on uh, gear switching in the trawl fishery. And I won't report, I won't repeat all of those 
um, comments and points that I've made um, just to emphasize them. What I do want to do is switch um, to the GMT report and identify how important it is that, like the GAP report, uh, GMT highlights the fact that perhaps the council is not ready to proceed with a range of alternatives at this time until some certain threshold decisions are made. And I would say that in addition to identifying percentages of um, gear switching um, that the council may wish to allow that there are other fundamental um, decisions that the council could look at at this time, um, whether it relates to continuing to lease, whether it relates to um, not having any false sunset provisions, whether or not um, we should be able to transfer um, quota. And so I think that if the council were to look at that list as set forth in the gap report of threshold questions before moving forward, I think that would be helpful. I also really want to emphasize page two of the GMT report that highlights the need to first analyze um, the economics of what the baseline of no action is. That really hasn't been done. Um, and I think that it's important to understand the current community impacts on a change in gear switching. Uh, I mentioned this morning in the Oregon meeting, I, I hear a lot about the degradation of the, of the trawl um, infrastructure um, for the, the infrastructure for the trawl industry. But I, I think the, uh, what's important to know that at Pacific alone in Newport, there were between one and two million pounds of sable fish that came across the dock this fall, some of which was tear fish, but I believe most of which was in the um, uh, trawl fishery using fixed gear. There were at least 15 people cutting fish on the floor there. There hasn't been an analysis of this kind of impact um, on communities and what that means in terms of jobs, employment, and, and more than just ex vessel value. I still want the council to consider the fact that trawl utilization of other species is affected by many factors not related to the use of fixed gear. Um, looking forward, there is going to be this huge increase in the allocation of trawl sable fish, 1.3 million pounds in 2021. Um, without fixed gear, frankly, um, that fish could be being left on the table, and that's contrary to what the national standards are relative to Magnuson. Finally, I want to identify, um, rather than addressing specific alternatives more than have already been addressed in the GAP statement, I want to highlight why alternative three is problematic. It's not just a 10% limit, but a 0.6% on any individual vessel, which for some vessels reduces the ability to fish by what they own by over 100%. It also proposes to create a new class of fixed gear fishermen um, by allowing active trawlers who have never trawled uh, potentially um, participated with fixed gear before to begin to do so and up to a limit of 10%. So it takes from some, gives to others. And it also creates a huge loss of income for those who have participated in fixed gear um, throughout the time of the trawl program. I have to say, alternative four, frankly, um, uh, it's a much simpler, cleaner um, option uh, relative to three, and I would suggest the council remove alternative three for further consideration. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Michelle. Questions for Michelle? Okay, uh, seeing none. Uh, next up is uh, Tim Hobbs. Uh, followed by uh, John Corbin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, can you all hear me? Uh, yes, Tim, we got you. Great, thank you. I'm uh, Tim Hobbs with the law firm of KNL Gates um, in Seattle. Yeah. And uh, there's a sorry, go ahead. There's something in the background uh, when you, uh, like right there, I don't know what that is, but there's a kind of a tapping or something else which is kind of obscuring. Is that better? Doing it again. I'm not sure what that is. You hear a noise in the background, is that right? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. I'm not sure what 
that is, but it's, it's pretty uh, disconcerting, I think, to, for your testimony. Um, okay, let me, um, I'll, I'll try to log in a, a different way. Do you want to come back to me? Yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's go to um, uh, John Corbin, if he's uh, handy, and we'll uh, try you right after it with him. How does that sound? Okay, okay. Uh, John, are you there? I don't mean either. I would have guessed maybe a hundred. Hello. Hey, John. Yo, can you hear me now? I got you. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Vice Chair and uh, members of the council. For the record, my name is John Corbin. I represent the vessels Buck and Ann, the Northern Endurance, the Southeast, and the associated owners. Today, I'd like to help you get to know me a little bit better. I want to give you a glimpse into me, my company, my partners, and what we do. Most all of you know who I am. I've been coming to the Pacific Council since 2011 and have talked to most of you over the years. I've served on the gap as an alternate a handful of times. My partners and I didn't just buy into the West Coast Brown Fish Program and go fishing. I tried to be informed and actively participate in the process wherever I can. I've been in my present business partnership since 1989. We started with the Buck and Ann, a 56 foot combination boat that we fished on the West Coast in Alaska. The boat had an extensive history as a trawler in Alaska, but we converted her to mainly fixed gear in Alaska and here off the West Coast. I have a long history of being in the wheelhouse of that vessel, mainly in the Dungeness crab fishery off Oregon and Washington. We built the Northern Endurance in 2006 as a fixed gear boat for Alaska. In 2010, we bought the Southeast, which we plan to use for West Coast fixed gear and shrimp trawling. We're also building a new boat that will fish odd in Alaska. We've been watching the West Coast trawl program from the time it was approved by the council in November, 2008. We were approached by numerous trawlers that were ready to retire and hang it up. They were, used, they were used to the way it was and didn't want to move into the IFQ system. We spent three and a half million dollars and bought four trawl permits and their related fishing history. Half of that was for Southern Sable, south of 36. Our plan was to use our two West Coast boats to fish Black Hud with fixed gear. We were all in. In 2011, we fished the Buck and Ann of Southeast out of the Columbia River and Morro Bay. We, watched, we caught vessel caps of sable fish both in the north and south. We fished all of our own quota and leased a little extra. The fishing was good, the market was good, and we grossed two and a half million dollars that year. We worked with as many people as we could to add value to the economics in the ports where we delivered. These numbers are very proprietary and I wouldn't normally use them, but I feel they're relevant in today's discussion. Southern Sable was more challenging than the North. Lack of infrastructure and markets, as well as a local small boat, small boat fleet that didn't want us there, made the situation difficult. We worked diligently and brought several processors down to see if they would be interested in investing in the area, not only for us, but for all. We did get some interest, but all eventually stopped buying or declined. Morro Bay had too many difficulties involved. They wanted the fish from there, but with the exception of Santa Monica Seafoods, they just didn't want to commit the resources to the area. We eventually stopped fishing there in 2017, mainly due to a lack of shoreside support. To the California delegation, my company is all in on being an active and positive part of trying to solve the issues down there and reviving that once thriving industry. I would welcome the conversation. We stopped leasing quota from others several years ago. Processors were driving the lease rates too high and there just wasn't a return on investment. Processors figured out they could recoup a higher lease rate by taking the product all the way to market. They outbid most fishermen and took control of the leased fish market. Today we use one of our boats to catch our own northern sable fish. Last year we grossed $150,000 in this fishery. Looks to be even less this year. Our business went from a full-time job grossing two and a half million dollars to a part-time gig in 2019 grossing 150,000. I tell you this because I want you to see what the fishery is becoming from my perspective. Not many dove into this with as much gusto as we did. I've watched many, many boats try it out and then bail out. I've heard all the testimony about how all the Alaska boats 
would be coming down here to take over the trawl fishery with fixed gear. I'm here to tell you again, that isn't gonna happen. <clears throat> the participation has flatlined then, flat, flatlined over the last several years for a reason. Overregulation, severely limited markets and infrastructure are pushing boats away, offer no enticement to new participation. We need more value generated in this fishery, not less. You'll find out that more and more sable fish will not produce more dollars in other species. If that were so, trawlers wouldn't be looking to lease out so much sable fish. Fixed gear fishermen are not trying to take over this fishery. We are simply looking to glean the harvest that is left behind and add value to this crop. In closing, I'd like to refer to the SAMTAC Principle C. We want to consider impacts on existing operations and investments. I've already told you about mine. I fully support the GAP report in support of no action. Thank you. Thank you, John. Questions for John? Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, Marcy, you're on call. Marcy? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, John, for your testimony and uh, for your shout out to the California delegation. And um, I'll be in touch. I'd, I'd like to learn more about the history um, and your experiences here um, and um, the mixed successes that you had. Um, you said at the uh, conclusion of your statement that you support no action um, as you don't see that any of these um, alternatives are viable to um, build, rebuild, or, or improve um, the overall performance of the IQ fishery. Um, I'm, and then you also described um, in kind of very simplistic, but uh, terms that I can certainly understand that you're not looking to take over um, or replace the trawl activity that's there. You're just working to kind of pick up the leftovers and improve the overall value. Um, however, you did suggest um, a no action alternative here, but I'm wondering, do you have other ideas for us? on how we improve the overall value of the fishery? Is there some other uh, way to get at this issue that you think hasn't been explored uh, in these discussions? John? Um, thank you, Mr. Ramko and Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I, I just think that uh, going down the road of some of these restrictions, we're going to remove value. Um, I've referred many times that the uh, the fixed gear fleet is kind of the overflow valve for the trawl fishery. And what I mean by that is that fixed gear owns about 10% of the quota, but we're catching, you know, 30 to 33%. Um, and that's because the trawlers are leasing it to us in the present program that we have. And it's because they can't catch it. I. Over the years, I've leased a lot of that fish. Um, I, I haven't in the last few years, but uh, I've, I've just, um, we've, we're taking the overflow, I guess is the, is the best way to put it, that, that if, if those guys need the fish to go catch more Dover, to do this and that, then they'll keep it for themselves. Um, I can't see any trawler that given the opportunity, uh, I think as Kevin Dunn just said, you know, the, the price isn't there, the market isn't there. Um, if, if it does come back someday, then those trawlers will hang on to that fish instead of giving it to us. And so I just don't see a problem with the program right now. I see that if we get down to where, well, we're only gonna allow 10% or something like that, that we're gonna leave a ton of value sitting in the water year after year. Okay, um, Krista Swenson, Krista? Yes, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, and, and thank you for your testimony, John. I have a question uh, surrounding participation. And I know it's been mentioned um, <coughs> in Jesse's and, and Jim's report, but also in your testimony that participation is stabilized. Um, you made the assumption that it is based upon the, the costs um, and, and 
um, kind of rules and regulations that are in place being onerous compared to the state of Alaska. Um, and I'm just wondering, do you think that some of that also has to do with the uncertainty surrounding the decision we're making in terms of gear switching? Um, and that if that uncertainty goes away, that we, um, depending on the direction we went, could see more participation? Or do you think that it really has leveled out based upon costs, et cetera, in our current program as it stands? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and and, um, and Ms. Swenson. Um, I do, uh, I do know, I mean, the uncertainty, of course, is always, is always an issue, but um, there isn't the interest in this fishery. I, I, we have our boats fish up in Alaska as well at times. Uh, we have one boat that fishes there, you know, that's all he does is fishes up there. Um, they're in touch with those guys all the time. They have no interest in coming down here. The costs associated with this program are so high 100% observer and uh, the buyback fees and everything, plus smaller fish down here and lower prices, um, they've got no interest in coming down here. Th this, this doesn't interest them at all. It, it's hard enough just with the, the lower prices that we're getting up there this year um, in Alaska that the, the, uh, the boats aren't going to catch all of the quota up there this year. Um, they just, they just don't have any interest. I talked to so many of them and they just say, you can, you can keep that fishery down there. We don't, we don't want to come. Now I'm, I can't say that there won't be somebody that wants, doesn't want to come, you know, or whatever, but, um, but the overall, um, idea is that they don't want to come here. Okay. Further questions for John, uh, Louis M. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and uh, good to hear your testimony, John. You've always been very, very helpful informing me on a subject that I'm definitely a tyro on. What do you see as a future of sable fish now? In the past, of course, it was a boutique uh, fish that would go to Japan and perhaps a few markets. Do you see a future with sable fish actually becoming a, a fish that can supply protein to the United States? Uh, and change in value in that way, or do you uh, just foresee a return to what we had before? Hey, John. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Hi, Louie. <laughs> it's good to hear you. I wish I could see you here. I wish we were at a meeting together. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I see it growing in, in uh, popularity. I mean, it's, it is, uh, you know, such high in omega-3s and, and uh, um, you know, the health benefits of that. Um, uh, definitely the Asian market is, uh, is big. Our, our processor uh, that we use uh, has broken into markets in uh, um, Russia and uh, Ukraine and all over the world. But there are some uh, doors opening up in the United States for this, you know, great product. Um, I think the health benefits of it from the omega-3 side are really people are becoming more health conscious in the United States. With that being said, COVID is taking its toll um, because 80% of most seafood gets consumed in restaurants. And, um, you know, we finally got restaurants back opened up and we started rolling out product again. And, and uh, here we go again, uh, starting to close things down and, and that's not good for any any uh, seafood product, really. So, <clears throat> although I understand whiting, I think has done pretty well through that. But, uh, but anyway, um, I, I do see more benefits. I see it as being a, a good fishery, a beneficial fishery. Uh, even as we've gotten into new year classes and smaller fish, the market has adapted, and so um, I, I think it's still got a bright future. Thank you very much, John. That's that's very interesting and hopeful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, any further questions for John? Um, I, I have one, actually, John. Um, you're saying that uh, trawlers aren't using the sable fish, and so why would they? Uh, so they're leasing it to the fixed gear folks. 
Um, when you say trawlers, are those trawl quota owners? Are those trawlers that are participating in the DTS fishery? Are those midwater trawlers? Just um, with a 1% of uh, the quota is about 60,000 pounds to a trawler. Uh, I believe this year we're close to that. Um, are, is an active trawler that actually fishing the DTS fishery actually leasing you the pounds that he's not catching? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Well, it's all of the above that, that is leasing quota out. Um, certainly, um, some of the midwater fleet and some of the uh, people that just own quota. But uh, and I, I really don't want to get into naming names. Um, but the uh, there are several active shoreside ground fish trawlers that have more fish than than they will use. And uh, I've traded with them, you know, for for say petroli uh, or certain rockfish or whatever, um, and also just outright leased from them in the past. Um, so it's a combination of everybody, uh, but definitely, um, you know, there are some there are some shoreside trawlers that didn't get that much sable fish that are actively looking for more, but. Um, most of them, uh, you know, that have more quota than they need are, are figuring out their fishing plan and getting rid of the excess. Okay. okay thanks, John. Further questions? Okay. We'll be next, move next to um, uh, Tim Hobbs. Or, or, Tim, are you there on board? Um, uh, followed by uh, Bill Blue. Uh, yes. Can you hear me, Mr. Vice Chair? Yes, much better, Tim. Please. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm Tim Hobbs with the law firm of KNL Gates, I'm based in Seattle. Uh, I represent Jeff Lackey and Jim Sievers, uh, who are part of the trawl industry and are urging the council to move forward with adopting a range of alternatives to address gear switching in the trawl fishery. The fishery is in need of management action. ACLs for many stocks are rising but we're stranding millions of pounds of fish that could be sustainably harvested every year. These are public resources that provide healthy food to the nation, provide jobs, and support coastal communities along the coast. It's for these reasons that in the Magnuson-Stevens Act, Congress required in National Standard 1 that FMPs contain measures to achieve optimum yield over the long term. The ground fish fishery is not meeting that standard, and so action is required. The record developed to date indicates that gear switching is contributing to underattainment, and the council is empowered to address it. To begin with, the northern sablefish allocation is fully utilized, yet over 30% of that allocation is being taken by fixed gear that targets a single species. There is no dispute that shifting the usage of that allocation to trawl gear and away from fixed gear would increase overall attainment because each pound of sablefish caught with trawl gear also produces several pounds of other species. There may be some uncertainty around the extent to which reducing gear switching would produce an increase in overall attainment in the trawl sector. But the reality is that as long as gear switchers are utilizing a large portion of a constraining species, the trawl sector will never be able to maximize attainment. It's rational for the council to conclude that restricting the use of fixed gear and providing trawlers the opportunity to utilize that allocation will lead to an increase in attainment. The other major issue here is the need for certainty to facilitate investments in shoreside infrastructure and market development that could also increase attainment. Right now, there's no limit on the amount of northern sablefish allocation that can be taken by fixed gear. And as the council has heard from numerous processor representatives and other stakeholders, this creates uncertainty about the extent to which quota for a constraining species will be available to get other co-occurring species out of the water. That uncertainty discourages investments in this fishery. Taking action to constrain gear switching will reduce that uncertainty and thus help promote investments in processing and market development 
that could also lead to increases in attainment. Numerous processors have testified as much, and their testimony is supported by academic literature, um, as reflected in, um, in the SAMTAC report. And the council is entitled to act upon that information. I would also like to address the range of alternatives. Some of them have been developed to a point now that they are extremely complex with a number of sub options. Uh, as, as a threshold matter, there's, there seems to be a mismatch between the problem that the council has identified, and that is the extent to which gear switching is impeding trawl sector attainment, and the first two action alternatives. Those alternatives would not limit gear switching. In fact, they would entrench gear switching within the trawl fishery and possibly even expand it beyond current levels. It's unclear how those alternatives would help achieve optimum yield or achieve a goal of the FMP to provide for full utilization of the trawl sector allocation. It's also unclear how those alternatives would provide the needed certainty to encourage investments in shoreside infrastructure and market development. It seems that alternatives one and two would actually do the opposite and would codify a permanent constraint on trawl sector attainment. Phasing out or limiting gear switching would likely achieve these FMP goals and objectives better than alternatives one and two, and so should be included for analysis in the document. Um, and here, I think that the concept advanced by the GMT which is to look at the level of gear switching best suited to improve non-whiting trawl utilization could be a good one. It could be helpful for the council to analyze the problem from that standpoint. Under this approach, the council would look at a range of gear switching from zero to 50% and assess the potential for increasing trawl sector attainment under those alternatives. We agree that the council should assess a larger range of alternatives and think that the GMT's uh, approach could be a useful framework uh, for, for analysis. Hey, Tim, Thank uh, you very much. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Uh, question for Tim. Okay. Seeing none, uh, mission, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Phil Anderson. Phil? Oh, uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, and thanks, Mr. Hodge, for your testimony. Um, there were a couple things that you said that I just wanted to uh, ask about. Uh, and I may, I may have misunderstood, so I apologize if that's the case. I, I understood you to say that there's no dispute that by reducing the amount of stable taken with fixed gear, that it would increase attainment of other species. And um, given the, the testimony uh, that we've, we've heard over time, not just today, and uh, the report that we heard from the GAP, I'm wondering how you conclude that there isn't any dispute about that relationship. Sure, yes, thank you for, for the question. What I said was that there's no dispute that if we could, if we could shift the usage of the allocation, from fixed gear to trawl gear, that that would produce an increase in attainment because each pound of sable fish taken with trawl gear and not fixed gear would include, um, you know, at least as the SAMTAC report identified, five to six pounds of, um, of dover and thorny heads. Uh, and I think that, you know, we've heard testimony that the number could be higher as well. So I think that's that was my point that if if there is is a way to to generate that shift in usage of the allocation, then we would see increases in attainment. I think there is, as I acknowledge, some uncertainty about the extent to which that we can we can generate that shift. Uh, but I think that the you know the the that the the mere fact that you know unlimited gear switching is occurring is is operating as a constraint. Um, but yeah, th I, my point was that, you know, shifting the usage of the allocation would, would generate an increase in attainment. Cool. Thanks very much. Okay. okay. Other questions of Tim? Okay. Uh, seeing that, thanks Tim. Uh, my call on Bill Blue, but, uh, I don't see him being an attendee. 
So that would bring up uh, Jeff Lackey, um, followed by uh, Mike Rutherford. Jeff? Yes, hello. Uh, thank you for your time, council members. I have six areas I would like to address, and we'll see how many I get through. Uh, the first is gear switching was identified as the number one issue coming out of the five-year review as previously discussed in council meetings. I would also point to processor September testimony and communications listing gear switching as a pivotal issue affecting future investments and prospects of the fishery. Also, sable is arguably the most important bottom trawl species, and a third of it leaving the trawl fishery is devastating to capacity. If gear switching is not the number one issue, you may not want to hear what the other candidate is for the top spot. It is the whole non whiting portion of the Catch Years program itself. We have the best stock health we have had in many decades, but the bottom trawl fishery and associated communities are in the worst condition they have been in many, many decades. The cost and constraints of the program combined with the gear switching provision has been too heavy of a weight for the industry to overcome. There is very little that can be done with the cost and constraints of the program, and that leaves gear switching to address and have a chance to make the whole program work. If gear switching is not meaningfully addressed, the logical next step is to look at the existence of the non whiting portion of the program itself. I would prefer to make the program work. We may hear more about ending the program if we can't make the program work. There has already been talk among stakeholders. I don't know how much time our communities outside of the river have left to try to make something work. The second issue, I would like to refer to my submitted written public comment under this agenda item that addresses section three of attachment three, pages 41 through 47, on estimating total gear switching expected. The two overarching points of the comment are one, there are points listed in the comment that provide better overall context if this moves forward. And two, this exercise is of little to no utility because the bottom line number that matters as far as impacts to the fishery is the resulting maximum fixed gear attainment cap. The third item is relative to the GMT report and the proposal to first select a target level of gear switch and likely to improve non whiting trawl utilization and then select the tools to best achieve that level is a good one. It is a shame that this was not the process four or five years ago, and it would be unfortunate to delay yet another meeting, but there is merit in the steps of the process being proposed. The fourth item, future analysis could benefit from additional focus directly on trawl communities. Five good themes for analysis would be items four through eight on page six of the GAP report. Using qualitative as well as quantitative analysis would be helpful on each item because nothing in the future can be quantified with exact precision and accuracy. Fifth item, relative to the second half of the GAP report, I would refer you to pages five and six for the three points that get to the crux of the matter, and those points are numbers two, five, and six, and speak to why a meaningful immediate reduced fixed gear cap is essential to include in the ROA. Relative to point two, the direction of utilization, the bottom trawl fishery, and associated communities is absolutely dependent upon business decisions of the major bottom trawl processors. It is clear from their testimony in September that gear switching is directly tied to their decisions on either consolidation or investments in the expansion. Relative to point five, there is significant risk of continued degradation of the bottom trawl dependent infrastructure in communities. We heard this in testimony in September. There is a fragility to communities outside of the river, that is Warrington and Astoria, where much of the downsized processing has been consolidated. We have seen what happens when trawling goes away and past in areas of California. They are near impossible to get back and contribute to the overall degradation of port infrastructure. We are looking at the prospect of more community loss in the future. Relative to point six, the potential benefits of a reduced fixed gear cap could be extremely large and include salvaging and growing the fishery and infrastructure in ports outside of the river, like Eureka, and potentially establishing meaningful bottom trawl processing historical trawl ports, like Newport and Westport, where processors with existing infrastructure in those ports don't see the status quo fixed gear attainment as conducive business conditions for large investments and long-term commitment to market development. Sixth issue, 
The June industry letter advocated for this critical issue of gear switching to be addressed and a reduction of fixed gear attainment was needed to reverse fishery degradation. Signers consisted of 100% of major bottom trawl processors and 70% of the 50 major active bottom trawlers. The majority of the bottom trawl stakeholders are clear on this issue. The stakeholders that want to participate in the rebuilding of the bottom trawl fishery, participating in DTS-led utilization increases, and strengthening trawl communities outside of the last bottom trawl stronghold in the river, overwhelmingly recognize the plot of the West Coast, the Catch Airs program, the fishery, and seeing addressing gear switching as an essential part of turning things around. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Questions for Jeff? Okay, seeing none. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, next up is uh, Mike Rutherford, followed by uh, Paul Quila. Mike? Mike, are you there? I think you're muted on your end. Yeah, Mike, you're not coming through. Oh, there you go. Try now. Still not getting yet. Okay. I guess we're having a problem getting Mike on board there. Um, let's let's move to uh, Paul Quila if Paul's ready, and then we'll come back to Mike. Uh, Paul, are you there? I see you're muted on your end. Can you hear me now? Uh, I can. Okay. I uh, don't see the full mute. Oh, or unmute. Okay, this will work, I think. Uh, so good morning, Chair, Council, and staff. Uh, my name is Paul Quila. I'm a year-round trawler from Warrington, Oregon. And I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I'm going to do it anyway. So the way I feel is I have already been doing my part to harvest under uh, unattained species, and I still do it to this day. I fish year-round flatfish. I did it before IQ. I've done it every year since the IFQ, except for the months that I've been in the shipyard, and I will continue to do it this month, next month, and next year. So, I mean, I put my money where my mouth was. So I've spent both with time fishing and the money that I've spent, I've invested it in this, both in quota and whatever just so I could continue fishing in this. So, no, I do not want increased restrictions on my quota share or quota pounds. I believe I deserve an exemption to whatever you guys decide because I'm already doing what it takes for myself to deliver this fish consistently. As far as the GMT suggestion, you know, about deciding appropriate level of gear switching and trying to predict it, um, and trying to predict how much and decide how much gear switching is good. Um, do I want the government doing that instead of the fishermen doing that? Um, no, we went to the ITQ because the fishermen, we wanted control of our own quota, not the government. So do I want to turn control of that back over to them, the quota that I've bought and am buying and continue to pay for? For the government to decide what to do, I mean, the answer is no, I don't. Um, this kind of change, I believe, goes to the heart of the program, and it needs to be looked at throughout the whole program if it gets looked at. Um, across the board of the whole ITQ fishery, not just cherry-picking sable out of it, because these situations are prevalent with other species also. So... As far as opt-outs, I feel I have far better rationale for an opt-out for myself and others like me than uh, anybody else that gets an opt-out. Um, so that's what I'm expecting to get somehow in there is an opt-out for, for me and people like me that are in this fishery, in the non-whiting non year-round trawl fishery. Um, nobody can predict year to year or month to month the level of gear switching that is, quote, appropriate. Uh, my trawling and fishing comes first. 
leasing or trading Sable to anyone comes second to me. And there's no predicting of, of what that's going to be or how much that's going to need to be. Every year is different. Um, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Uh, questions uh, for Paul? And I see uh, Phil Anderson. Phil? Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Paul, for your, for your testimony. Um, I just, I, I'm, I'm really not asking you an answer that I am certain that I know the answer to. So, uh, but you are, you, you participate as a year round um, bottom trawl vessel. That, that's correct, isn't it? Yes, it is. And, and, and you value within you know your business plan the ability to freely uh, trade the quota uh, quota pounds quota shares that are quota pounds that you own on a annual basis to make your operation work and make it the most economically viable uh chair uh yes i do and so uh just want to be absolutely clear so your your perspective is i want to maintain i want to be able to maintain whatever you guys do i want to maintain that flexibility because i'm you know it's i'm making this work uh it's important for me to have that flexibility to maximize the economic benefits of my investments and my vessel and the you know everything that encompasses your your business plan uh Chair uh, and and council member, uh, yeah, yes. <laughs> okay, thanks. Appreciate your your testimony. Yeah, and I guess if you if you want me to explain how it works, basically, is you know, if I think I can prosecute my fish, I lease fish at the beginning of the year, lots of different types, whole packages from people, um, then I. I sometimes trade uh, Sable for Petroli if I can, if people are willing to do that, whatever. Um, I hold on to as much as I think I'm going to need throughout the year and use it throughout the year. And then at the end of the year, I like absolutely like the ability to lease that fish out to anybody that can that can pay me for it or so i get basically reimbursed for the money that i fronted at the beginning of the year and as far as the fish that i quote own that i'm buying or whatever if you take one thing one species that happens to have value and you devalue it then it it ruins my trading stock to get petroleum and other other fish from other people and so you know black cod isn't the only thing where there's a high lease rate on petroleum is too and uh, that's why this hurts me. So anyway, thank you. Appreciate the expansion on your response. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, Paul. Um, also, we have uh, Corey Niles. Corey? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. And thanks, Paul, for the testimony. Um, I think you got to one of my questions there about what other species you might be seeing similar things happen with Petroli being one. but. I guess maybe if, um, on your statement about the number you dialed is temporarily unavailable. Was that was that me? I don't I don't know if anyone heard that that. Uh, we did, but continue. <laughs> I don't know what that was, but the uh, Paul. So you mentioned uh, the difficulty in figuring out what the right level of gear switching might be in a year, and yeah, I think one thing I've learned from doing this for some time is it's it's. There is no normal year, but I'm I'm looking at, you know, the gap report mentions um, the sablefish uh, trial allocation is going up. The north allocation is going up twenty something percent next year, in part because of the good recruitments um, we've had, but because we're also shifting some of the some of the, the fish north. Yeah. So can you any? I know the world is completely different because of the pandemic, but any idea? If you're looking that far out, what is that 20% um, bump in the quota gonna gonna do for you? Uh, chair and council member, uh, well, I think it's gonna help. I mean, it can't hurt. Sounds like it's gonna help. It should help everybody, I would think. Um, you know, more quota is good. So, um, 
you know, as far as it, what is it going to do though, is fishing plan. I, you know, I don't know. It just depends on, I, it really, it's, it's hard to predict. So I guess I can't give you an accurate prediction though. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Um, Corey or anything else? Oh no. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for, uh, let me put you on the spot there. Appreciate it. Okay. And then uh, Krista Swenson. Krista? Yes. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I had a question um, surrounding really the 12 month type fishing that you're doing, Paul. And I apologize. I probably should have asked this to Kevin Dunn as well a bit earlier. Um, but you asked us specifically about opting out. So I'm, I'm kind of taking this from a uh, both that and if we had no action, um, meaning you wouldn't have a change and, and we would step out and let you manage. But if, if we were to make a change, do you see that being um, an opportunity to see an increase in the number of folks that are fishing 12 months a year? Do you think that would stabilize once we got through the turbulence of having to figure out how to deal with the quota that you have and and prosecute all of that fish? Or do you think we would see in a and attrition in the number of participants that are currently 12 month a year fishermen. Oh. Uh, council and, and uh, council member. So clarification on the question, would I see attrition under, under the uh, no action or wait, what, can you <laughs> summarize Absolutely. the question? Absolutely. So basically, you're asking to be opted out, which would be the equivalent of no action for you specifically. But if we were to take an action, right? So if we were to take an action that said, no, you you are going to live by the same rules as everybody else, um, and that is going to be something other than status quo or no action, uh, do you think that we would see the same level of participation um, under say alternative three or the proposed alternative four? Uh, to, that we do today for 12 month a year trawlers. Do you think that would, so do you think that would be the same? Do you think it would be more? Do you think it would be fewer? Does uh, that help clarify? Yeah, yeah. I, I think there could be a little more participation at certain times of the year, but probably with the caveat of getting cheaper fish, if I had a, you know, but or delivering cheaper fish, but for the people that are fishing all the time, I don't think it changes anything. For me, for example, it would end up probably hurting me. So, you know, I, I just don't, I don't think there's such a strong correlation as everybody thinks, because I think markets play such a bigger part than, than all the other stuff. Okay, Krista, let's see, um, thank you. Uh, Bob Dooley? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and thanks, Paul, for uh, for coming up and testifying. It was interesting to hear your point of view. I uh, I just had a question. I'm trying to to get a handle on the idea if you if you had didn't have the ability to uh, lease to gear switchers or restricted that. Does that are you are you uh, indicating that gear switchers pay a higher price? Then trawl fishermen for that, and you would lose value in the fish you lease to them. Um, would is that what you're saying, or, or or is it because there's a reduction in the in the number of uh, potential people you could lease to? Uh, thank you, Chair and Council Member. Uh, yes, actually, most of the time I actually lease to, not to gear switchers or trade, but um, anytime you're going to limit my market for who I can lease to and when, you're limiting my market. So yeah, it's absolutely going to hurt my position as somebody that's trying to get a good trade when you're limiting the people that are allowed to do it. And then when you get to the end of the year, like now, for example, and there's a bunch of sable to be caught, and I have sable because I've been using it and making sure I'm going to have enough to fish to the end of the year. Now you have a whole pile of people that go crabbing. And so a lot of trawlers go cr crabbing and 
fixed gear. So the market gets real small too. So all of a sudden now you have something that you paid a bunch of money for at the beginning, and then you're going to end up fire sailing it for pennies on the dollar at the end. Now that's the risk I take and I do it constantly and, and, and other people do too. So it's not like I'm complaining, but if you want to limit it that more, it's going to hurt me even more. Um, I don't know. Does, does that answer it? Yeah, I, I think so. I, uh, <clears throat> I was more getting at the difference between uh, the value of the fish when you lease it to a gear switcher as opposed to uh, a, a trawler. Is there is there a marked difference there? And by limiting that would uh, also restrict the value you get out of your fish. Uh, yes, Chair and, and, and Council Member Dooley. Uh, yeah, I would actually... Well, it it drives the market lease rate up for all of it, probably because there's more people. It just so happens that I've actually leased it to trawlers a lot more than fixed gear, uh, but so they're willing to pay it too. It's just more people in the market to lease stuff, and it drives the price up. Just like for petroleum, it's the same thing. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Um, uh, Marcy, uh, you're up to go. Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you, Paul, for your testimony. Um, just a question on the opt out provision of Alternative One. I think um, your testimony and your previous testimony, um, you've been pretty clear about supporting status quo um, and that you have great rationale for an opt-out um, yourself, given your activities. You described that for us here today, but can you maybe help us understand why the Alt-1 opt-out provision will be, will put you in a worse situation for you and your business um than status quo like how will you be harmed uh should that be the alternative that would be selected oh uh chair and councilwoman uh if i believe i'm the alternative one opt-out is a is an opt-out that i can do and be completely exempt is that correct Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, I'm not totally sure. That's why I'm asking, because I don't understand necessarily the implications of, of the alternative and the options, because, you know, your business may well be affected by what happens to other businesses um, under that scenario. So I'm just hoping that maybe you can explain for us how that alternative would affect your business. Okay, Chair and Council, well, if I'm remembering it right, an opt-out is pretty much a carte blanche opt-out for anybody that wants to opt out their quota shares. The way I see it, that's fine. As long as I can opt out my quota shares, that's fine. And then I'm free to, to lease them to whoever I want. Um, I'm fine with that as far as what it's gonna do. I you know, I, I'm not going to look that far ahead. I just think that that's okay. Cause I'll be able to do what I want. And, and then we'll go from there. The opt out to that. I want to make sure is a little bit clear is a lot. Some of the other alternatives, they say, Oh, well, as an active trawler, you'll always be able to gear switch. Well, that's not, that's not what I want at all because I don't want to switch and try to catch fish with my with pots instead of a trawl net. I don't want to do that. I can catch them with a trawl net. Uh, the whole thing is I want to be able to use my quota shares to lease or trade to somebody, a gear switch, switcher if I need to, not do it myself. So um, because if I did it myself, then that would just take more time away from me catching Dover and all the other flatfish. So, so there... And then as far as an opt-out on alternative, if I remember it right, it's a clear, it's a carte blanche opt-out either one time or yearly, and I'm fine with that. 
Okay. Thank you, Paul. Uh, further questions for Paul? Um, seeing none, um, we're going to probably break for lunch here, it looks like to me. It's 11.58, um, so the timing is good. Um, and I believe uh, Chuck, our um, executive director, is going to have uh, give us some guidance here as we move into the afternoon. Chuck, are you there? Thanks, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> We lost you, Chuck. Or maybe it's me, but uh, I don't hear you. I don't. We lost Chuck. Wow. Okay. I'm not sure. Uh, Hopefully we didn't lose power in the Portland area. I hope not. Okay. Um, with that, um, I will say here, I'm getting a text. He's trying to get his microphone set up. So just uh, give us a second here because I think he had some more words to, uh, about how this afternoon's going to go. And I think it's best to get it out in front before we uh, break. Chuck, are you there? The suspense over lunch would have killed me. <laughs> uh, who would have thought? Corey, you have a question. Uh, just uh, while, while we're waiting for Chuck, um, I, put, I put it in the chat to the uh, panelists, but just to, to Bob Alverson, asked us to pass along this morning that he, the, the IPHC, the Halibut Commission is meeting today. He's a commissioner, so I had to be there. Regrets um, not being able to uh, provide testimony. Maybe he'll be able to appear later, but he asked us to pass along his regrets there and the reasons for not, not being able to testify. Okay, Corey, and I'm assuming that he won't be able to testify after lunch then too. He wasn't, he wasn't sure, but... Um, we can keep an eye out for him. There you go. Okay, sounds good. Thank, thank you on that. Chuck, do we have you? Oh, well. Yep, I just did. Did it not work? Nope. You're going to unmute it. Huh. Okay, uh, Phil? Muted. Try it again. Can you hear Sandra? No, it says I'm muted by the host. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, we're waiting for uh, Chuck to come online. Phil, did you uh, you had your hand up there a second? I uh, bumped my. Uh, cursor at the wrong moment. That was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll tell you what, if we don't get Chuck here, um, let's, um, let's break for, uh, let's break for lunch. Um, and uh, we'll be back here at uh, um, one o'clock. Does that sound? One, one o'clock, we'll start up again. Um, and we'll be with uh, Mike Okudowski. And uh, followed by Lynn, uh, Lynn Walton. See you then. Uh, Mr. Oh. Chairman, can you hear yes. me now? Uh, yes. Oh. Okay, yes. sorry. <laughs> Technical difficulties here. I'm using Sanders' headset now, and I'm having my problems with that. Um, so, yeah, just, just to uh, reiterate what I mentioned this morning. Um, Chuck? Um, what I, re I mentioned this morning was that uh, we're, I'd like to have some uh, an extended break after, uh, shortly after the council starts your council session before they move into council action. So, so it looks like we've got a fair amount more public comment. So um, I would expect we continue with that after lunch. And then uh, after the council discussion, have a, an extended break uh, for some, uh, some sidebar. Before coming back to council action. 
Um, I'm guessing that's going to take us well into the uh, afternoon. So um, I think the likelihood of moving one of the other ground fish items up is, is uh, fading a bit. Uh, I think if we do move something up, it would probably be the approval of the methodology review uh, late in the afternoon. So um, I guess that, that's sort of a tentative plan at this point. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe we'll get another update when we break through. Uh, uh, okay, John, thank you. So, okay, we'll have an extended uh, break uh, before we go into council discussion after we're done with the uh, um, the public testimony. And I, I will correct my public testimony. We're going to go to uh, Mike Rutherford, uh, who we missed earlier, because his mic, uh, microphone issues, and then uh, Michael Kanowski. So, okay, we'll see you at one o'clock. Thanks. Thank you.
our one minute warning. One minute before we start. Okay, it's uh, one o'clock, and uh, we're going to restart here on our uh, public comment on the G1 gear switching uh, for sablefish in the trawl uh, catch share fishery. So, with that, is uh, Mike Rutherford. Um, Mike, are you on there? Hey, uh, hey, Brad, can you hear me by chance? Um, yes, I can, Chuck. Thanks. Could I uh, say a couple things before we get started here? Sure, please. Um, we're, I'm still having some problems. I'm, I'm not sure where the gremlins are at, but uh, anyway, I guess, first of all, I just want to apologize if uh, I offended anybody with my uh, frustration with my headset uh, shortly after the council adjourned, uh, but we were still having live, live feeds out there. But uh, So if I offended anybody's sense of propriety, I apologize. I was just, among other things, badly needed a Snickers bar. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention is uh, we had an instance uh, in this agenda item where Somebody used a chat to answer a question that the council had. And uh, just just as a reminder uh, going forward that the chat is really only for um, addressing technical uh, problems. And um, we've, we've had a couple instances where people have kind of just espoused their uh, policy positions or uh, tried to um, embellish on their public testimony. This was a case of just answering a council member's question um, but in any event, uh, the chat is not on the is not on our administrative record, and uh, so uh, please, if a, if a question comes up uh, again, and, the, uh, and we're looking for somebody to answer it, please allow uh, the chair or the vice chair, whoever's got the gavel, to call on you and allow you to speak, so that everybody can uh, hear the answer and it can be on the record. So I appreciate the, the thought about getting it out there quickly, um, but uh, but we should take the time to make sure that uh, all those comments are on the record. So um, just, just a little brief reminder. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. Um, appreciate that and uh, appreciate your frustration when you have a technical difficulty like that. So hope you got your Snickers bar and we're, we should be good. Um, so with that, uh, we, Sandra can put up the, uh, the uh, testifier list. And um, I believe that... Uh, uh, Mike Rutherford uh, is up next. Mike, are you there? I'm trying to get there. Are you there? We got you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Vice Chair, Council. My name is Mike Rutherford uh, from Newport, Oregon. Our family owns and operates four trawl vessels out of Newport. Uh, we have been actively engaged in the trawl fishery. Well, I have for 30 plus years. My sons are involved now. We spent gobs of money being optimist in this fishery. Over $4 million buying quota share to, uh, to stay in this fishery, to keep the boats busy. And uh, for the record, I'm I just feel we need to reduce the amount of sable fish that has been taken out of the trawl fishery. Um, I, I think it's going to continue to hinder the growth of our trawl fishery. Uh, we're gonna lose jobs as we are, as we're already seeing it. And, and part of this, you know, is probably the COVID year, but, uh, it's really hard to rebuild if you don't have the product. And uh, uh, 
just listening to some of the comments and I don't necessarily believe that we need a savior to come in and utilize our species. I think it's a, um, uh, it's, it was designated for trawl. I don't believe that the trawl boats would ever have a problem getting this fish out of the water. Um, and the more trawl, the more sable we have, the more other species will, will hit the dock and in turn, you know, build markets, uh, build, uh, infrastructure, uh, bring revenue to the communities. So we don't need a savior. We don't need somebody to come alongside and say, well, if you can't get them out, then we will. I don't believe that's the problem here. I think the problem is, is that, uh, right now we're in a kind of a market crunch, but, uh, we can rebuild this fishery to what it's supposed to be. Uh, we need every pound of fish to do it that is allocated to this fishery. And uh, another point was brought up that, you know, trading will cease. Well, trading, trading will continue to happen within the trawl sector. Some boats may want to just fish thorny heads and they need lots of sable fish for that. Instead of fishing, they'll just go off and fish in the deep like we used to. You, you had to choose which fishery you were going to do. Were you going to do a DTS fishery or were you going to do a nearshore fishery? And the nearshore fishery would require a small amount of sable, but it would, you know, patrolly the nearshore fish, the English, the Dover, uh, where a DTS fishery requires a lot more sable. And, and as, you, as you probably see, according to the landing records, our thorny head uh, utilization has gone way down. And part of it is because of this. Uh, the other point I want to make is uh, that the fish that is being leased out now uh, are a lot of, a lot of guys just are, they own quota, they have quota share accounts, and they're not going to fish them. So all that fish is available, but it should be available to the trawl fleet. And, uh, at a reasonable price. We lease uh, over, at the beginning of the year, we lease over $100,000 or more fish packages just to get our business plan put together for the year. And we have to pay a pretty high price for that. But it's security knowing that we're gonna have enough fish through the year. And we still have lots of fish in the water, sable fish, we still got 70, 80,000 pounds of fish in the water, but we also got a boat that's going to catch it and they will catch it. And, uh, anyway, so with that being said, I would just really like to move this forward, get a, uh, preferred alternative moving forward that would reduce the fixed gear fishery. Uh, so with that, I, I guess I'm done. Thank you, Mike. Um, questions for Mike? Uh, Bob Dewey. Bob? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Mike, thanks for coming up and testifying. Always good to hear your voice. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. You mentioned uh, leasing people that lease fish that are not, don't have boats or don't fish actively. Do you have any feelings? I know you do a lot of leasing and a lot of, you know, the market really well. Had a lot of conversations with you in the past over that. And do you have a feeling for how many of those entities exist that really have no tangible connection to the fishing industry that have, that, that have quota, account, quota share accounts that, that are at least on the leasing market? Do you have any feeling for that? Well, I believe, I mean, I, I do, do I have an exact number? No. But I would be I would venture to guess that it's uh upwards of maybe close to fifty percent. And a lot of it I believe happened uh during with with the rationalization happened in twenty eleven. There was a lot of the smaller vessels that um which is brings up a really good point for me is the fact that when you remove one fish 
out of a out of a multi-species fishery um and make it end up it, it, where it ends up being a choke species and i'll use the yellow-eye as a reference so a lot of these small guys when you only got allocated two pounds of yellow-eye and they were i mean they were just fearful of putting a net in the water where they historically fish so as i'd mentioned before that's why the beach fishery went away and it's coming back as as the stocks rebuild but uh those guys are just there they said i can't afford to do this um and that that's where we bought one of our uh quota share packages from one of those gentlemen just like that that just says i can't do this so he sold us a lot of a lot of people are saying well i can make a little bit of money on this and not have to do anything so i, I don't know how many exactly there is but there's a gob so and then of course you know you got the the hake fleet that trade this and that for for bycatch for their fishery and and i and i'll say that it will it will continue to be that way uh it's just a matter of changing your strategies we don't have to have a separate gear type coming in and saving our fishery from uh under utilization i just don't believe that thank you uh, thanks bob Yep. Uh, further questions, Bob? No, thank you, Mr. Weiss Chair. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, further questions um, for Mike? Okay. Uh, seeing none, we'll go to uh, Michael Winoski and followed by followed by somebody, but I will see it. <laughs> um, by Lynn, uh, Lynn Walton. Mike, are you there? I am. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Well, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair and Council Members. For the record, my name is Mike Okineski. I'm an independent consultant working for Pacific Seafood or with Pacific Seafood. At the September meeting, many in the trawl industry, including all coastal processors that testified, spoke to the impacts that gear switching had on their operations and the non-whiting trawl sector. Two ground fish operations have recently ceased and several more said they may. These are owners and representatives of family owned businesses who represent several generations of processors, some of whom were former fishermen. Industry lost 50% of their filets after IFQ implementation. To replace that loss, two of the larger company owners spoke to the need to automate. Automation requires millions in funding. High risk due to the uncertainty of supply brought about by unlimited access to gear switching was stated to be a major factor constraining investments in machinery and market expansion. Five points. We agree with the trial perspective and the gap statement. This specifically outlines the harm gear switching is doing to the trial industry and our coastal communities. For the number two, for the reasons stated in the trawl perspective section of a gap statement, we want to see an ROA range of alternatives go forward that includes alternative three and includes addition of a revised trawl stakeholder proposal two with a 10% cap for gear switching. Number three, all trawl processors that testified in September were against the unrestrained use of fixed gear to take IFQ sablefish. Number four, Tim Hobbs noted in his supplemental comments that in absence of a quantitative data, in the absence of quantitative data that, that the best of qualitative data must be utilized. The processors that testified represent generations of individuals that have built this industry. Time after time, these individuals created markets for our West Coast fisheries, ground fish, whiting, shrimp, salmon, crab, albacore, sardines, and squid. These are the experts. They know their businesses, what works and what does not. This is the expertise you, you should listen to about the state of the IFQ fishery and the impacts of gear switching. Much has been made of the value to the fishery of open quota trading and the value of the quota. 
If a trawl fishery continues to decline, will not the value of a quota for many species, including sable fish, also decline? This is not a fun message to deliver, but I'm only repeating what's been stated numerous times by those who made the trawl industry tick. There are no other players with plans to process flocking to our coast. Those that remain act active, the experts, have told you their side of the story. Thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mike. Uh, questions for Mike? Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, next up, uh, Lynn Langford Walton, uh, followed by uh, Bill James. Lynn? Mic check? Yep, you got it. Okay. Well, good afternoon, Mr. Vice Chairman and members of the Council. For the record, my name's Lynn Langford Walton. I'm submitting comments on behalf of my clients and their partner groups. Um, their interests include mothership whiting, shoreside whiting, shoreside bottom trawl, and fixed gear, both in the limited entry and um, with gear switching provisions. They use both hook and line and pots. I'm going to try to keep my comments brief with the goal of not being repetitive of prior comments or our written submissions. Um, we ask that as we continue the analysis, we focus on the consequential and highly differential impacts of the industry, which is something I have pointed out before. I also want to point out that while the program was launched in 2011, um, as other people have mentioned, the industry engaged immediately after that final vote in November of 2008. So, you know, there was vessels and permits that started to change hands. And in the case of some of my clients, that engagement also included setting up their dock in Owaco to land trawl ground fish. I'd like to note that of the 10.9 million pounds of ground fish that was landed between 2011 and early 2015, 10.2 million of those were from bottom trawl. You know, I continue to struggle with the underlying justification for the change. You know, it appears to me to be mostly driven by a desire to push value out of one of the highest valued species in exchange for the hope that it will incentivize the processors with the capacity to do so to expand the Dover market. Speaking solely from the experience that I have with my clients' vessel landings over time, there's rarely been a difficulty catching Dover. The amount of North Sable fish that they landed with that Dover always tracked pretty closely with the QP they had available in their annual fishing plans. And while their operators are, have been pretty good at what they do, I just don't think that they're all that unique. The currency of the realm is my term for the trawl fishery and that currency is landing opportunity. Four coins a month versus one or two coins a month is a very substantial difference for a shore-based bottom trawler's bottom line. Those coins are handed out entirely at the discretion of the processor. I don't see anything in the proposals that we have before you that will impact that currency or that will somehow ensure that higher volumes of landings is going to equate to a higher value for each trip. I also ask that the, nor that the impacts of North Sablefish quota shares be further analyzed and included in the discussion. A likely $10 differential of price between a trawl-only QS and a gear-switching QS was posited by Bob Alverson in connection with Dock Street Brokers in prior meetings testimony. I believe that's a solid number to use for discussion purposes at this stage. That results in an asset loss of pretty close to $100,000 for every 10,000 10, pounds excuse me, of trawl-only quota. That may not be significant to some people, but I suspect it's likely that any number even close to that range is going to be important to the nearly 70% of people who apparently hold nor Sablefish quota share that are not proponents of the program. In closing, I'd like to extend my appreciation to the council, the agency, and the contractor staff for all their excellent work. The SAMTAC also did a tremendous amount of work in sending the herd from 
24 alternatives to three. The reintroduction of proposals that were not selected by the committee to advance doesn't seem like a good use of time to me. I thank you for your time and consideration of my comments. Thank you, Lynn. Yep. Uh, questions for Lynn? Uh, Krista Swinson. Krista? Yeah, thank you, Vice Chair. And I just, I, I am probably being a little dense here, but I didn't quite understand the, the commentary surrounding four coins and versus one coin. So when, we're hoping that Ms. Blankford Walton could uh, elaborate a bit on what what she's trying to convey there. Lynn? Um, Ms. Svensson, through the chair, um, I was trying to use apparently poorly an analogy for um, what I called the currency of the realm. And what seems to be most important to me, I'm pretty confident it's true, is that what makes the process work is how many deliveries you can get. And those are the coins. I mean, when you get one delivery a month versus four deliveries a month, the impact's tremendous. And those coins are handed out strictly at the discretion of the processor based on whatever it is that the processor thinks is appropriate. And fishermen don't impact that necessarily particularly well. Does that answer the question? Krista? I think so. So in paraphrasing, what I, I think I'm hearing you say is that uh, fishermen get assigned their deliveries and they don't have a lot of say in that. Um, is that correct? <laughs> now I characterized your statement. Uh, Ms. Fenson through the chair, um, that's true. It, there are individuals which led to my earlier comments at, today and in other conversations or in other testimony that said, we have a very highly differentiated fleet and you're going to see differential impacts as you look at that fleet differently. So predicated on a certain number of circumstances and what I call the A-team is that you will have individuals who hit that, that frequency number. For whatever reason, they're going to qualify for multiple deliveries and there are people who don't. And you just kind of scale down as you go through the fleet for whatever reason. And some individuals have very, very limited opportunity and that drives everything else related to their business as a shore-based bottom trawler. Okay. Other questions for Lynn? Thank you, Lynn. Um, next up, um, Bill James, followed by uh, Mike Rutherford, Jr. Bill? Bill, you're muted. Can you hear me now? I got you now, Bill. Hi, my name is Bill James. I'm commercial fisherman and a fishing consultant for Port St. Louis Commercial Fishermen's Association. Um, I'm a little bit winded here because I uh, fell and broke a finger and other parts of things going on. So anyway, we'll deal with that. And um, I've heard a lot of really good testimony. And one of the things, uh, you know, again, Avalon, Morro Bay, or small ports. So whenever you guys decide, we can't lose any more fishermen. Uh, Bill Blue fishes the, uh, the IQ uh, and it's through the uh, um, Morro Bay uh, Association. Um, we have open access at Avalon wanting to start again. We have open access at, at uh, Morro Bay. We have fixed, you know, limited entry fixed gear. So whatever you guys decide, um, you know, save some of the fish for the local guys. Um, one of the things that I, I've heard that I think I can offer some in, um, substantive input towards is there's a call for economics, you know, and how do you do that? Well, one of the ways if you look back at my um, open public comment uh, statement um, in this, this uh, meeting, Mr. Vice Chair, um, you'll see under 
the, the first attachment, which really says attachment three, is a, uh, a summary of an implant economic um, uh, input of uh, summer flounder back east. It, that is a really good, um, complete um, version showing all the different multipliers and how it ends up being a total for the regional area. It's a wonderful I idea. As a matter of fact, one of the uh, um, guys that does some extra work for you, Ed Waters, did his um, PhD uh, dissertation on that. So I really think it would be good to do that on Sablefish and also on Dover Soul. You know, that will give you dollars and multipliers and, you know, so you can look at something and really compare. Right now, I see a bunch of people talking back and forth, and a lot of them, I mean, they all make sense, but again, I don't see any numbers. But this would help the council decide, and it could be used for other, um, there's other species of fish you could use this, this implant for. You know, so please review that. It's 12 pages, and it would really give you a really good idea of how to proceed once you get those numbers in front of you. In the Magnuson Act, it calls for employment, economics, health benefits. You know, the economics I just explained a little bit. Um, with Dover, one pound of sable fish with a trawler gets, what, five pounds of Dover? So if you're looking at food security with like what we have right now with this COVID, you know, what happened if we had a worse um, pandemic? You know, I'm a victim of a pandemic. I had polio as a young child. I know what stuff can happen. Um, we need local, local um, infrastructure processing so we can save our butts in the local communities and the local states. Beef and all that other kind of uh, protein has to be either grown or imported from out of state. Here we have fish that are already, we don't have to grow them, they're already there, they're ready to be caught. So for food security and the health benefits of that fish, I really think we really need to make sure that we have a, I don't know, it doesn't have to be like the Wild West was, uh, in the 1980s, but some sort of processing going up and down the coast into smaller ports. We don't have hardly anything now in Morro Bay and Av Avila. So um, other ports are, are, are hurting too with that. So as, as the uh, fish stocks for the midwater rockfish become available to us open access fishermen, we need a place to fillet. So I really think that uh, Looking at the economics through a, a multi-plan uh, implant economics would really help make a lot of decisions in the future. So don't let over any of our fishermen get hurt by whatever you're doing, and please look at the economics. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you, Bill. Uh, questions for Bill? KCNN. Thanks again, Bill. Um, Thank you. Next up, uh, Mike Rutherford uh, Jr. and uh, followed by Steve Fick. Mike, are you there? I think you're muted, Mike. I'm not sure if it's at our end or your end, but uh, the mute button's pushed. How about it? Sorry. Can you there hear me? There we go. We got you. Hello? Got you, Mike. Hello, hello. Hello. Okay. Can the council hear me? I can hear you. Yes, we can. Yes, we can, Mike. Hello? Okay, Mike. I'm good. You're good. I am here. Well, and we, we know you're here, so we can hear you fine. 
Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Thank you, uh, council members, for taking the time to uh, listen to my testimony today. I've uh, I've participated many times in this process as far as the testimony goes and attending the meetings. Um, so I just want to thank you guys again for making the time for that. Um, I support the trawl endorsed alternative. Um, I believe that the fixed gear harvest of trawl allocated sable has been very detrimental to the West Coast trawl IQ program. I would just uh, urge the council to protect and preserve the West Coast trawl industry and help us, the fishermen, over this hurdle so we can move on to the next. We'd like to start rebuilding markets and processing opportunities. And I believe that uh, the first step is uh, restoring our trawl fishery to what it once was as far as the fixed gear attainment goes of the, the trawl allocated sable. So thank you very much. And I hope you all have a very wonderful day. Thank you, Mike. Uh, questions for Mike? All right. Okay. Next up is uh, Steve Fick, followed by Jonathan Gonzalez. Steve, are you there? Steve, I think you're muted. There, I got it. You hear me okay now? Yes. Yeah, yep. We got you. Okay. Thank you. For the record, my name is Steve Fick. I own Fishhawk Fisheries in Astoria, Oregon. Uh, we we processed. Uh, We've processed uh, Pacific Coast fish since 1985. I just got a few uh, quick comments for you today on this. Um, my understanding originally of the rationale of the IFQ program was justified by the ability to gear switch. And looking at it now, my understanding, one of the, the species we're talking about, black hog, um, is not being utilized as far as the needs of the trawl fishery now. Uh, to imp access other other fish products, um, I, I want to make the point also that we um, have existing rules that um, allow for competition between different processors, which is going to increase the overall value for the resource um, and allows opportunity for all all fishers at some capacity under the guidelines of the of uh, having a trawl permit. Um, I would emphasize that I would, as a council, maintain all your harvest tools available to you as situations change. We've, we've seen that with salmon fisheries. Uh, creativity in the crab fisheries is, is needed now to protect whales as, as examples. And um, any kind of change to the existing program would have a negative effect on my business and the employees that work for me and the customers that I serve. And with that, um, my company opposes any change to the existing rules as, as they are written. Thank you. Okay. Th th thanks, Steve. Uh, questions for Steve, uh, Bob Dooley. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, Steve, I, I was curious, you said you process fish. What types of fish do you do you buy and process, and do you do you buy ground fish, and do you particularly do you buy sable fish? Yeah, uh, uh, to respond to that, uh, we process salmon, crab, shrimp. We purchase those items. Uh, albacore. We buy uh, ground fish, uh, both as a bycatch of some of the other fisheries. We we do buy uh, halibut, black cod directly uh, from the fishermen. And uh, historically, uh, my, my company has bought a fair amount of black cod in the past, and then some years didn't did buy uh, any or little. And so I, I don't know if, if you know my company, but it's in Astoria here. And it's a, it's a smaller processing plant, but it does have the flexibility to handle several species on the, on the uh, West Coast. Oh, follow-up, if I could, Mr. Vice Chair? Please, Bob. 
Yeah, and so are you, are you invested in the in the trawl fishery at all? Do you own quota or? Quota? Yes, I do. Okay. Which, which one is it? A vessel, a, a trawl quota, or? I have quota. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's just curious. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, Krista Swinson. Krista. Yeah. Thank you, Vice Chair, and and thanks, Steve, for coming and testifying for us. Um, Quick question, I hope, uh, around um, kind of smaller processing. Um, do you do you see um, access to sable fish as um, helpful in terms of shoulder season fisheries? I mean, is it is it a backbone for you guys as well um, between, say, albacore and shrimp? Um, or do you think if if you didn't have access to that, would it impact either your business or, or if you can speak to other small processors would it impact theirs as well i mean are we is this pulling a thread on something far larger than just the ground fish fishery is what i'm really trying to ask you yeah well uh, let me try to respond to that in that um any loss of opportunity any any seafood on the west coast for our our company is a deterrent and and affects the bottom line um, what we do is, is, is sometimes we've had, um, fishers that are fishing black cod and, you know, we'll buy crab from them or, or we have, uh, an opportunity to, to build a relationship with a fisherman. If we can take, you know, several species from them during the course of the year. And so it is important to me. I need to have all the opportunities available as a small processor. And um, I, th I think you'll see that um, if you are gonna create opportunity and, and um, competition that you gotta allow all licensed processors to uh, part of the resource. And uh, I, you know, as I've, I will reiterate right now, um, based on this, the numbers I've seen, that I, I believe it's about 50% of the black cod has been harvested this year that could be harvested. So I don't understand what the issue is about um, somebody needing my black cod for their fishery. Uh, whereas, you know, I've got the quota and I, I feel I should have the choice, uh, as Mr. Quill has said, that, you know, I can do what I want with it optimize the economics yeah Krista? um yeah thank you vice chair and i um i guess i have one other question but i will probably leave it for another time if, if you will testify so thank you all right further questions for steve uh pardon oh i'm just, I'm just asking the, if the uh, council members have uh, for any further questions for you steve so i see none so thank you for uh, for testifying Next up, would Thank be, you for the yes. Okay. Next up is Jonathan Gonzalez, followed by I'm not sure. Jonathan, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I I can. Great. Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Vice Chair and members of the Council. Uh, for the record, my name is Jonathan Gonzalez. I'm the Policy Specialist uh, for Fisheries at Pacific Seafood. And I just wanted to start by uh, thanking the Council for taking up this agenda item. Um, this last September action was framed as a go or no go. And so I just really want to thank the Council for, for going forward with this action and scheduling this today. Um, can you advance to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, I wanted to share this, this version of Trawl Stakeholder Proposal 2, which is the most current version and is a bit different than the one that's online that I submitted in, in the supplemental briefing book. Um, one thing that we took out was the number two uh, from the version that was online, and we turned it into this footnote because I didn't want folks to think that that was an extra regulatory layer uh, to the uh, proposal, but rather it was just something that was inherent in um, some of the qualifying criteria that we had and as far as the, the level of participation that was allowed. And what I'm speaking to is just the fact that since fixed gear vessels can only fish quota pounds derived from the quota shares, the vessel 
owner owned, then the leasing of additional quota pounds would be effectively prohibited. So again, that, that wasn't an extra regulatory layer. It was just something that was effectively prohibited. Um, we also removed uh, the, the element of our alternative that would allow leasing to go both ways. And we removed that because we understand that that is outside the scope of, of action in this agenda item and uh, <clears throat> just took that out to further simplify our alternative. But um, I say our alternative, I, I wanna make sure and be very clear that I don't mean the, the Pacific alternative that it's been called. It's also been called the Prosold, processor alternative. And I, the reason why we called it the, the trawl stakeholder proposal was back in uh, October when we proposed it to the SAMTAC, there was over 20 vessels that signed on to it in addition to some processors. So to call it a, a Pacific proposal or a processor proposal is really undermines um, the intent of, of the fishermen that signed on to such a proposal. And, and several of those fishermen for the record, you know, would, would prefer to see gear switching eliminated completely. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, can you please go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, actually the lat the, the, you can go back one. Yeah. So I, I highlighted these elements of the, of the qualifying criteria because we found out very recently that um, if, if we were to run folks through A, B, and C, it turns out that only four vessels would qualify and the max amount of trawl sable that, that they could catch with fixed gear would be about 4.65%. So really that 10% cap would not be needed at that point. And, and that was really not the intent of our alternative. That 10% was something that we saw as a compromise and we never intended to have this alternative kind of secretly uh, bring that to 4.65. So now that that's come out and we're aware of that, um, you know, I, I can identify some ways to, to get around that because if we just simply take out the, the B, the owned a vessel part, that could open it up some more um, to where more folks would be uh, qualif or, uh, qualified under this. Or if we were to kind of play with the landings criteria of, you know, maybe they didn't have to have 30,000, maybe it was 15 or 10, and maybe it wasn't for three years, maybe it was one year, but there's ways to play with that on the back end to get it to where 10% uh, could be the max amount caught with fixed gear and, and playing with it in a way to where you wouldn't go so overboard with the qualifying criteria to where too many people are qualified and then there'd have to be some divesture uh, of the, the trawl sa sable quota that they own. So another way to maybe get around that to get to that happy percentage of 10 is, is just acknowledging the fact that just over 10% of trawl sable is owned by fixed gear interests as of the control date. So that could be perhaps another mechanism to get it to that 10%, but just wanted to clarify that the intent of our alternative is to get it to that 10%. And I note that there is no economic analysis of what this would uh, do as far as the hardship on fixed gear participants, but I also say that there's no benefit analysis you know, and, and if there is going to be a cost analysis, there should also be a benefit analysis about some of the projected catches that could occur with, you know, 100% of trawl sable being caught with trawl or 90% or 80%. But, but playing with that, but then also acknowledging that there could be added employee, employment opportunities here on our end if, if this proposal was to go through. So by having this alternative included, all it will do is trigger that type of analysis that is needed, that kind of cost benefit analysis to weigh against Magnuson. And I know I'm out of time, but just really quick, I just wanted to highlight this slide that was from the GAP report in September and this meeting, because to me, it does the best job at visually communicating where these alternatives take you. And to me, that's the most important part is where do they take you? Because after that, it's pretty easy to find out different ways to get there fair and equitably. So I'll leave it at that. And um, I just ask that the council uh, consider including this in the range of alternatives to be adopted today. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Questions for Jonathan? Okay. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, the next commenter, I don't have a list in front of me. It would be Lori Steele, followed by Chris Rutherford. Thank you. Lori, are you there? I'm here. I'm assuming you can hear me. I can. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Lori Steele. I'm the executive director of the West Coast Seafood Processors Association. Um, I'm here um, uh, representing WCSPA and representing um, the majority of my processing companies, including Pacific Seafood, Bornstein Seafoods, Ocean Gold Fisheries, Kaido Fisheries, California Shellfish Company, and Hallmark Fisheries, um, all which are all of my members who pro actively process ground fish and the vast majority of the uh, ground non-white and ground fish processors, um, to urge the council to approve a range of alternatives today, um, including a more restrictive alternative. Um, we support the comments that have already been made by Jonathan Gonzalez, Mike Okanowski, Jeff Lackey, Tim Hobbs, the Rutherfords, um, and we support the recommendations made by Pacific for expanding the range of alternatives to include a 10% alternative. Um, as Jonathan indicated, um, uh, this isn't a Pacific alternative. Um, it is supported by the majority of uh, my association's processors, and now I've heard it called the processors alternative too. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily that either. Um, as Jonathan indicated, there is a lot of uh, vessel support for it as well, but we do support it. Um, the bottom line, I think, is that expanding the range of alternatives is is ultimately necessary to provide for a more robust analysis. Um, I. Uh, my comments, you'll have to excuse me, my comments are a little bit scattered. I had my testimony written up last night and then woke up this morning and got some new information and sort of changed everything. So um, uh, kind of taking myself out of the weeds a little bit and focusing my comments more at a, at a higher level. Um, so I, we do support expanding the range of alternatives, and we definitely, ultimately, more than anything, support keeping this process moving forward. Um, the GMT report uh, that came out late last night or this morning and the recommendations in it um, were a bit of a surprise, um, but it, you know, it's certainly hard to argue against those recommendations. Um, it, the recommended approach of, of um, first laying out alternatives uh, to look at um, a percentage or, uh, you know, percentage outcomes, essentially, uh, percentage caps uh, is a really good idea. Um, and it's something that the, some of the council members have been suggesting uh, through the SAMTAC process for quite a while. Um, but this is really the first time now that it's really been formally articulated and outlined into some sort of structured approach. Um, it's a bit frustrating um, because this has been a very long, painful process um, over four years of deliberations, um, but there's a lot of merit to this approach. Uh, I'm not entirely clear on how the process that's proposed by the GMT would work, um, but I like the concept, and I do think it would be uh, very helpful to the process to analyze a range of alternative percentages. Um, I would suggest, if we're going to take this approach, that we look at the spectrum of possible outcomes, and that uh, goes from zero to 10%, 20%, 33%, and unrestricted gear switching. Um, I think it's a really good way to step back and look at some large, larger scenarios to look at how the management plan would perform uh, relative to meeting MSA requirements and national standard one. Um, it appears to me at this point to be the best way to get an informed analysis that looks at the impacts on the fishery, which is what we've been talking about all along, versus the impacts on individual fishery participants. Um, if you look, if you take this approach and you analyze various percentages, it would be really important, I think, to very um, to look at the impacts on overall utilization of all of the ground fish species, not just Dover sole and sable fish. Um, you need to evaluate what the fishery would look like in the absence of restrictions on gear switching, as well as in the absence of gear switching altogether. Otherwise, you will sell yourself short in terms of looking at the trade-offs and possible long-term outcomes for this fishery. This is really the crux of the issue. 
way more so than who's in and who's out under a particular alternative. The current range of alternatives is not structured in a way to lend itself to this kind of thoughtful and comparative analysis of fishery outcomes. So evaluating brownfish catch across the entire complex and how the numbers play out under various scenarios would help to better understand what the total capacity of this fishery is, how that relates to our processing capacity, how that relates to jobs and employment in our communities, and how that may affect the future of our, of our fishery. Um, I think the analysis could also take a really close look at the issue of stability in the fishery and what does that mean um, in terms of catch projections under various scenarios and what does that mean in terms of the ability to plan your business, uh, your business portfolio. Um, there's an opportunity here in this approach to be both quantitative and quanti qualitative in the analysis and for the industry to work collaboratively with the analysts to bring forward the best in available information to inform the analysis. So in general, I like the approach. I'm worried about timing um, and how much delay at this point, if any, uh, this would cause. Um, I don't really, like I said, I don't really understand how the process would work, but um, I, do, I worry a little bit about getting too far away from the control date as more time uh, goes on. Of course, I think we're, we're in a situation where we're facing delays because of workloads and, and things like that anyway. So I certainly would advocate for the most um, uh, thoughtful approach to, um, to structuring this analysis. Um, if there's a way to move forward and analyze these general um, percentages um, as alternatives while we're working in the background to refine some of the details of some of the approaches that could be utilized to achieve a specific percentage, um, I think we could try to do that. And perhaps some of us in the industry could continue to work together on some of those uh, specific approaches. Um, so in conclusion, again, sorry if I'm a little scattered. Um, we, we're looking at a management program here that has resulted in decrease in a decrease of, of utilization across the fishery since it was implemented. Yet the stocks have rebounded and can ultimately provide us with huge sustainable long-term yields. This is an outcome that is clearly not the outcome that was intended or desired by this management program. And it's not consistent with the requirements of the Magnuson Act. Um, to remedy this, we recommend the council consider a very wide range of alternatives, and we've supported consideration of a 10% alternative all along. So we support that moving forward in whatever form the council wants to move it forward in um, uh, at this meeting so that we can get a thorough socioeconomic analysis that looks at the full complex of brownfish species um, across a number of outcomes for our fishery. So thank you very much, um, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Lori. Uh, questions for, uh, for Lori? Uh, Kelly Ames. Kelly? To the Vice Chair, thanks, Lori, for your testimony. Just wanted to make sure I had your range correct. Could, could you repeat the range of gear switching percentages uh, you had recommended for analysis? Sure, thank you. Um, thanks for the question. Um, I uh, had uh, I had listed um, to get a full range that looks at the absence of gear switching as well as the absence of any restrictions on gear switching. Um, I would suggest zero, ten percent, twenty percent, thirty three percent, and unrestricted. Um, that's five scenarios. Um, that I think covers the whole range in terms of, again, looking big picture at, um, you know, how that plays out in terms of uh, fishery projections. Thank you. Okay. Kelly? Thank you. All right. Further questions um, for Lori? Okay. Thank you, Lori. Thank and, you. Uh, come to our last um, public comment, be uh, Chris Rutherford. Chris, are you there? I believe you're muted, Chris. Still muted. We're getting 
something, Chris. Hey, Chris, that's um, that's not going to work. It's just um, you're unintelligible. Want to try again? It's not letting me unmute. You got me now. There, there you are. Can you hear me? Uh, we we can. Yeah. Oh, you just bitted yourself again. You're still muted. There you go. And you're back muted. Is that on uh, his end or our end, guys? Chris, your mute is on. Yeah, well, it's hard to tell. Um, we can't seem to unmute him. Oh, there he is. Chris, you are muted right now. No, it's, we can hear you, but you're you're not. Chris, that, that's um, that's not going to work. We can't hear understand anything you're saying. I'm not sure what's wrong on your end, but uh, that's not going to work. It sounds like you might have uh, a little bit. You. There you go. I can hear you too. That time. Sounds like you have low bandwidth or poor connection. That's that's not gonna work either. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, that's um. If that's all you got, it's not going to work out for a uh, oh. comment here. Okay. Uh, yep. So, we anyway, thank you for attempting, though. Okay. Well, with that, um, sounds um, like the, the that may end public comment, and. Um, which bring us to council discussion, but um, I believe I'm going to uh, we're going to turn it. Uh, I'm going to turn to give the gavel back to um, Chair Grolnick and let him take it from uh, from there. Mark, uh, thank thank you, Vice Chair. My uh, so I think Chuck did. Were, are the plan here is to take a break? Is that correct? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think there was a desire to maybe have a little bit of council discussion before we take a break, but uh, I don't know, uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Anderson has uh, some thoughts on that. Well, then I will ask uh, Mr. Anderson to speak. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, um, I was just thinking in my uh, be uh, useful um, to give us a bit of time to get our thoughts in order um, if we were meeting uh, in person there might be a huddle in the back of the room amongst a couple of few folks um, I, I'm not uh, if, if there's a desire to have a little bit of discussion first before we take that break that's great um, but I am recommending that we take a a break here to allow us to get our thoughts in order as as we heard um, throughout our um, presentations today from our advisory panels and GM team and and our public there's a number of ideas that are out there as to how what's what's the best way for us to proceed here and and uh, so that's uh, the primary reason for my recommendation to give us a little bit of time to get some thoughts in order uh, there's a veritable kaleidoscope of uh, proposals out there and options and alternatives. And so let me uh, see before we take a break. Um, uh, let's see if there's any interest in a discussion now. I look for hands. 
Marcy Remco. Thank you, uh, Chair Gorelnik. Um, maybe this is an appropriate time. Um, I do have a question for National Marine Fisheries Service, if uh, they'd be willing to consider it now. Well, I would be part of council discussion, so Kelly uh, is here, so why don't you pose your question? We'll sure. see if we can get it answered. Yeah, and, and maybe it's it's more a question um, for legal, I'm not sure, but um, in following kind of the recent uh, information that's been brought to the council on uh, the need to ensure that we have uh, adequate NEPA coverage and that our NEPA documents are up to snuff um, according to the um, the latest uh, standards. I'm just wondering if NIMS um, has any um, initial thinking for us about the NEPA side of what this process might look like going forward and um, what level of NEPA coverage would be necessary um, if there's anything they can tell us about that at this stage. I'm just, the reason I'm asking is I'm thinking about the timeline and, um, you know, how uh, I'm expecting that NEPA will be a factor and that um, we should consider um, that in in thinking about um, how we move forward here today, um, as I'm guessing that could um, change our thinking about the timeline. Thanks. Okay, I'll look see if the hand goes up. Through the chair, uh, thank you, Marcy, this is Kelly. Um, we have not yet conducted NEPA scoping. Typically we wait until the council has adopted their formal range of alternatives. So, so we did not do scoping based on the SAMTAC alternatives. We're waiting for the council to make that move. Um, once the council has adopted their ROA, we will initiate the NEPA scoping. I do wanna highlight that there are new NEPA CEQ regulations, which will have to be taken into account in developing this action, um, but we have not had detailed discussions yet on how to do that um, and will not do that until we um, have that range of alternatives. I, I will say overall that I view the NEPA as an easier bar to cross than the Magnuson consideration. So um, recall that anytime that you do an allocation, we need to, to go back to Magnuson and our national standard guidelines and consider fair and equitable, um, and, and so on and so forth. I can, I can elaborate more on those requirements if you like, but, but to me, the Magnuson will be the, the harder lift compared to the NEPA. Uh, Marcy, will that do? Yes, that more than does it. I really appreciate the answer. That was even more than I bargained for. So thank you for the, the clarifications and um, CEQ guidance was, was really what I was interested in hearing about. And thanks. Thank you, Kelly. Bill Anderson. Yeah, thanks, Ms. Chair. I just, I didn't want to leave too much out there in the way of mystery. Uh, so. Um, yeah, you're, I mean, you're, the council members that were part of the same tech process are kind of been out in the deep end of the pool on this topic, and uh, those are uh, those are the folks that we we're going to try to huddle up. We've been kind of going back and forth with emails and thoughts and different ideas, and we thought it would be a good idea if we could just get together and maybe come back and have some suggestions for the council to consider. So that's um, that's why I'm asking for a bit of a break here to allow us to, to do that. And hopefully the council will, will have something uh, of use to, to bring back for, for consideration. Thanks, that uh, hopefully would be a more productive way forward. So before we take this break, uh, let just uh, any, anyone feel like they need to get a comment out there or ask a question? Uh, 
Phil, how long a break are, are you anticipating? Uh, I was going to request an hour. Um, you know, it's possible we could get it done a little quicker than that. I'm not sure, but so that we don't. So I, I would, we could be back hopefully ready at three. And if something happens and we go quicker than that and we can communicate back with all, but probably 240 or yeah, 245 would be the earliest and three, but plan on three. How's something like that be acceptable? Well, if we need to be back at 245 to check in, then um, I think the way these things usually go, why don't we give you till three um, with the optimistic view that uh, what you bring back to the council will um, make the balance of the afternoon go well. So unless anyone objects, we'll take a break here and come back at three o'clock and enjoy the fruits of the discussion that uh, Phil and the other SEMTAC members will be having. I wish you well. Godspeed. <laughs> Thanks. We'll meet.
Well, I have 315. Um, can I inquire of Executive Director Chuck Tracy if uh, we're going to be ready? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe we are ready. All right, everyone take your virtual seats. We are in council discussion on the council action, agenda item G1. And uh, who wants to help us resume our discussions here? Mr. Anderson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Um, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will uh, make an attempt to get us uh, started here. Um, and several of us had a little sidebar, as, as I mentioned, that had uh, some of some of us uh, that had been involved in the SAMTAC process, but this was just a sidebar amongst uh, a few of us. Um, to 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 talk a little bit about what we what we heard and see if we could bring you that and and uh, you'll have to be the judge uh, of whether or not we're we uh, that was a good use of your time um, and so from there the the rest of the rest of what I have to say are my 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 personal thoughts they're not they we're not uh, uh, we weren't there to come to an agreement or a consensus or anything else. We were just, just there to talk about um, what we might, um, what, what we thought in terms of moving forward. And and so, um, you know, I think um, reflect obviously back to uh, June when the uh, SAMTAC provided its uh, final report to the council. Um, a lot of work obviously went into that by a lot of folks um, and um, and I think it's a demonstration not only of the work that the uh, that SAMTAC group, group did and all the members of the public that participated in that process but as well as the the cab and the gap and there's been a number of, of um, groups and entities that have tried to um, Look at this issue and and see if we can couldn't come forward with uh, some kind of an, a recommended approach. And uh, the complexity of it is uh, demonstrated by, um, at least in part, by the alternatives that were included in the uh, SAMTAX report. And I really wanted I wanted to compliment uh, uh, both. Uh, Jim and Jesse for their presentation here today, uh, particularly on the alternatives. I thought it was the clearest um, articulation of the alternatives that were contained in the SAM tax report uh, that I've heard. And so thanks um, for doing that. You know, we started by uh, looking at a purpose and need statement, uh, which the council ended up adopting um and we also as part of that conversation talked about principles that uh, we thought were important for us to consider as we develop the various alternatives and there there um there were seven of them uh and they were in no particular order of importance i don't think um but we wanted to uh ensure that whatever however you know however this came out that we had um trawl access to the to the sable fish um uh we didn't believe that their unlimited catch of sable fish through gear switching was a desirable outcome uh we wanted to consider the impacts on existing operation and investments we wanted to maintain gear switching option for trawl, trawl operations wanted to consider industry and community impacts and alert, ensure long-term stability and we wanted to consider the effect on the value of trawl permits and we wanted to increase the net economic value of the trawl individual fishing quota fishery so th those were in at least um, uh, condensed um, 
of uh, sharing of the uh, principles that, that the SAMTAC developed. Now, those were never adopted by the council. Uh, the only thing that had been adopted by the council is the purpose and need. But, um, and, and there, you know, and trying to achieve all of those of those things simultaneously is, is no small task and, and it's not it's not easy to do as again borne out by the by the um, the amount of time and amount of effort that a lot of people have put into this issue. And the other thing we did um, that I think was is is important for us to remember is our decision in September and, and that was really uh, a kind of a red light, green light uh, decision at that point as to whether or not based on the information that was provided to us, both from the SAMTAC process, the CAB process, the GAP, and all of the members of public that have, that have testified on this issue, um, the council decided that it needed to move forward in what I, what I would call see this issue through to whatever end that is. Um, but given the, de the degree of interest and concern uh, we wanted to, um, we, we thought, we decided as a council to, to continue. And we had hoped, um, I think, uh, and we had anticipated that we would be at a point here at this meeting to, to adopt a range of alternatives. And, um, uh, you know, I, and I, I, I know I came to this meeting uh, with that as my my thought of what we should try to accomplish. But as this uh, meeting has unfolded and the uh, reports have come in from places like our groundfish management team, the gap, the public, and a further um, look at, at the alternatives, uh, I have come to a different um, point of view. Uh, and that is a, that I um, don't, think that adopting a range of alternatives as we had envisioned it uh, is um, the appropriate next step. And as some of you, or maybe a lot of you are going, oh my goodness, uh, they're going to draw this out even more. Um, I don't think, I hope that that isn't what you think after we deliberate and make whatever decision we, we do. But uh, I do think that we've got, a, there's a lot of decisions to make, you know, in order to put a package together. And one of the most obviously important ones and that kind of sets the table is, well, what's the overall gear switching level gonna be? And um, there's been a lot of analysis done uh, that uh, can help inform that decision. Um, it's kind of spread out in a lot of different places in the various documents and analytical in, in the SAM tax report and other places. And so, uh, uh, and as Bob Dooley has often said, you can't build a road uh, to, to your destination until you know where your destination is. And he has come, he's been uh, uh, relentless in, in reminding us us all of that act. And so in terms of trying to decide where we're going to go, uh, this I, this question of what is the overall gear switching level is an important one. And so, uh, uh, you know, I think we need to put some, some more emphasis on that. I think we need to uh, get information from our analytical team on to the best of their ability on a on a fairly wide range of of um, of uh, results or, or impacts from um, uh, a level different levels of of uh, the proportion of the trawl fixed or trawl sable fish that is taken with fixed gear and uh, and and then I think once we we and, and I think there's some repackaging of existing anal analysis that can help us uh, look at that question and and make a more informed decision about that. And once we get to that point, then I think we um, all of the other factors in terms of our 
of our uh, our tools, our management tools to get us there, while at the same time kind of honoring those principles or something similar to that, as well as ensuring that we're in compliance with the national standards and, and other applicable law, uh, will we be able to move forward? So I'm hoping that by kind of bifurcating this question from the rest of it and trying to deal with it first will help us and maybe even speed up um, the, the, the rate at which we get to a final outcome. So Mr. Chairman, those are just some overarching thoughts um, of mine um, and uh, in terms of where I think the appropriate way for us to, to go is, uh, I want to emphasize that I'm not trying to, those thoughts are not intended to try to indicate that we want to slow down. And they're also not, um, you know, we're, I am not interested in, in one group or the other walking out of this meeting thinking that they've got the uh, these so-called upper hand. I think we need to do a very, um, um, uh, thoughtful process and understand what the implications are of these various levels of gear switching as it relates to the overall health and welfare of the trawl fishery, as well as those who have invested in this um, aspect of the trawl fishery that is currently part of the catch air program. So, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll conclude and and uh, look forward to hearing the wisdom that comes from my other colleagues around the table. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Phil. Uh, you won't be getting any wisdom from me. Uh, I see Bob Dooley has his hand up. Uh, uh, please go ahead, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Phil, thank you so much for eloquently stating everything that I truly believe in. You, you hit every, every point I could possibly think about hitting. I uh, I agree with all of that. I have yes, I've been <laughs> incessantly saying that we need to have a destination before we uh, go much farther. I hope that someday, I, when I grow up, I can be as eloquent and thorough and thoughtful as you. But I think at this stage of my life, I think that's a dream. So anyhow, getting on to this. You know, been part of it from the cab to the five-year re five-year review of the cab and the SAMTAC and two different seats on that, and watch this pro of uh, this process go forward. And there's been a lot of thoughtful work, good work, to put these alternatives together. And but we're at a point, I think, and I, you know, I I, I want to recall that. We had 23, I believe, alternatives on the table that we came from different people on the on the cab and on the SAMTAC. And we ended up, you know, down to three, which is pretty admirable. But obviously, because of the you know diverse opinions, and you saw that in spades today in the in the gap report, people are still where they are. And I think the missing link here is, as Phil described, we need to we need to contemplate the level of gear switching that the council believes is appropriate, fair, and equitable. And I think that will then signal for the, the people that have done an incredible amount of work on this to come together. And I too want to thank Jesse and, and Jim for all of the work that they've put into it, as well as all my fellow SAMTAC members and the public as well, but I think that uh, I think we're in that, at that place, and I support exactly what Phil was talking about. So I will I will stop there, not to drag it on. So thank you. Thanks, Bob. It does seem to make sense to approach this in an iter iterative way to put some, you know, decide on levels and then move forward from there. Uh, further discussion or perhaps someone might want to offer a motion. But I think there's more discussion to be had. 
Pete Hassemer. I think, Mr. Chair, it's, maybe I was hoping somebody else would raise their hand there, but uh, my finger beat me to it on the mouse. Um, I, you know, it's too easy to understate the value and the importance of all the contributions we've had through this long process, and, and I agree um, also with what, what Phil said. Uh, a lot of work has put into this, been put into this by people. It's important work. This is a, is a, a really critical and very important issue to address. Um, so I sure appreciate everybody's attention to this and, and really value the public comment that we've heard through this and especially today and um, all the advisory body reports. Um, one thing that strikes me in this though, and, and well, let me back up again. I, I wanna say I agree with those points Phil made, so not to repeat them too much, but to express why um, I, I come to that opinion. And to me, a, a really unique aspect of this issue is the degree of separation between the proponents of status quo and the proponents for some change in the management. And that's really evidenced in the gap report where we, we have two different reports there. Um, that difference of opinions if you want to use that term, to me is a signal that we need to be very careful and deliberate about how we proceed on this issue. And, and that in relation to some of the new ideas, the fresh ideas we heard today um, about potential changes to the alternatives and the way to look at this leaves me with anxiety too at this time about selecting a range of alternatives and going down that pathway. Um, and I agree, um, I, I guess I was taking my cue from the GMT report and their recommendation about looking at uh, different levels, analyzing different levels of gear switching, sort of absent of how you actually implement those and see what some of those community level effects are and uh, those types of analyses that would come forward with it. I guess maybe, a, I don't know if this is a good way to explain it, but I tried to come up with some type of analogy and um, you don't have to be a golfer, but if you watch golf on TV. I had a chance uh, this weekend to watch a little bit of the Masters. And, and when I watch those golfers, when they approach a putt, uh, they spend a lot of time looking at it. And they look at it from behind the ball. And then they go 180 degrees opposite and look at it. And then from the right side and the left side and from a higher elevation and down at ground level. And they really look at that. And I try and think if we've really taken that approach with what decisions we need to make now relative to the importance of this. And I think if we, we find a way to implement what the GMT is recommending there, it gives us a chance to maybe take a look. I don't know if it's 180 degrees different from how we've done this in the SAMTAC analysis, but it gives us a, a different perspective to assess how different levels of gear switching are going to affect the fisheries and the communities in that. And I think we owe it to this process to take the time somehow to go through that step and best inform ourselves into the future um, and at that later point in time, when we have a good sense of how the level of gear switching affects the communities, should we make a decision on that, then it's the right time to think about how we get there. But I, I'm troubled that, um, well, I, I just see a lot of value is taking a step back and making sure that we've looked at this from all angles and we're well informed 
and ready to make the best decision we can. So I'll, I'll close it there with my comments. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pete. Further discussion? We've had some really thoughtful comments here that seem to be very consistent. Um, I'm looking to see, especially if there are any contrary views. And if there aren't any contrary views, uh, Krista. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm not going to say that mine is contrary. I, I don't think that I am. <laughs> um, but I, I do want to put just a little different perspective um, to kind of segue on uh, my, my colleagues' comments about looking at this from a lot of different viewpoints. Um, and, and really, the thing that struck me this morning in listening to management teams, to advisory panels, to the public, is that we've really, in a lot of ways, have been approaching this from a scarcity standpoint. Um, and I think that this is demonstrated when we use words like losses or degradation. And it came up um, earlier, not on the council floor, about ghost plants. And I really don't know that that is the direction or the approach that I would like to see. I would like to think that we are able as a collective to work towards a future of resiliency. And so when I started thinking about that and I was struggling through the alternatives, like I think we all are, um, and what, what those would really mean for a short future, it occurred that resiliency isn't going to look the same for all stakeholders. And by that, I mean, you know, if you're a large processor or a large boat, what builds resiliency for you may be very different than somebody that is a small shoreside vessel that's fishing for 12 months a year. And to highlight a couple of examples of this, when I was at Jesse's, the biggest problem I had for whiting, and this is no pun intended, was that the boats were literally too big. The port only dredged to 16 feet. Um, and most of the boats just physically couldn't even get in there. And that was a problem for growing jobs and uh, really strengthening that community. Then on the flip side, and I know I've talked to a few folks about, hey, we, we looked at developing ground fish markets. Uh, the challenge there was I had a boat that, well, I wanted to cut fish. They could bring in 100,000 pounds and my equipment just, and my personnel could not handle that. So, you know, as we're, as we're working through this, I think it's really important to make sure that we are able to include as many different types of stakeholders as possible to provide that opportunity and really that resiliency. And I think long term that will make us nimbler in terms of capitalizing on opportunities and re reacting to environmental or bi biological or marketing shifts or changes. Um, and, you know, I don't want people to misinterpret in my statement there, you know, in terms of, hey, I think, I think we need to really consider everybody that somehow I don't think we need large scale. We definitely need large scale. Um, I don't think that we can access all of the resource if we don't have big players out there. Um, but I also think that we are likely to see, uh, more development in terms of small scale and mid-sized markets that can kind of capitalize on those niche opportunities um, to really increase the value of our fisheries. And I would note that we've had folks that have come in and testified in the last couple of meetings who have demonstrated that they have some ability. Um, so I don't think that it isn't a viable option that we could foreseeably have ground fish additional capacity come in or additional processors, nor do I think that it's a pipe dream. I think that the opportunity is out there, but I don't know that that opportunity is there for everybody. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to conclude by saying that I am concerned about the concentration of processing into a, just a few ports. Um, I don't think that it is just a matter of consolidating jobs, but I, I truly believe that it's putting our industry at risk. I think it's putting our resources and our national food security at risk. Whether that's a foreseeable event or a force majeure, 
Um, and I'm concerned that additional consolidation will amplify short-term effects. And by short-term effects, I mean even things like the big windstorm that we've got going on here in the Pacific Northwest. You know, historically, if we had plants in Bellingham and Astoria and down into California, if there was a big windstorm up here, you still had cutting capacity and processing and deliveries in California. And without that, really, it's going to create major ripples in our supply chain. And I feel like that's a it's a pretty fragile thing. So. As we move forward, and I'm I'm encouraged by what I've heard today in terms of kind of the path we're possibly looking at, uh, I, I do want to be looking for solutions on how these alternatives can in increase both industry and community resiliency. With that, I will close my comments. Thank you. Krista, thanks. Thank you for your perspective on that. <laughs> Further discussion? Maggie Summer. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Pardon me. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. I am prepared to offer a motion when you are ready. Well, I, I think we are ready. Uh, I've not seen a burst of hands go up, and certainly the motion is apt to simulate further discussion. So I would welcome it at this time. Thank you, Chair. Sandra has it. Request that the analytical team provide information on the impacts of the following levels of fixed gear attainment of northern sable fish in the IFQ fishery 0, 12%, 20%, 33%, unrestricted. At a future meeting, consider the information provided in response to number one and identify a maximum level of gear switching to be used in further development or refinement of any action alternatives. And at a subsequent meeting, adopt a range of alternatives for the potential modification of regulations regarding the use of fixed gear to catch sable fish in the trawl IFQ fishery north of 36 degrees north. Thank you, Maggie. Is the language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes. I will look for a second, seconded by Phil Anderson. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, this motion proposes a, a reorganization of the approach that the Council is taking to this issue uh, by requesting information uh, to support us moving forward first to the decision on a uh, level of gear switching to use in further development of management alternatives to potentially limit gear switching and identify some next steps. I will say that I also thought the council should adopt a range of alternatives today, and many of you have heard that from me very recently. I came to this meeting prepared with a lot of detailed recommendations for refining the existing alternatives but not a lot of confidence that those were the right recommendations for reasons that others have already expressed. The alternatives we had been looking at are very complex. They have multiple regulatory approaches, outcomes, impacts on communities, on individual participants, and administrative burdens and other costs. So this recommendation is to bifurcate the steps the council will go through, as Phil noted, and the hope is to get us to a good outcome through a better process than what has gotten us where we are today. It builds on the GMT's suggestion. I'll note that this also was brought out in the last paragraph of the WDFW report, and in a lot of public discussion I've heard that's focused on limiting gear switching to certain levels. So the first request is for uh, the analytical team to provide us information on the impacts on the fleet, on processors, fishing communities, uh, on the overall levels of fixed gear attainment uh, at, at, at these levels, pardon me, zero, which would mean no gear switching, 12%, 20%, 33%, and unrestricted. Uh, zero, of course, is, is the no gear switching scenario to which 
other levels of gear switching have been compared in previous iterations of the analysis. And I think that that's uh, a valuable reference point to continue to understand the others. The 12% is an approximation of the amount of Northern Sablefish quota share owned by uh, folks with uh, recent primary participation in gear switching. 20% is an interim level, and 33% is the recent average attainment with fixed gear in this fishery. And unrestricted would be the status quo option where there is no uh, regulatory restriction on gear switch, uh, fixed gear attainment, and that could include any uh, real anywhere. It could include uh, the, the recent levels or an, an increase or a decrease. As part of that analysis, I would ask the analytical team to uh, try to address the recommendation that the GMD made on uh, some analysis of the no action alternative. They made some specific recommendations for exploring scenarios under that in their report. And I would hope uh, that that could be included. I also would like to note that uh, I understand from Jim and Jesse, that um, much of the, the information asked, requested here has already been produced. I don't think we would be expecting significant new analyses, although there, there may be some. Um, but it would be very helpful, I think, to the council and participants in this process to see the information um, pulled together and presented in a way that really illustrates the overall impacts of the variety of gear switching levels separate from the complexities of how to get there and the details of um, uh, impacts on individual participants or groups of participants in the fishery. So the, the proposal is that uh, the analysts would, would work over the winter to produce what information they can in response to this request. And then at the next meeting at which the council takes up gear switching, we would consider that information and identify a maximum level of gear switching for use in the further development and refinement of action alternatives. Um, keeping in mind that the no action alternative will remain uh, part of what the council is considering. So that that's there too. Um, I have not specified a, a a date uh, or a particular council meeting to consider for this. We can um, have some discussion on that today if there is interest, and I'm sure we'll be taking it up under future workload planning. Uh, and then the, the third step would be at a uh, another meeting following that. So the next meeting at which the council chooses to take this up, we would then consider uh, and hopefully adopt a range of alternatives that would include, uh, you know, would have been developed based on the level set under step two, uh, again, the for the action alternatives. Um, I, I do want to uh, note that they re there's been so much work done on the alternatives that have been developed by the SAMTAC and, and others. Uh, that is not at all wasted. We will be considering uh, these alternatives and or possibly others with future refinements potentially when we get to that step. Um, I, you know, I know there has been some discussion of whether new alternatives should be proposed that did not go through the SAMTAC process. Uh, and my, my perspective on that is that certainly there is value in having gone through the SAMTAC process, but I, I don't think that uh, but precludes us from considering other alternatives for adoption in a range when we get to that point. Um, and then the burden would be uh, for analysis after adoption to make sure that we understand all the details of any alternative the council chooses to move forward for further consideration. Um, you know, finally, I, I want to say that some may think that uh, this is a delay, as was noted, or that the council is avoiding making a hard decision by adopting a range of alternatives today. And I'll say I see it as the other way around. Uh, I think that identifying a level of gear switching to aim for in action alternatives is an important and hard decision, and putting us on a track to do that will help the process. Uh, the information requested today under this motion um, 
the analysis to produce that information and a decision on a level of gear switching would have been necessary at some point. And I think putting us on a track to do that now rather than later on reduces the risk of finding ourselves down the road and eventually revisiting a range of alternatives. So hopefully this will, will streamline the process. Um, I, I certainly can't presume whether it will get us to a better outcome or not, but I feel like it can certainly get us there by a much more logical and clear process. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Maggie. Your, your audio did drop out there uh, for a couple of moments. Uh, I'm not sure why this meeting is so special in having uh, audio issues, but I guess just a special time. Uh, Louis Zim. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you very much, Maggie, for this. Um, it is way more than I, I could have hoped for, but I do have one question for the maker of the motion is that uh, we refer to an analytical team and realizing that the GMT is overtasked lately and that NIMS will not be able to get around to working on this until next fall. Who do you envision the analytical team to be? Maggie, thank you. If Mr. you have an answer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hopefully you can hear me. I, I was envisioning a primarily Jim Seeger and Jesse Dorpinghouse, potentially with some assistance from the GMT. I understand they may have a January work schedule, uh, pardon me, uh, uh, work meeting scheduled, um, but I, I really don't presume to know what plans, you know, and uh, competing tasks there are on their plate. So uh, really primarily I was imagining Jim and Jesse, and I understand that uh, they feel they could produce this information over the winter. Okay, well, thank you, Maggie. Then you're calling once more on the A team. Thank you. <laughs> you sure are. Thanks. Uh, any further questions for the maker of the motion or discussion on the motion? Mercy Remco. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Maggie. Um, Question for you regarding item three and the range of alternatives. Um, I just want to understand if adopting this description of the range of alternatives is going to um, clearly define the box within which we would work from looking forward when we do go to adopt a range of alternatives. And let me explain the reason for my question and see if maybe you can enlighten me a little bit. Um, the language here indicates um, that the range of alternatives uh, would modify regs regarding the use of fixed gear to catch sable fish in the IFQ fishery north of 36. And uh, one thing that we have learned uh, in the course of the scoping of this item over the last uh, few years and uh, with heavier emphasis in the last few months, that California is a very big and very diverse state. And um, what is good for one part of California may be very bad for another part of California. And thinking about the input we received uh, in our um, CDFW survey, um, there was an awful lot of input from stakeholders in the area between 4010 uh, South that are very concerned about losing their ability to gear through. And also, um, if they weren't interested in gear switching themselves, they were worried about their retirement and their ability to sell their portfolio um, at the highest price. And um, I'm thinking <laughs> how nice and clearly Kevin Dunn put it uh, for us today. He wants the most money for his catch that he can get. And I think the same goes for shares. And I'm feeling that the 
folks that hold chairs um, and lease them. Um, the folks uh, in the area, I'm gonna call it kind of California's heartland there between 4010 South, um, you know, have, I think a different business interest and different um, perspective and need for diversity than potentially ports to the north. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about testimony. I heard the last meeting about Eureka and Eureka really needing this to save it. Um, and hearing some testimony from um, trial representatives uh, in Eureka saying how important this was to their business to be able to, or that gear switching, uh, restricting gear switching was a solution for them. Um, but I'm hearing kind of a number of different opinions. Um, and I'm just thinking ahead to when we adopt a range of alternatives. Um, if this action here today on item three would preclude us from considering using a different geographic line for the application of the program. Um, meaning that, you know, I, I would be wanting to talk more and get more input um, from constituents um, north of the 4010 line, say to 42, uh, as well as south, um, to ascertain, you know, how we best build alternatives that, um, will keep the value in this fishery. Um, we heard a lot of testimony today that the overall net um, effect of adopting a prohibition on gear switching is to reduce the overall value of the fishery. Um, and I'm very concerned with that, particularly for the heartland of California, where a restriction on gear switching is likely to have the greatest impact. So um, I just, my question for you is, um, would this mean that the only possible line that we could consider for the application of this program is at 36 degrees north? Through the chair, thank you, Marcy. That is not my intent. And I don't believe that this wording would restrict it to that. It, it's simply worded uh, north of 36 since we had, the council had previously decided not to address anything south of 36 degrees um, as part of this action. But I don't think this would preclude considering a different line north of 36. Thanks for that answer. Uh Mercy. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I will note that um, in my own records and hope that that'll be part of the record. And I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. All right, further, any further questions for the MIC or the motion or discussion on this motion? Corey Niles. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Maggie, for the motion. Uh, just quickly, uh, I'll, I'll speak in, in, in support of it. Um, I'm also going to connect um, to what the others have, uh, have spoke to before the motion and during discussion. Uh, I joined as WDFW SAMTAC rep at the last minute for one virtual meeting, um, but I've, I've been impressed by the thoughtfulness of, of the folks there. The, all, the, all the hard work. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put Pete's analogy up there with Brad's one about the freeway lane size as as a good one. I'm not a golfer either, and um, no matter how many times I walk around the putting green, I'm, I'm gonna miss it, uh, miss the putt. Unless, um, but I, I like that. I like the way he he described that, and this is this is coming at these issues from um, from a, a different angle. And uh, I do, I do believe that is is um, a good way to go. Uh, maybe Jesse and Jim can, and others can do what the TV people do and put the put the path to the successful putt there down on the green for us. Um, but we shall see. Um, another thing, I just want to also note 
um, listening to public testimony today, I was really thankful for the folks we have in this process. You know, this is this has been going on a long time. There is a lot of, at stake financially, business wise, but also on other important things like communities and and fairness and all that. And and it's really nice to see people come to the council and speak their points of view civilly and respectfully and and want analysis and facts and to hear the other perspectives. So, you know, watching the news about other places in our country, that doesn't happen in a lot of places. So thank you for all that, for, for those who came today. And I hope that hope those uh, deliberations continue. I have, I have no, I have full confidence they will. And yeah, thank you for the, for the motion, Maggie. All right, uh, I'm gonna call, uh, Marcy has her hand up and then Brad Pettinger. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I can get behind this motion. Um, I appreciate the hard work that um, folks did um, thinking over the past few days on how we, what our best path is um, leaving this meeting. Um, I appreciate the, the deep thought. <laughs> um, there's been a lot of kind of circling around in a lot of team rooms, um, a lot of, um, I think, um, coming to conclusions about, um, you know, why we need to stay, take a step back, um, agree with all those remarks and, and thank folks, um, for their leadership on, on coming to that, um, realization. Um, one thing that's, I think, weighing on me here is, you know, we are um, looking at, um, with this repackaging, um, kind of just a different side of the same apple, and maybe looking at how we might bite it a different way. Um, I think that's um, certainly a, a, a good idea. Um, and for all of the reasons that Maggie raised about um, improving efficiencies on how we develop alternatives and move them forward and analyze them, um, completely support that. Um, but one thing I, I don't want to lose sight of is it's still the same app. And um, the repackaging effort um, is important. And I again, agree that that's going to be fruitful, but um, it does not, I think, take away from the fact that we're going to need to be wrestling with costs of what we might build and ensure that the benefits that accrue um, will generate the greatest bet net benefit um, in light of the potential costs. Um, essentially, what we're talking about here um, is um, you know a, a program that's going to um, involve a lot of cost. We haven't heard a lot about the costs. Um, we're going to probably be looking at some new programming of databases at NIMFS um, that will be time-consuming and difficult. Um, the permits branch. Um, is likely to um, need to engage uh, legal, certainly. Um, if we have options that determine who is in and who is out, um, that's always going to involve appeals and litigation. So um, I, I look forward to hearing more about those and weighing them um, as we proceed. Um, the thing that I'm on the immediate horizon, um, I appreciate uh, hearing from Maggie that she's had some discussion with uh, the analytical team of Jim and Jesse and that they'll be able to um, proceed with this activity over winter and be ready for us whenever we next agendize the item. Um, I guess I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with how we got to having an analytical team on this one item. Um, and I'm thinking about the other priority items that are in our queue and that um, we will be discussing um, in short order under the agenda planning item. And 
that's definitely, um, I think, weighing on me that we have a team of analysts on this item and potentially is going to tie them up and prohibit them from beginning work on um, other items that are high priority in our queue, um, like having a look at some of the non-trawl fishery needs and actions that we might consider. So um, I think I just wanna support the motion, but um, I am um, going to be interested in having a little more discussion about uh, council staff capacity uh, to take on new initiatives if they remain um, tied to the work of this analytical team um, or what other council staff support might be available um, to take on other new items because I feel like they're all um, a priority for us. So um, I guess with that, I again I express support for the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Brad Pettinger. Hey, Chair Gorolnik. Um I was uh, really happy to see the uh, GMT statement. Um, I thought it uh, it was a very uh, it was a it, it was nice to see a fresh look as far as uh, how to uh, approach this process. Um, I think Marcy took my apple analogy uh, before I could get to it, uh, but I think that uh, where we're going was too big of a bite of the apple, and I think that. Uh, this is the uh, proper way to do it, you know, lay things out and uh, do a very, very methodical uh, process getting to the right decision. And so um, I'll be succinct here and to say that uh, I support this motion. And I thank the, uh, the group for getting together and put it together and um, um, just outstanding work uh, really to those folks um, coming to this end. And uh, really hats off to everybody that uh, the, the work that's been done today for this meeting and this uh, agenda item. So. Um, that's it for me, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Brad. Uh, any further discussion before I call the question? Not seeing any hands, I will call the question on this motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Maggie, thanks very much for the motion. Uh, let me ask uh, if there are any further uh, guidance to be provided under this agenda item. Is there any other business under this agenda item? Maggie Summer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it came to my attention that one of the spots my audio cut out may have been uh, when I was saying that I hope as, as the analysts uh, do some more work that they uh, try to take the GMT recommendation for specifically on analysis of what action alternative the GMT has some recommendations in their report and that's why I said so I just wanted to clarify that in case you all didn't catch it. Oh, Jim, I'm cutting out right now again. Yeah, yeah. Am I? It's something about that statement that the gods don't <laughs> like. So can you try it again? Do what the GMT said. Um, uh, to, my hope, my request was for the analyst to uh, follow the GMT's recommendation for a no action alternative in the work they'll be doing. Okay, I think there was a, a little bit of a problem there, but I, I think we got it. I may try to call in tomorrow. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, I think that might be, I don't know, it's not you. It, I don't know what, what it is. It's multiple people are having this issue. Corey Niles. Uh, excuse me, never mind, Mr. Chair. I, th I think you said you did get what you said. I understood what you were saying, but it sounds like you did too. So never, never mind. But thank you for. All right. Uh, anything further on this agenda item? Mr. Chair, this is Chuck. Yes, Chuck. Yeah, just, just to, just to uh, mention that uh, in the motion um, mentioned a future meeting and a subsequent meeting. And uh, so I think uh, we should be thinking about that in terms of, uh, in terms of some of those things like uh, uh, staff capacity, GMT workload, um, 
those sorts of things over the next uh, couple of days. And then uh, we should uh, attempt to address that if we can uh, under uh, future agenda and workload planning on Friday. Thank you. All right, that's always a fun agenda item. So yes, this will come back then. Right, Jim, how are, we are, how are we doing here? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, I think with that motion, uh, you've uh, covered uh, an action that uh, moves the process forward. Uh, we'll be uh, working on the range of alternatives uh, further down the road, but uh, today's business, I think, is covered. All right, terrific. Thanks so much. Um, what did we say about picking up agenda item G5 assessment methodology review? Chuck, are we ready to do that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I believe uh, we're ready. I'm getting an answer right now, and the answer is yes. Okie dokie. Let me. Uh, so I think uh, this is actually Brad's agenda item. So I'm going to pass the uh, gavel over to Brad. All right. Thank you, Chair Rolnick. And um, I'm looking at G5 here. And uh, John, do you want to uh, get us lined up here? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And uh, good evening to uh, all council members. Uh, agenda item G5 uh, concerns uh, adopting those assessment methodologies that have undergone a formal review process that's governed by RSSC. Uh, that are endorsed uh, by the SSC. Uh, the, this is a continuation of considerations uh, at, at the last meeting in September where um, the council was um, considering uh, adopting some length-based assessment methods that have been proposed. The SSC did not endorse those uh, length-based assessment methods, although uh, two of the methods um, they said they'd be willing to consider endorsing after a few short-term uh, tasks analyses were uh, presented and reviewed. That review did occur on October 23rd. So uh, you will see that um, appended to the SSC statement is SSC Groundfish Subcommittee Report 2, which uh, provides the report from that October 23rd webinar uh, review that cover those short-term tasks. And the SSC report will uh, speak to that. Uh, the other part of this agenda item or the other action the council um, uh, will be considering here under this agenda item is adopting a proposed language regarding length-based assessments for the terms of reference uh, for groundfish uh, stock assessment process. And uh, the SSC also uh, has a report there. Um, SSC Groundfish Subcommittee Report 1 has a lot of the uh, uh, their recommendations, but the SSC has their final recommendations on terms of reference language. Um, and finally, the, uh, there was this elasmo brank harvest control rule um, consideration uh, to do a, a future review for that, the SSC addresses that as well. So uh, those are the, uh, the SSC is the only advisory body uh, that we, um, that weighed in on this uh, as anticipated. And so if there are no questions to me, I would recommend taking the SSC report and Dr. John Budrick will be giving that report. All right, thank you, John. Uh, questions for John on uh, his presentation now? Okay, we'll go to uh, John Budrick. John, you're there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can. Great. All right, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, for the record, my name is Dr. John Budrick. I am the California Department of Fish and Wildlife representative to the Scientific and Statistical Committee and the chair of the Groundfish Subcommittee. Uh, I will be reading to you from the Supplemental SSC Report 1, the Scientific and Statistical Committee Report on Assessment Methodology, methodology Review, uh, Final Action. 
The SSC, uh, the, sorry, the St Scientific and Statistical Committee, the SSC, discussed uh, reports and recommendations for one, the further review of length-based assessment methods held on October 23rd, 2020, found in Supplemental SSC Groundfish Subcommittee Report 2, appended to this report. Uh, number two, we uh, the proposed language in the terms of reference, or TOR, uh, for groundfish and coastal pelagic species stock assessments found in uh, SSC Groundfish Subcommittee Report uh, 1. Uh, number three, uh, the workshop on data limited assessment methods and the potential use of data uh, the data limited tool, the DLM tool, uh, developed by researchers at University of British Columbia for use in Pacific Fishery Management Council uh, stock assessments. Uh, that's found in Supplemental SSC Groundfish Subcommittee Report 3, appended to this report. And lastly, the um, fourth item was the future plans for evaluating alternative elasmobranch harvest control rules. Um, so regarding the review of the length-based assessment methods, at the September 2020 meeting, the SSC reviewed three proposed length-based assessment methods. Uh, length-based integrated uh, mixed effects, called LIME, uh, stock synthesis with catches and lengths, SSCL, and stock synthesis with catches and lengths informed with one or more fishery independent uh, abundance indices, uh, SSCL plus index. Uh, the SSC concluded that further development for the LIME method is needed and did not endorse the method to be used uh, for uh, PFMC stock assessments. The SSC recommended a list of short-term tasks to be completed before adopting the SSCL or SSCL plus index methods, which were which are detailed in Section 6 of the Length-Based Assessment Methods Methodology Review um, Panel Report provided in September under Agenda Item uh, D4, Attachment 2. Uh, Dr. Andre Punt, of the University of Washington briefed the SSC on progress of short-term research recommendations that was reviewed by the SSC Groundfish Subcommittee on October 23rd. The SSC agrees with the subcommittee that these short-term recommendations were adequately addressed and thus endorses the SSCL and SSCL plus index methods for use in 2021 stock assessments. The SSC also concurs with the long-term Research requests as outlined on page three of the supplemental SSC Groundfish Subcommittee Report 2, but recommends extending the range of years for finding a breakpoint beyond 10 years. It was agreed that these requests should be completed in time for the uh, to be discussed at the post assessment cycle review meeting, also referred to as the postmortem, uh, to be held in December of 2021 or January of 2022. Regarding adoption of the proposed terms of reference, or TOR, these, uh, there are three minor changes to the proposed TOR. Uh, on uh, page four, uh, there's guidance on the use of sex data associated with lengths when sexually dimorphic species are assessed. On page five, we have an addition of language classifying stocks with less than 10 years of length data as category three assessments. Uh, this does not affect the current assessments, which will be subject to long-term analyses to provide uh, to be provided at the post-mortem review of stock assessment process in winter of 2021. Uh, a change on page two, line six of the SSC Groundfish Subcommittee Report 1 in reference to data moderate assessments that can be considered Category 1 assessments, replacing SSCL with SSCL plus index. And lastly, there was one revision unassociated with the length-based assessments regarding how residuals are estimated in VAST, um, changing Pearson residuals to residuals. The SSC recommends adoption of the TOR language for the uh, Civic Fishery Management Council 2021 Groundfish and Coastal Pelagic Species Stock Assessments in SSC Groundfish Subcommittee Report 1, reflecting the first two changes uh, with the addition of the last two changes. Regarding the data limited 
Methods Workshop. A data moderate and data limited methods workshop was held May 12th through 13th of 2020. Dr. Andre Punt briefed the SSC on the workshop discussions and recommendations found in Supplemental SSC Groundfish Subcommittee Report 3 appended to this report with a statement. Uh, the topics considered during the workshop were potential refinements of data moderate and data limited assessment methods already approved for use in the Pacific Fishery Management Council stock assessments, uh, additional data moderate and data limited assessment methods that could be considered for review and adoption, and lastly, a potential use of the data limited method or DLM tool uh, for use in groundfish assessments. The workshop report documents short descriptions of various methods and their potential use for Pacific Fishery Management Council stock assessments. The SSC uh, concurs with the workshop conclusions and research recommendations detailed in section three of the workshop report. The SSC agrees with the workshop that review of an MSE tool such as DLM tool would ideally involve a technical review of the mathematical specifications of the operating model, along with the results of applying a DLM tool to address a problem that is currently of interest to the council. The SSC notes the DLM tool could be used to inform groundfish management and possibly uh, highly migratory species, but uh, not likely for, uh, to be informative for uh, short-lived species like coastal pelagic species and salmon. Regarding evaluation of alternative elasmobranch harvest control rules, the SSC Groundfish Subcommittee held uh, planning meetings on September 2nd and October 23rd of 2020 to scope the issue and determine if sufficient information is available to inform revised harvest control rules for elasmobranchs. Dr. John Bedrick briefed the SSC on the discussions and recommendations from the meeting. There's not much additional data available from uh, similar species to be added to Dr. Martin Dorn's meta-analysis, which informed the current elasma brand harvest control rules. The SSC notes that the 50% uh, spawning potential ratio target, SPR target, is likely to lead to declines in uh, abundance of four elasma ranks to levels below estimated BMSY over multi-decadal time scales. Consequently, it may be advisable to maintain harvest limits at or below the MSY equilibrium level estimated in elasma rank assessments until a more suitable proxy is developed. The SSC recommends this topic for future research and or a methodology review. And with that, I will take any questions you might have. Thank you, John. Um, questions for John on the SSC report? Okay. Hey, thanks, John. Mm -hmm. All right. I see, uh, I don't see any uh, public comment signed up. Uh, so that will take us to council discussion. And... Uh, Looking for some hands, potentially. It's been a long day. It is late. It'll be shorter if someone raises their hand. Aha, Louis M. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and uh, thank you very much, Dr. Budrick. Uh, I, I just wanted to thank the uh, the SSC and its committee for uh, uh, duly considering these improved methods. And I'm hoping that including uh, some of the methods in the data moderate uh, group uh, will allow us to come up with uh, somewhat more favorable um, assessments or situations uh, for some of our stocks. So I think this is uh, an example of, uh, of going in the right direction uh, to provide uh, uh, surety just to maintain our stocks in a sustainable manner at the same time uh, to uh, to provide, as I mentioned before, uh, protein to the nation, especially in these difficult times. So I just want to thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Louie. Um, anyone else? Corey Niles. Corey? 
Yeah, th thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Maybe a question for Mr. DeVore. I know it's slow on the uh, on the uh, mute button here when when Dr. Budrick was there, but John, if you would on that last paragraph, John DeVore, um, on the SSC statements about the Lasmobrank harvest control rule and the advice to the council. Just wanted to I have an imagination of what might happen, but how do you see that advice coming back to us um, when when it time, comes time to look at the harvest specifications, which, if memory serves, will be this time next year, if not September? Um, sure, through uh, the vice chair, um, Mr. Niles, I, I think, um, you know, we'll certainly get uh, recommendations on OFLs and whatnot from the SSC, but the way I read this, uh, you know, maintain harvest limits at or below MSY equilibrium level for those uh, Lasmo Brank, uh, like Big Skate and Long Nose Skate, we have that estimate in the assessments that we are currently using. And that might be a consideration for an ACL decision uh, for the council when we revisit the next spec cycle. So um, I think this right now is is advisory and, and the information that uh, the SSC looked at was like they said over multi-decadal time scale. So it's not, um, I don't see a hair trigger on this or an absolute, you know, uh, recommendation that you have to get there now, but it's, it's a, a sort of a something to think about, a precaution to think about. And certainly what the SSC um, is recommending uh, for the long run is that we you know, get the information to revisit harvest control rules and come up with a more sustainable proxy. But um, I, I, I think this is just a, a little bit of a, something to keep in the back of your mind for when we uh, start deciding ACLs for elasmo breaks in the next cycle. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Vice, Mr. Vice Chair? Yes. Uh, yeah, this is Chuck. So just just on that recommendation about uh, the future methodology review. So I guess one thing I would just like to emphasize is that um, I think that's a good a good idea. Uh, we do have a scheduled uh, COP that schedules uh, such methodology reviews. I, I think it's I think it would be uh, good process to adhere to that schedule to make sure that uh, things are scheduled far enough in advance um, that we don't end up uh, like like we are here um, trying to clean up something that we didn't quite get to in September. Um, so uh, I, guess, I, would, I guess I would just uh, encourage uh, the SSC and, uh, and, and council staff uh, as well to make sure that uh, that, uh, that schedule is uh, uh, adequate to meet that objective and not and not uh, you know not have to uh, pick you know sort of pick up the pieces uh, later but uh, um, anyway so I would just put that out there that uh, we've got a schedule we should stick to that schedule to make sure that um, decisions are made in time to get them into stock assessments uh, in the in the forthcoming cycle and not not try and uh, play catch up that's just my comments, thanks. Okay, thanks, Chuck. Um, hey, John? Yeah, just uh, the SSC did talk about that and certainly any uh, future methodology reviews they, they understand would go through the formal topic selection process and we would have that discussion on timing and whatnot. So, I mean, the SSC is uh, in agreement with that process just to assure you all. Okay. okay, thank you on that. Anyone else? Or maybe um, Marcy? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, I believe Sandra has a motion from me. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you, Sandra. I move the council adopt, one, the final length-based assessment methods, and two, the proposed minor changes to the groundfish and CPS stock assessment terms of reference language as described in supplemental SSC report G5A. 
Okay, thank you, Marcy. Does the uh, language on the screen accurately reflect your motion? Yes. All right, second uh, by Virgil Moore. Thank you, Virgil. Uh, speak to your uh, motion, Marcy. Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, just want to uh, appreciate the council's flexibility um, following up on that last discussion with regard to the timing of this item. Yes, we had hoped that uh, this would be um, taken care of on the normal schedule and cycle. Uh, we had a number of delays earlier this year with um, needing to reschedule meetings and such. Um, I just can't appreciate enough the work of the Groundfish SSC subcommittee and the participating uh, contributors uh, in getting this work um, somehow over the finish line for use in this uh, biennium, this, this stock assessment biennium. So um, appreciate everyone's flexibility and um, we are certainly uh, mindful of the need to stick to the, the schedule in the future. Um, this year has just been unusual all the way around, but um, very much appreciate this work and look forward to its application. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Um, discussion on the motion? Okay. Um, seeing, uh, seeing no hands, um, I'm gonna call, uh, call for the question. All those in favor? Aye. Say that. Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Uh, motion passes unanimously. Okay, uh, John, are we uh, were we done with this item? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, yes, you are. You've um, adopted those uh, assessment methods uh, that were endorsed by the SSC and the, the new proposed language for the terms of reference to guide the process uh, for assessments in the next uh, next year. So, with that, you have completed the action under this agenda item. Well, thank you, John, and uh, I can happy to say that we're actually ahead of schedule. It's a, it's a, it's a great day. <laughs> so with that, I'll uh, give the gavel back to our chairman, um, uh, Chair Grolnick. Uh, there you go. Thank you, Vice Chair Pettinger. Um, great job today, everyone. We had a tough uh, agenda item, but we got a lot of help, both from the public through their comment, as well as from the subcommittee of the SAMTAC that met to try to work out a way forward, which we adopted. So thanks everyone. Uh, tomorrow we have more ground fish and uh, also coastal pelagic species. And we'll start at eight, but let me first, uh, before we break for the day, give our executive director, Chuck Tracy, an opportunity to make any announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, good work today. Council uh, getting through the gear switching business and uh, and picking up a, uh, one ground fish item. We have three ground fish items tomorrow and three CPS items. I would remind folks that the uh, uh, proposed rule and in a report from National Marine Fisheries Service is now available to uh, uh, help guide the discussion for CPS item number H3, the uh, comments on the uh, CSNA court ordered rulemaking. So uh, you might want to take a look through that uh, if you get a chance. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Any, uh, I don't see any hands. Let's see if anyone wants to have anything to offer before we break. So we will break at this point and uh, we'll see all of your smiling faces in a virtual sense tomorrow at 8 a.m.